Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sacramento County uh, Board of Supervisors uh, meeting. This morning's date is July 27, 2021, and this meeting is hereby called to order. If the clerk would please call the roll and establish quorum. Yes, good morning, Supervisors. Desmond? Here. Kennedy? Here. Natoli? Here. Cerna? Here. Frost? Here. And you have a quorum. This meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated Friday, July 30th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And at this time, I'm going to ask my good friend, Supervisor Desmond, if he would please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I have a couple of announcements this morning. Um, as a heads up to our public members, uh, it was suggested to me that since things are better and we're opening up and masks are beginning to come off and we're preparing our children for school, uh, it seems like the horizon looks a little bit brighter and we have less news on the COVID front and so we will be uh, having we will not be having a covid uh, update to, at today's meeting we're planning to have those updates on a monthly basis uh, but i want to let everyone know that in the event of any pending changes to our policy or if events or status of, or conditions change uh, we'll be bringing those updates back on a uh, every meeting um, as needed basis and so today we will not have a COVID update, but if you do have comments relating to COVID, you can make those comments in our off agenda uh, items. And then I wanted to uh, highlight a couple of extraordinary groups uh, in our county today. And last meeting we were talking a little bit, we talked quite a bit about the American River Parkway and we came on to the subject of the American River Bike Patrol and some of the efforts that they have made. And I, I'm hoping there's some pictures that I, we provided. But I wanted to, to just uh, say I recently met with uh, some of the board members with the Save the American River Association. And they shared a little bit about the American River Bike Patrol, which was established in late February 2020 unanimously by our board. They've been patrolling the American River Parkway for over 15 months, working with the Parks Department, our Parks Director Liz Bellis, Chief Ranger Leonard Orman, and numerous other county staff. And in their first year, the American River Bike Patrollers rode on 1,149 patrols, spending 2,917 hours riding 21,608 miles along the Je Jedediah Smith Memorial Trail, provided 3,154 assists on the parkway users, repairing 230 bikes, providing emergency medical assistance to 78 persons, initiated 22 911 calls, 47 311 calls, and 13 calls to Ranger Dispatch. The most common assistance that they gave was advising 2,285 pedestrians which, um, which side of the trail to walk on. Most of the common, uh, the next most common was giving directions to 134 trail users, pedestrians blocking the trail, bikes on the wrong side, bridge jumping, dogs off the leash, explaining trail etiquette, and children not wearing helmets where it's significantly important. They uh, helped with flat tires. Um, the flat tires topped the list at 91 repairs, and then chain repairs and derailleur adjustments of 230 bike repairs. Abrasions uh, led the list of injuries uh, cared for with lacerations half, half as common. And the patrollers assisted two trail users with complaints of chest pain and performed CPR on one successfully in full cardiac arrest. 
treating dehydration and the effects of heat exposure. Peaks in the summer months, they have also taken the lead in heat abatement activities and water station establishment on ultra hot weekends through Labor Day. The patrol is divided into five teams that cover sectors of the parkway and attempt to see that over 80 members are fairly uniformly spread along the parkway from Discovery Park east to Beals Point at Folsom Lake. It made my day when I heard about these extraordinary individuals who volunteer and ensure safety on our American River Parkway. And I just want to extend a special huge thank you um, for your contribution to making our community better and servicing our American River Parkway. And I, and I want to let everyone know if you want to learn more about the American River Bike Patrol, you can go to AmericanRiverBikePatrol.org. Finally, uh, I want to say a few words. I like to say a few words of inspiration, if I can. It, there's a lot going on in our world, and I think it's good sometimes to focus on those things that inspire us. And so this morning, I was inspired by our Asian community. And um, I want to acknowledge and thank our Asian com American community for their strength of character humility, diligence, strong work ethic, sense of family values, tradition, and for all the beautiful things they bring to our communities. People from Asia began migrating to California during the Gold Rush era. A number of factors, including the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, and the alien ineligible for citizenship status imposed on Asian immigrants into the 50s and 60s limited their numbers. In 1965, federal officials changed immigration policy to allow migration from Asia after many years of exclusion. The 2000 US Census reported that 49% of all Asian Americans live in the West. California became the thriving immigrant communities of China, Japan, the Philippines, Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Hong Kong, Thailand, and other parts of Asia. The greatest concentration of these three million Asian Americans was in San Francisco Bay Area. Large, members, large numbers also settled in Los Angeles, Orange, San Diego, Fresno, Sutter, Yuba, and Sacramento counties. According to the 2000 census data, a higher percentage of Asian Americans attended college than any other California group. And while they're so studious, diligent, and they have been known to receive, while they're so studious and diligent, they have been known to receive less pay for the same jobs. I never remember hearing them complain in my life, which is kind of a long life so far. <laughs> Hopefully it'll get longer. I hope our Asian community members um, know that we really uh, greatly appreciate their contribution that they've made to our world and we are grateful for all the beautiful things that they add into our communities and and so um, I am I'm excited to feature them today and say thank you for being great, great Americans among us and with that I'll read my chair announcement and we'll get to work and so the Board of Supervisors encourages public participation during the meeting in person, telephonically, or in writing in compliance with the directives of the county, state, and centers for disease control and prevention. This meeting is broadcast live and open to the in-person attendance. The county is requiring face coverings for unvaccinated attendees while inside chambers and is recommending social distancing. Meeting procedures are subject to the change based on recommended health, public health and safety guidelines. <clears throat> public comments will be taken in the following order in-person comments, and then comments by phone. If you're making a public comment in person, a face covering is required if you are not vaccinated, and social distancing is recommended while inside the chambers. If you're unable to wear a face covering, you may sit in an overflow room and make a comment at the podium in the designated area. Seating is limited and available on a first-come, first-served basis, whether you're sitting inside the chambers or an overflow room. 
If there are no seats available inside the chambers or overflow room, please form a line in the designated area and wait for your turn to make your public comment. Standing inside the chambers or in the overflow room in lieu of sitting is not permitted due to limited seating capacity. Please complete the speaker request form and give it to the clerk staff. A separate speaker request form is required for each agenda item or topic that is not on the posted agenda. When I open the public comments, I will call three names at a time. When you hear your name, please start walking towards the podium inside the chambers or overflow room and wait for your turn to make your comment. If there's a need for an accommodation pursuant to the Americans with Disabilities Act, medical reasons or other reasons, please see the clerk staff for assistance. If you're making a public comment by phone, dial 916-875 2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in the queue for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter. Please refer to the agenda and or watch the meeting and follow along to determine when is the best time to call and be placed in the queue to make your public comment. You may be on hold for up to an extended period of time and your patience is appreciated. I'll ask for the clerk to transfer calls into the meeting accordingly. Each agenda item will be, remain open until the public comment period is closed for that specific item. Members of the public are limited to making one public comment per agenda item or off agenda matter. Please be mindful of the public comment procedures to avoid being interrupted or disconnected when you make more than one public comment on a single agenda item or off agenda matter. Thank you in advance for your courtesy and understanding. You may send written comments by email to boardclerk at saccounty.net. Your comment will be routed to the board and filed in the record. Thank you again for your understanding and your patience. Next item, please. Okay, so for your consent matters, items 1 through 28, I just have a couple of announcements on item 9. You're introducing an ordinance amending various sections of Chapter 2.09 and Chapter 2.61 of the Sacramento County Code related to creation of a public safety and justice agency, reorganization of the municipal services and public works and infrastructure agencies into one community services agency, the creation of a community development department, and various related changes. You'll wait full reading and continue to August 10th for adoption. There's also a request to authorize the Department of Personnel Services to process the salary resolution amendment. For item 10, you're introducing an ordinance amending chapter 2.79 of the county code. Uh, this is an em employee relations ordinance. You're waiving reading and continuing to August 10th for adoption. And finally, on uh, item 12, you're adopting an ordinance revising section 2.56.220 of the Sacramento County Code relating to the term of contracts. And that concludes my notes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I do have uh, at this time uh, board members who have comments on consent. And I also have a comment to conclude before we vote. Supervisor Natoli. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would, uh, in light of, I think, uh, very recent correspondence, uh, some have received as uh, recent as uh, an hour before we started the meeting, I'd like to have uh, item nine uh, pull for some discussion. Um, I think it's uh, uh, clear what the recommendation is, but we've had some folks comment on that, so I'd like to, and we may have folks that wish to weigh in on that as well. So, um, and then I'd like to offer um, uh, a comments on items 24 and 25, if I could. Sure. Mr. Natoli, did you say 24? Yes, 24 and 25, thanks. Okay. At item 24, I'll read both of them into the record yes, at the same thank time. Yes, thank you. Item 24, authorize the Director of the Department of Transportation to execute the reimbursement agreement for the railroad coordination services with Union Pacific Railroad Company for the Southwatt Avenue Improvement Project. Uh, this is for $50,000. And then item 25 is a contract. This is the AC Overlay Project SB1 2021 Phase 1 award of bid in the amount of $5,296,895 dollars to Tyker construction and the environmental document is a categorical exemption okay <clears throat> thank you madam clerk um, on item 24 on the watt avenue um, uh, project just want to uh, thank our staff for their ongoing work i know this required a tremendous amount of uh, dedicated effort over a number of years to one uh, work to secure the funding certainly with the support of this board uh, and the project is one obviously that will be 
uh, important backbone infrastructure for movement of people and uh, goods uh, you know, along the, the corridor, the, the north, uh, north uh, south uh, corridor, Watt Avenue. I wanted to uh, raise an issue, um, though, or at least comment on this, is that uh, this project is a major investment, probably <laughs> approaching $40 million when it's all uh, said and done. And we're allowed to retain the at-grade crossing uh, for Watt Avenue, which will be four lanes, and I don't know how many tens of thousands of cars are anticipated to, to travel that corridor. And I raise that issue in contrast to the Waterman Road, which is an interior street that um, is important to the ongoing development in the um, uh, vineyard um, uh, communities. And we've been stymied uh, on that particular aspect because of at least uh, initial requirements that somehow we have to grade separate uh, for Waterman Road. And that interior street is critical to circulation in developing neighborhoods and to ultimately to the circulation uh, in the vineyard area. And so the reason I highlight that is I know our staff, and I certainly have had some follow on to um, uh, some of the comments I raised uh, a few meetings ago relative to that. I want to really elevate the discussion on Waterman Road. If we can continue to maintain an at-grade crossing for the same railroad line on Watt Avenue. There is no common sense reason why we can't do Waterman Road with safe crossings and, 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 and provide for developing neighborhoods, for, for a community that will need access to uh, emergency services and such. And uh, again, I, this needs to get elevated in the sense that if we need to go to the Public Utilities Commission or we need to talk with the railroad folks or put together a task force, uh, it's just, it's critical. And that key improvement is, 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 is backbone to a lot of development, i.e. Watt Avenue is as well. And so I, I know uh, Steve, uh, you and Mr. Vicari and others have been involved, but I, I raised the point this morning because if, if this is acceptable, which it is, it's an existing crossing, then by gosh, we ought to be able to do Waterman Row with a safe crossing and, and build out that community in a way that's anticipated and not have a dead end street that's a, a four lane road that's a connector for uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of residents and homes and businesses in that developing area of our community. And so um, I don't know if you have any comments, but uh, I know there's been some discussions, but I wanna get this elevated. I would expect that we would, you know, if I need to be involved as one of the representatives of that area, certainly Supervisor Kennedy and Supervisor Cerna touch the area as well and represent portions of it. Uh, to me, it's critical. That's a critical piece of infrastructure that needs to one, be financed and funded, but it needs to be approved. Yeah, yeah. I understood, Supervisor yeah. Natoli, and it's just as frustrating for us. We are, I have asked staff to set up a meeting with the railroads uh, that I'm going to be involved in as well, and we will uh, work with them on that. I, I know that you've, you know, you've talked about that doesn't make a lot of sense that Watt can do this and Waterman can't. Waterman's new. Watt was an existing, so I mean, I think that's the, that's the one thing that we're trying to work with the railroad on is to get uh, an acknowledgement that well, not only is the, is the Waterman uh, the, the amount of uh, conflict between vehicles and potential rail is lower because it's a lower volume street. Yes. That rail line currently has multiple breaks in it. And so we want to talk to the railroad about their really their long term uh, goals and whether this is going to need to be um, uh, you know, they're going to you know, they're going to try and hold their position on on this being uh, a grade separated, which we don't believe is, is appropriate for that location. So we are working on that. We will definitely engage with um, our, our elected board members uh, if, if there's a need to kind of pull that, uh, that influence into the, to the mix. But we're scheduling a meeting with the railroad to, to try and get these things ironed out. But my understanding, even if the railroad were to concur, that's not an unimportant piece, but that the Public Utilities Commission has basically taking a very hard stance, at least previously, maybe at the staff level. I don't know whether they did it actually with, with their full board on that. And um, again, that's an, another piece. You know, if, I guess if the railroad and the county went hand in hand and said, you know, we're agreeable to this, that certainly would uh, reduce some of the friction. But I, I, you know, I can't emphasize enough because I continue to hear from folks, new houses are being built you know, on a daily basis uh, or under construction in that part of the world. Yeah. And Waterman Road dead end stops at either end of, of, of the Central California Traction uh, line there. As you said, that's even interrupted because of some breaks, but certainly hasn't been in service for some 20 years. It's not abandoned. Um, and I, 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 again, I just, I emphasize it. I don't want to detract from the, the importance of the, the items on the agenda, but it just really called uh, to mind that we have to, uh, and, and, you know, meeting with the railroad, that's fine. Uh, I've had meetings with the railroads over the years, and. 
you know, sometimes it produces results and sometimes it doesn't. But um, again, it, there needs to be some sense of urgency because I can tell you that, that as we continue to see the build in that community, the pressure is going to build on this board to get a solution. It was in all of our environmental documents and to me, I could use this as an example, though. If we can widen Watt Avenue into all the improvements and put in $40 million of improvements, it's going to facilitate mobility. And we can do it at grade and do it safely. There's no reason why it can't be safe at the Waterman Road. It, understood. Okay, thanks. And and keep me in the loop, please. Uh, again, I think there's some timeliness to this, and I would like to participate. So thank you, Steve. Um, secondly, I just on item 25, I want to just uh, thank our staff. Um, you know, this is uh, you know, five plus million dollars of. Uh, street overlays badly needed, and there are you know um, streets in each of the supervisors' districts on here. I had a lengthy conversation with Mr. Ficari this morning, and uh, there's some segmentation here that I think for future um, um, consideration as we look to go to contract for a good deal of this work, that we need to build some bit alternates and clear them environmentally as well as uh, build them into uh, any other considerations so that when we go and we get a favorable bid and we come in a million dollars roughly a million dollars less than an engineer's estimate, that we can do more work. In this case, we're, we're boxed, and I understand, and again, Ram was uh, very helpful this morning, we're boxed in because we've already gone to bid, you've gotten the amounts in there and so forth, but if we have bid alternates and we get favorable bids, we can do more paving, and that goes countywide in all the districts. And so I know it requires some more advanced work, and again, people are working very, very hard to advance the work for what we're going to see later this year to go to, go to construction uh, and repaving next spring. Uh, but I, I, I can't stress enough that I think it's very important that you build some alternates in. And again, you do the same if it came in too high, you'd have to make some decisions about how you were going to fund the work. In this case, though, I think uh, there's a, a, you know, a, a lot of work out there that needs to be done, and we can put some bid alternates into our bids, clear them at the board level, and if we get favorable bids, then we can you know, make decisions about what extra work we can do beyond what we had you know, contemplated on our engineer's estimates. So I think it's a real key piece, Steve, and I mentioned to Mr. Picard, I just wanted to mention this morning, I support this. There's some segmentation here that I would like to have seen us finish the road, and we're not. It's going to be a next year's bid package, and um, I'm sure I'll hear from some of the residents about a particular location. Um, they'll be happy with the work we've done, but they're going to ask, why did we stop there, and why are you going to wait another year to finish the road off? So I guess I would ask, and, and again, this may apply to other districts as well, so I wanted to call that out. No, we'll absolutely do that with the um, with bid alternates for the paving. And in fact, it's not my opportunity to thank the board again for the increase in paving money that is in this year's budget. Um, and that'll give us a lot more flexibility. So we will put a lot of packages together with a number of uh, flexible bid alternatives with that with that funding. Okay. So thank right. you again. Very good. Okay. That's why. Thank you, Madam Chair. And and just to clarify, you pulled number nine to be discussed after consent. Right. Yeah. Okay. And we got some. I think we have some public comments on it too. So, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Desmond. And thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I just want to echo uh, Supervisor Natoli's comments. Uh, Steve, I very much appreciate your efforts and, and this item and your staff's efforts with the, uh, the additional monies we, we've allocated towards uh, our, our maintenance backlog. Um, like, like Supervisor Natoli mentioned, I mean, you're certainly not going to be able to make everybody happy, but it's a step in the right direction. We, we certainly have a heck of a lot more to do, and, and I'm sure Supervisor Natoli and I will continue to get creative with, with some, some ideas, but uh, um, thank you for your efforts, and your, and your staff have really been great. So. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. I expect the creativity would come from all five. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Um, I would like to ha I have a couple of questions on item 14 and I also have some public comment on item 14 okay so for item 14 this is the authority to enter uh, excuse me authority to execute a multi-year zero dollar data use and disclosure agreement with the California Department of Public Health for the term of August 23rd 2021 through June 30th 2024 for access to California reportable disease information exchange okay uh, I wondered if you could um, explain a little bit more about this. I know in the staff report, it, it's this is a system that's already in place, and we are needing to access it. Is that correct? Sorry, Supervisor. Yes, that's correct. This is basically a tool that public health departments use to track events related to diseases and to be able to be prepared to respond as necessary. So it's a zero dollar. Memorandum of understanding with the state to collect that data. 
And we're not already getting that data? Uh, we have been getting that data. As I recall, uh, this is an extension. I'd have to double check how long we have been getting the data supervisor, but uh, I don't think it's a brand new system. It's an amendment of a current uh, no. agreement. What is the amendment? I'm just. I believe it's to extend it, but we'll need to yes. verify that. Okay, so this is something that has been in place, and it's how we've been. Um, it's information that's informing our public health decisions, basically, and you're extending the MOU. This then? would take us through June 30th of 2024. Correct. And actually, I'm sorry. I think I was mistaken. That was item two on the recommended action. I think we need to validate whether this is new or continuing. We'll have to get back to you later this morning. Okay, uh, can we pull this then and, and ha have that vote later then after we get that clarification? I'm just, I wanna, I don't feel like I have enough information to vote on it. So yes, we can, and we should be able to get it very quickly. We do have some public comments on it, so at this time we can maybe take those uh, public comments on item 14 and then we'll pull it and bring it back later and so our first uh, public comment is Gabriel Ingram followed by David Aria followed by oh yeah followed by David Aria oh she's in the um, She might be in the hearing room. I apologize. I didn't want to keep them quiet in here. Uh -huh. um, so I'm curious too on the additional information, but what, what raised my concern on this when I um, read the agenda packet is um, with Newsom's update yesterday, how does that fit? Um, and so the red flags for me was, um, was how it is being insinuated that this may be leveraged for additional tracking. Um, so, you know, the vaccines have been made available, and if people took it, great, that's their choice, they have that right, um, but with the insinuations of where things are going, I'm concerned that this will be used as an additional leverage tool for those that are choosing and making educated decisions to wait. You know, where Pfizer still in clinical trials until June of 2023, there's a lot of people that may get it later, but they're waiting for additional information. They do not want to be a guinea pig. Um, my concern with the additional tracking is, are we forgetting the Civil Rights Act and allowing discrimination of individuals who are likely making informed decisions regarding their medical choices? So I'm curious, what this is reviewing. Is this simple uh, technology to link the hospital systems for additional data intake, or is this gonna be turned around on the people? And I wasn't clear on that in reading the agenda packet. So thank you. Come on, kiddos. Thank you. And David Aria. Okay, um, the first thing that I want to say, and it, it, it may not look obvious at the beginning, but it, I'll tie it in with the uh, collection of, of health data, is the, to the best of my knowledge, the PCR testing uh, that has been done throughout the pandemic has been uh, fraudulent. Uh, they're running the PCR cycles at uh, 40 to 45 when they should be run at 28, and there's a world uh, a lawsuit in Europe going on right now called Crimes Against Humanity at which they have 110 subject matter witnesses that are experts and a thousand lawyers on this case and, and a lot of these uh, um, things will be moving to the uh, United States where Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will be uh, helping out with that. So where this falls in line with um, this other issue is that I just feel like when you guys are using a fraudulent PCR test, it takes away from your credibility. It takes away from the governor's credibility and uh, California's uh, State Department of Health and everybody's credibility. Um, if you go into court and you take the witness stand and you're cross-examined uh, in front of a jury and a judge and you lie hundreds of times or thousands of times or theoretically, if you could, millions of times, 
uh, you're pretty much impeached as a witness and uh, your case is pretty much done, okay? So with that credibility uh, that everybody is lacking that's involved with this uh, pandemic, uh, I also wanna add too real quick that the, uh, they're saying now that the FDA um, has uh, revoked the past PCR test that's been used. So um, this subject has been brought up many times in many jurisdictions, many locations. It's not a secret, it's all over the internet. Nobody would listen to us, but now they finally listen after, uh, what, 18 months, okay? So that's another impeachment of the credibility. As far as collecting health data, I don't want anybody to collect any of my personal private health data, uh, and I don't know how far this goes uh, because it wasn't clear here. You have here. 15 seconds. Okay, anyways, the Chinese uh, Communist Party is using, collecting Americans' DNA. They've met with their generals. They've told them that. All the national defense experts are saying basically the same thing, and they're making bioweapons with it to target certain races, okay, and target based upon sex and uh, other characteristics that are genetic. Your comments. I'll wrap it up right here, but if you guys contribute to this uh, collection of DNA and data through PCR tests or other means, uh, I think it's racist, okay? You're contributing to racism. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our public comment on item 14, and we'll pull, we've pulled item 9 and 14, and so at this time I do not have other questions from the board, so I'll... Madam Chair, uh, there's one person in the audience who says that they have a public comment. Oh. I don't know okay. if they filled out a speaker slip form or not. Was it for an, a specific item or off agenda? I think they said for item 14. I don't know if they filled out a card. Did... Yeah, why don't you just come to the podium? Sorry, maybe I have a pile of cards here. <laughs> oh, is it Brenda Pandos? Yes. Hi, Brenda. Hi. Sorry, it got mixed up in all the others, and I didn't look closely enough. Please um, proceed. You have two minutes. So I wanted to read part of the contract, which alarmed me. It says surveillance ongoing involves the ongoing systematic collection of health data, the evaluation and interpretation of data for the purpose of shaping public health practices and outcomes, and the prop prompt dis dissemination of results of those responsible for disease prevention and control. And when I read that, I was thinking, this kind of sounds like China. But, but it's, it's evident, because this is what we warned about before as far as AB 262 and 389 and CMS 911. And the narrative now is the pandemic of the unvaccinated. So this deems anyone who chooses not to get the shot for whatever reason, whether they also had, they had the, um, they already had the corona or they're not able to get it or they're waiting to see, or I mean, it's like not wanting to get the FDA approved um, uh, experimental shot it doesn't I mean we were in people that are choosing not to get this are likened to drunk drivers it's disgraceful um, I we do not consent we don't ever want to consent to this um, and because and we, we I would like that ordinance to be passed that I had put forth before that would s never interpret um, 201 I mean, 120140 to take us out of our homes if we are deemed a threat from a communicable disease that's not um, uh, enforced by our private personal physician. Thank you. Thank you. We have a comment at this time from County Executive. Yes, Mr. Wagstaff has an update on um, the follow up request you had on this item. Thank you. So, Supervisor, uh, just to confirm what we said earlier, this is an extension of a system we've been using since 2004. It is used for report, receiving reports of all communicable diseases, not just COVID, and it is information that public health officers receive from the state in order to prepare for potential outbreaks and to put in place measures they need to take to uh, control those potential outbreaks. So we have been doing it since 2004. And this would take it through till 2024 from where we are now. Okay, thank you for that clarification. That, that helps a lot. Uh, and so it is, it's a system used by all counties in California yes. as well. Yes. Thank you. Supervisor Natoli. 
<clears throat> I would just say that's an important piece of information that should have been in the staff report, that if this is a continuation of a contract, um, because it doesn't say that here. Thank and, you. and I think that's important. Thank you for that clarification. I just wanted to um, ask, and um, I've kind of changed the frame of my question here uh, based on what you just reported, but so do all counties participate in this, or is this a matter of, if we didn't participate, I guess, what's the implications? Okay. First question, yes, I believe all counties do. I'm not aware of any that don't. Okay. Uh, so Thanks. I believe all counties do. And if we didn't do it, uh, supervisor, we would just not have access to this information that our public health staff view is extremely important in their preparation efforts and to be in place to respond to uh, situations that might occur. But it's a two-way flow of information, though, Bruce. Is that accurate? Well, it certainly we yeah, we share information, and then we have access to information that's shared by other counties, and that's assimilated or uh, analyzed uh, by the state system. Is that is that accurate? That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Is and the um, you know to the comment uh, that were <clears throat> put forth by one of the speakers. So when it comes to data and information it's of a general sense it's not specific to a particular person uh for example i'll just use an example if i was diagnosed with tuberculosis and and that data was reported and there was a regimen for treatment through my health provider or through the county we're not reporting names and social security numbers and and, and, and such this is general data collection and uh, i just want to be clear that's my understanding yes sir okay all right thank you those are good questions. Thanks, Supervisor Natoli. Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Wagstaff, I don't want to belabor the point, but while we're discussing it, I, just as an example, because you did mention that this isn't just COVID, it's far bigger than that, and obviously because COVID didn't exist when we started the contract, um, or at least COVID-19. Um, so as an example, some number of years ago, the county had a couple of outbreaks of tuberculosis in high schools, uh, North Sacramento, South Sacramento, in which, quite frankly, I think that uh, our staff did a phenomenal job of coordinating and responding and clamping down on it. This is data that would be used in just that type of circumstance. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. And I have a question regarding the, the data collection that goes to the CDC, I, um, I would like to see a, a map of, I guess, of what data goes into this CDPH, CDC, does, is it, is this data that goes, that's collected by the federal and the state and who, who collects that data and then what data is filtered into this database? Another, um, what I'm getting at is I've, I read a lot and I'm reading that there are um, multiple data collection um, sources on, you know, vaccines and human health and public health, uh, something like 10 or 11 of them, but I can't wrap my head around who's collecting the data, where's it collecting it from, where's it going to, and then where's it going to. Um, and I would like to understand, uh, I would like to under, better understand the data is, so that we can, I would like to be able to feel comfortable that it's accurate and that, um, you know, that we're getting the information, that, you know, all the information and not just part of it. That's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. I know. It's a lot to ask, but uh, but it's, it's outside of the county, but not really, because if, if we're making decisions based on that for people's lives, I, I'm curious, I need to know, sure. um, we need to know where the data is coming from. That would be good. Thank you. You bet. Uh, Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> just to beat the uh, horse a little further here, um, there's nothing in this action that uh, we would take today that would run cross-grain to uh, to HIPAA in terms of maintaining uh, privacy, correct? That's correct. All right. I, I just want to underscore that because I think to each of the speaker's points that seem that their um, characterization or their impression of what we're uh, doing with this item uh, may compromise uh, their, their personal medical information, which I think we could, we could all agree, no one wants that compromised. But that's why I asked the question and that's why, of course, HIPAA is 
uh, kind of the uh, most pronounced uh, policy that uh, regulates uh, pr medical privacy. And so that's why I wanted to put on the record your response that, of course, this will maintain all HIPAA uh, privacy measures. Thank you. Thank it you. also, if I could add, it does not track anyone's vaccination status of any kind. It only tracks communicable disease so that we can address communicable disease outbreaks. Right. Thank you, Ann. Thanks, Supervisor Cerna. Good point. Uh, Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, just again, going back to the language in the staff report, uh, uh, which is fairly brief, the um, the database, this is electronic reporting, so it's a secure database both on our side as well as with the state. Is that accurate? So this isn't something, or, or is it made available publicly? Is there a public portal uh, to this? Um, I understand, no. I'm sorry, Supervisor, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, my understanding is only public health staff have access to the data. Um, I can follow up on that as well. Okay, I, so, so there's no, no sharing, there's no... Um, uh, ability, or at least there's, you know, again, a secure system for somebody to to tamper with the data right. and to, um, you know, right. influence it in one way or the other. Right. I, the I mean, that's data, presumed, but I want to ask the question. Yeah, so. that's, that's a fair question, yeah. and that you're, you're correct. There's no threat of that. And again, just to reemphasize, this is data used for the purpose of public health mm -hmm. to prepare for situations such as the one that Supervisor Kennedy mentioned, uh, and it's one piece of you know, very important information that they need for that purpose. Lastly, I would just say maybe the choice of words here, you know, surveillance uh, versus monitoring, and people can, you know, read into things, words, and there are definitions behind that, but, and then surveillance is used several times in the report, and maybe that's exactly what the state calls it, and, you know, that has a certain connotation. I'll just say that, that you I know, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, it may be the same thing if you call it something differently. I mean, and, and that, that's why I think it's important for the discussion we're having this morning, and, and, uh, but when you say surveillance three times here and systematic and I mean, it's, again, it's, it's uh, language that's not inappropriate, but I think it may, may uh, message something that uh, if folks are, you know, uh, skeptical and, and or have their own views about, you know, what we do in the public health arena, I just think that, you know, surveillance, uh, again, I mean, maybe that's totally appropriate to call it that, but I think monitoring and follow up, some of the things that, you know, may be one and the same, but how, I think certainly a, a my view, a different connotation when you a talk point, about them. A point well taken, Supervisor. Yeah. I think to what you said, uh, it is language that the state uses for this system. Completely understand what you're saying yeah. about how yeah. that can be viewed, mm -hmm. and we'll take that under advisement. I just wanted to yeah. further emphasize the point you made or question you asked earlier. This is a yeah. secure system, and it's just used by the public health folks for the purposes I mentioned. Okay. All right. So you did clarify there's, it is secure. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, and again, I will belabor the point, I guess, um, <laughs> a little late. Uh, I, uh, I just wanted to make a statement that, because I don't know how many people watching recognize the degree, and, and Supervisor Cerna made a fantastic point of HIPAA, and uh, how, how, you know, ironclad HIPAA is in so many ways. I mean, I'll give an example. The five of us probably have as high as, if there was such a thing, security clearance at the county that you can have. <laughs> if we have a constituent that calls in with a medical issue and has an issue with our medical department, um, our health department, uh, and, and we call on behalf of that constituent to get more information, we can't get that information. I mean, uh, I mean this, this stuff's in lockbox, um, and our staff, I think does an admirable job of maintaining that privacy, uh, and so I, I just I, I don't I just want to make sure that the public recognizes the degree to which uh, our staff and the county protects all information that is HIPAA covered. So, thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, I believe we're. I believe we can leave this on consent uh, and uh, vote with this through consent, but we do have some public comments on item nine, but I thought we were pulling nine to have that discussion after we voted on consent, so. 
It's up to you if you want to take those comments now um, or how, when do you, what would you like to do, Mr. Natoli? Supervisor Natoli. Yeah. Well, we're going to discuss it. So if you want to dispense with the calendar, you may have folks in the audience here that were here on specific items were on the consent calendar. So I'm fine, you know, calling it out uh, if, if, you, if we choose to do that, I, you know. Okay. We can take the item nine. Sure. At this time. They're on the phone? Or yeah, they're on the phone, um, and um, this is, I've already read this into the record, so I'll do a short version of it. This is an ordinance, you're introducing an ordinance. This is the creation of a public safety and justice agency, reorganization of municipal services and public works and infrastructure agencies into one community services agency, the creation of the community development department and other changes, also authorizing Department of Personnel Services to process a salary resolution amendment. So um, we have, I know we're managing two different lines. So as of right now, I have callers in the queue. I'm not sure if you have any speaker slips. For item nine? Mm -hmm. I, I do not, I have off agenda okay. and 16, I do not have nine. Okay, we'll take the calls um, from item nine. If you could go ahead and transfer the first caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Dear Board of Supervisors, by declaring that racism is a public health crisis, you have admitted that it is an issue that must be treated with efficiency and care. We have a mass incarceration problem in this city and country. The jails and prisons simply do not provide adequate transformations or rehabilitations for our community members. They never have and they never will. In short, they disproportionately house our most underserved communities, and as all you all know, it is time to make a change. By agreeing to create an agency directed, uh, dedicated to lower jail population and overseeing public safety and justice, you must acknowledge how we got here in the first place. Over-policing and the criminalization of our black and brown communities have led to decades of abuse and incarceration. The communities and everyday people of Sacramento must have a say in this new agency. Putting all the trust in the same systems that have systematically oppressed marginalized communities is not going to help. We need to establish strict language and hold to ideals set through community involvement and the people who are affected by this public health crisis the most. I am asking for this board to slow down on the creation of this agency and to fully engage the community and social justice grassroots organizations like Decarcerate Sacramento. In order for this agency to be effective in its goal, community-driven alternatives to incarceration must be prioritized over law enforcement-based alternatives, which have been proven to keep people stuck in cycles of criminalization. We want to see our county come into compliance with the May consent degrees, but also embark on this effort for reasons beyond lawsuit liability. Reducing the jail population is a moral issue, and as the agency knows, it's about justice. It's about taking accountability for reducing human rights violations and freeing up resources for public dollars for investments that promote safe and healthy and thriving communities. We need a commitment by this board to prioritize community resources and health and not community incarceration. You have 15 the voices, seconds. Thank you. The voices of the underserved must be prioritized for this agency to have any real positive effect. Please involve the community and think about this as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Nikki. Um, and I'm with the Cars Raid Sacramento. <clears throat> and I just, um, you know, good morning to the board and the staff and the county executive and y'all are, you know, moving in a new direction that's uh, interesting and exciting um, in terms of reducing the jail population. What we really, really need um, is for y'all to take a minute and realize uh, how do we intentionally and carefully, not as an afterthought, include racial equity and health equity um, at the forefront of this effort. And so far, just in the creation of this, we don't see it. We don't see it in the language. Um, we'd like to see it in the language. We'd like to see an intentional effort put forward um, by your staff 
um, to ensure that community-based organizations and community alternatives to incarceration are um, at the <clears throat> at the helm. Um, that impacted people are at the at decision-making tables. Um, you know, we know that y'all uh, can move really fast through decisions. We know that y'all can slow down and work with the community like you did with the wellness uh, crisis response. Um, center, y'all are able to do that work uh, in talking with community and figuring out what the direction of this new agency is, and we really encourage you to to do that work, to figure out um, what the community needs out of this, um, and to take a real reckoning with racism as a public health crisis, understanding that the jail, the consent decree, uh, the, de the demographics of the population in there, this is all a result of that reality, and so we need to take... Um, we need to uh, focus our efforts. Things. Absolutely, we need to focus our efforts um, on rectifying those wrongs, finding out where they are and rectifying those wrongs. And so if we don't come at that uh, intentionally from the beginning, I fear we'll move to uh, like default law enforcement alternatives, default law enforcement decision making, and that is, gonna, uh, that is not gonna solve our problems. That's gonna be a liability moving forward. Um, and we really need to go with the community on this one. So I just encourage you. Absolutely. I just encourage you to uh, take a look at the language decarcerate sent um, and be willing to engage with this further. Thank Thanks. you. Supervisor Nutoli wanted to. Yeah, did well, you? Uh, when public comments. So okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't know how many okay. after public Thank comments. you. Thanks. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good morning, board. Um, this is Mackenzie Wilson. I'm a constituent in Sacramento County. Uh, I know some of you all very well. Good morning. Hope everyone's enjoying the weird weather brought to us by climate change. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask the board to begin to make that a priority for Sacramento County, but only after taking into account the uh, points I want to make about it agenda item nine. Truth is, my biggest concern, as always, has been the way in which decisions are made about our daily lives, my daily life, my friend's daily life, my son's daily life. To see the creation of a public safety and justice committee should have been an exciting thing, but it isn't. You can see the haste and the assumption of knowing what's best for this community and the fact that this was streamlined from consent to approval without any community input, let alone the work needed to ensure community have the ability to have input. The truth is, this is the biggest flaw of this institution that is approved and voted on every form and institution of white supremacy this county has unleashed upon its constituents. I mean, I understand that this is how the system was designed, designed to ensure disenfranchisement. And I see meeting after meeting, it continued to do its job. My ask around this item reflects my wish for every item. Stand next to the resolution you passed in November, declaring that racism is a public health crisis, and actually put those words into action. Do not make this decision, let alone any decision, without many opportunities to engage in the process and development of this agency and every other decision. This includes meetings in each district, the footwork needed to ensure everyone knows about the meeting, multiple meetings to allow for comment and real ways for community to to make changes to these things. For example, I promise we have a different definition of public safety than you do. I guess my point is, is I don't think you all and your staff understand that y'all are a white supremacy created institution. And day in and day out, y'all are not doing the real work to systematically dismantle the racist power structures within it. You so have my final question seconds. Good, my last final words are please do better, slow down. Don't pass this without further community engagement and begin to talk to community and make room for more engagement before making any decisions. Thank you all and have a nice day. Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good morning. This is Courtney Hansen with Decarcerate Sacramento. Hope you all are doing well. And first of all, I do just really want to thank this board, um, Interim CEO Edwards, the county staff, for really being willing to embark on a serious effort to reduce the jail population. It, it's not going to be easy, but it's necessary and possible, and I'm really hopeful. I think we all want communities that are safer, healthier, and more whole, and a more sustainable budget. And I do want to echo the concerns about some of the pace and process behind the proposed 
public safety and justice agency thus far. And, you know, it's hard to weigh in on these things in a piecemeal fashion, sort of without seeing the broader plan or being brought into it a little bit earlier. And we do our best as people really invested in this issue. And we have met with a few supervisors and, and raised this idea sort of of baking race and health equity into this thing from the beginning. And speaking of the resolution and the commitments that were named, in naming racism as a public health crisis, I just truly can't think of a better project to apply that resolution to. It hits all of the intersections. It won't be successful unless we really understand who disproportionately ends up incarcerated in our jails and why. We know that black people and people of color are disproportionately incarcerated and people with unmet mental health needs and poor people. And so we have to understand all of those things if we're really going to, you know, get people out and keep them out and make our communities more safe and whole. And so I know you have received some language, very specific recommendations about how to sort of break this thing open now to some more community engagement from real stakeholders who are really humbly trying to squeeze their way, you know, into the conversation and to the table early on. You have 15 um, we don't have seconds. all the answers, but, but we have a different viewpoint than, than folks. So this should really be a county and community collaboration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please send the uh, last caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity to comment. I 100% agree with McKinsey and Courtney in the rush that this is being pushed with without meaningful community input. It's time for Sacramento County to reimagine what public safety and justice look like, acknowledging the shortcomings of what the status quo approach has been, hypercriminalization and over-incarceration. It's a big deal to create a new agency, and if it's going to have the word justice in its name, it must be rooted in strong values like equity and addressing racism as a public health crisis. Last November, this board passed a resolution acknowledging that racism is a public health crisis. In this resolution, you committed to ensure the consistent collection analysis and reporting of demographic, socioeconomic, and public health data due to, measures, to measure progress towards eliminating racial inequities to design, develop, and deploy community-based alternatives to prevent trauma and eliminate harm associated with racial inequity and advocate for local, state, and federal policies that improve health and wellness in communities of color and support legislation that advances racial equity. Does this resolution exist in a silo or can it be made part of this effort? There is arguably no issue that more urgently requires this commitment than incarceration. We all know that disproportionately poor people, people without access to mental health resources and people of color are overrepresented in the jail system. And that's largely because we haven't applied this racial equity analysis in our policy making. Racial and health equity must be at the forefront of efforts to decrease the jail population and to provide resources within the community, not an afterthought. Certain communities are more vulnerable to incarceration, poor people, black and other people of color, people with unmet mental health needs. The majority of people in the jail are pretrial. Our goal in decreasing the jail population should be preserving the presumption of innocence and access to due process, despite how much money you make. Partnering with health and other social services departments will be essential to ensuring strategies to sustainably reduce the jail population are successful and include a racial and health equity lens. In you declaring have 15 racism, seconds. If we don't do this with an intention towards addressing systemic racism, then all we do is reinforce the systemic racism. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have Supervisor Natoli. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thanks to our speakers and certainly to uh, our uh, interim county executive for bringing this forward. Um, I think it's clearly um, uh, an important uh, consideration by this board and obviously reflects, I think, uh, you know, on a number of the discussions, decisions, and obviously um, uh, yet to come decisions that will face this board and this community. So I want to thank uh, again Ann for her work uh, in bringing this forward. Uh, we received the communication, and it was referenced in uh, some of the commenters' um, um, uh, points. And one of the th things that was called out um, in the language that was um, suggested that we might include as a part of our either our resolution and or as a um, <clears throat> consideration for uh, this item. And it has to do with um, the agency and, you know, it, maybe it's assumed and, and, and maybe not, but I think <clears throat> clearly 
the uh, work and using the words of, of, of some of the authors of the letter that was sent to us. Um, I trust we all have that. I think you have it, Anne, as well. And I'm going to ask you to comment on it in just a moment. But, you know, talking about working in direct collaboration uh, with uh, social service agencies, departments, uh, in coordinating the efforts uh, as it relates to jail um, population reduction and some of the initiatives in our community. And I think for at least, uh, speak for myself, that, uh, you know, I assume that that's, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, directly, uh, you know, part of what would be considered here. But I think saying it is important and in, in, in embedding it in the, um, you know, the action that was would be you know, taken by the board this morning. So we act on this is I think it's really important. So I'd like to get your take on some of the, the language. There was another, um, you know, element to this as well. But maybe take that first. So. I I'd first like to comment on the uh, community engagement piece of it because I do think that that is a critical component of the work that we will be embarking upon to reduce the jail population. And um, I fully intend to engage the community and we need a leader of that process and that's why we're uh, pushing this forward now so that we can hire someone that can lead that effort. Um, I'm going to let Ms. Travis speak to the language in the ordinance, but we, um, there's a lot of things that we can, should, and will do um, around the sort of the creation of the agency around its goals and initiatives. We can certainly get input from the community on that. This is just an ordinance to create it. We can then start the recruitment process um, and definitely we'll have community engagement in all of the things that the uh, the public commenters mentioned about being involved in decisions around how we reduce the jail population. Just before Lisa responds, if I just could, and um, I think what would, at least what I saw in, in um, uh, some of the transmittals was in, in how it might get you know included in the ordinance uh, that you know obviously creates the position and has a certain uh, compensation package with it and you know requirements for conflict of interest uh, reporting and so forth um, was that they, they had asked that as a part of the at least the narrative that it be included and so you know that maybe distinguish itself from the ordinance and and uh, and I just want to be clear that that was the language that I saw here, and there may be language that could be added that would further clarify that within the establishing resolution. But so I just want I don't to have any, yeah, and I don't yeah. have any issue with the language they propose. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to let Ms. Travis talk about whether it's appropriate to be in an ordinance or whether it should yeah. be in some other place. Okay. Right. It appears to me in reviewing what the um, decarcerate Sacramento folks are asking for. Um, again, I don't have a problem with the actual language. Yeah. There's nothing legally insufficient or problematic yeah. about it. Um, but as Ann said, the ordinance is actually just creating um, the position. So um, adding the language that they um, are requesting would be okay in, in that place, but I think it might be appropriate to acknowledge it somewhere else. Um, and again, if we did want to put it in the ordinance, I think we could do that. We'd have to probably bring it back because it is significantly different than what um, has been noticed to the public. Um, so again, we can take direction from the board as to how you would like that um, done. And I'm going to just look really quick at our. Well, it could be in the resolution. I mean, right, we, I we, we, we have the text of the staff report, which right. obviously is the record, a part of the record. You've got the resolution, which we yeah. see lots of things in resolutions, and hopefully we mean it when we say them. And then there's the ordinance itself, which obviously has the, the legal backdrop for, uh, you know, the uh, responsibilities for you know, the tasks that are being called out for and, and, and such. So it, it may be that it's in the resolution would be the appropriate place to. Right, and I don't believe there is a resolution that goes along with this ordinance. That's uh, an issue. Um, okay. Or not an issue, but it's um, because we're just introducing the ordinance. So I think we could, we could um, tweak the ordinance a little bit to include this, but yes, the language that they're proposing, I think, um, would more appropriately be in the staff report, which doesn't really have any force of law or regulation, so I'm not sure how helpful it would be. Um, but how about an accompanying resolution? If we don't have one, I mean, we, we often have resolutions that just simply then talk to the ordinance change itself. It would seem to me that we could, to your point, we could layer this in a way that has meaning, assuming there's board agreement regarding the language. Uh, but, you know, you have the ordinance, you have your resolution, which has the force and effect, uh, at least what you know was stated there, and then you have the staff report that again is not the, the ordinance can could reference the resolution. Yes, make it that could. clear. Sure. Right? Yeah, I think right. it could. Yeah, establishment. So that might maybe a consideration um, for you know our, our action today. So, 
And I'd be yeah. happy to work with Ms. Travis yeah. on, on okay. doing that. Okay. I wanted to ask another question, and it goes to something that um, beyond what we're being asked to do, and there's some other elements to this as far as combining uh, other important, um, you know, uh, uh, departments in, in, in segments of the county, including airports, economic development, um, Department of Revenue Recovery, and some of the uh, other Joint Powers Authority entities that we interact with and have either fiscal and or uh, personnel uh, connectivity to. And it goes to, uh, I think, what ought to be a, a practice, and, and, and I know you and Adam, I've talked about very briefly, um, but when it comes to uh, selecting uh, folks for positions, and whether it be the one we're about to create or others uh, up and down, uh, you know, certainly the uh, administrative and uh, and management uh, positions, including a, a community representative, um, and you know, and it may be an area of interest. It might be, you know, if we were looking for somebody, you know, and again, most of those by charter are decisions that are made by the county executive. In fact, you know, we have a practice here coming to this board, but in all honesty, it does not require affirmation under the charter of this board, but I think it's been a common practice. It's good, and we get introduced to department heads and so forth. Uh, but I think as we look at things, and you know, in, 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 in not necessarily any particular group, but I think asking you know, you know, citizens and representatives of this county to participate in that as a member of the panel, so at least you get those viewpoints going. It's still only a decision that's being made by the recommending uh, entity, and obviously that's the county executive, and you know, coming before this board. Uh, but I, I can think of a, a number of departments not related to anything having to do with criminal justice um, you know, where that's important. And so I guess I'd like to see as a follow-on um, uh, to we have you know hiring panels and, and interview panels that we make a practice that is part of the institutional framework we do here to invite. And again, you can't, you're not going to have everybody. We would probably limit it to one or two. Um, to allow folks to participate in that, because I think that's that's important. Uh, it's still your decision. It's still this board's decision as the appropriate representatives for the people in this county. And I don't know. Again, that's not a task that we're going to decide on today. But I just it, it seems to make sense for me. And I, again, I can think about a number of arenas where uh, that would be helpful. Again, and having that perspective, but certainly having folks included on that panel. It doesn't, you know, presume any outcome, and it doesn't necessarily. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, unduly influence those decisions, but I think it's important because we're a big enough community, we're diverse enough, and I think it's just an, you know, important from the get-go that at least we have that, you know, whatever that particular point of view is, but having uh, that rep reflected in, at least in the, you know, the interviews and in, in, in some of the consideration for folks that are selected for positions that are, you know, make important uh, decisions each and every day for people in this community, so. And we, yes, yeah. I agree with you, yeah. and we have not done it on every single hire uh, right. since I've uh, been yeah. doing this work, uh, but we have done it on some, and we intend to do it on future ones as well. Yeah, and I appreciate it. You know, I wasn't pointing to you. I was just saying, I don't think it's been a real common practice. I mean, uh, and I know you've been much more inclusive in your approach, and again, I, I thank you for that, so it wasn't directed at you as much as I think it ought to be embedded in you know the processes that we use in this county for uh, those positions. So uh, that's all I have for right now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to, to thank the um, uh, individuals that took the time to, to call in and address the board on this uh, important subject, and I appreciate uh, the uh, written correspondence um, that adjoined it uh, that we all received ahead of the, the meeting. Uh, I, I agree with uh, my colleague, uh, Supervisor Natoli. I think Having a, a resolution that accompanies the ordinance is um, is the right uh, structure to reflect um, what I think are some important um, uh, aspects of what this uh, reorganization uh, uh, means and what it uh, intends to accomplish, especially as it relates to uh, reducing uh, the jail population. Um, one of the things that, that I wanted to um, uh, get some clarity on, and I know that it's, it's there's a limited reference in the in the board letter to it, uh, but it's it's uh, how uh, labor has been um, consulted or included uh, to get us just to this point. And it seems to me in the board letter that um, the intent would be to uh, uh, have a meet and confer process commence 
once today's action took place, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but was there any consultation, uh, formal or other, otherwise, with uh, the subject REOs for this um, before this was even proposed or brought to the board? Because it seems to me that there um, should have been if there wasn't, and so I'd like to hear from the appropriate uh, uh, staff people about uh, what took place or didn't. Absolutely, Supervisor Cerna. The, um, the labor unions that we met with were the ones related to the um, actual merging of uh, planning and environmental review with development and code services because it had potential seniority impacts and other labor impacts. And so we offered um, meetings with all of the unions that and, and met with three of them that had requested uh, a meet and confer. And we had discussions with all three of them. They raised some questions and we've got some commitments to kind of follow on with them once this uh, once the the process is through but none of them raised objections to the uh, uh, to the to the uh, to the changes was was UPE one of them yes okay um, and so the intent would be to have a more formal meet and confer process after today's no, action no, no it was relatively formal if you will in that they asked a, they asked a number of questions related to the the reorganization of, of those two but, offices into the department okay because those are the staff those are the employees that could be impacted by a number of things like I said seniority and, and other issues maybe we're talking past each other let me read right. to you from the board letter the meet and confer process is expected to be completed past tense with uh, the remaining REOs prior to the implementation of the restructure. So does that mean that the ones that did not take advantage of having a conversation early on would be uh, approached in a meet and confer context? Well, no, what, what what occurred was when we had to write the board letter, we hadn't had meetings scheduled with the ones that had requested. I see. And since that time, we were able to meet with them all this last week. So it was, it was a preemptive in case we didn't uh, get to everyone and they weren't available prior to this coming to the board, we would continue to meet with them. And we've made commitments to meet with them to follow up on a couple of items uh, once it's clear kind of what, the, what some of those um, uh, issues might be. But there, we have met and conferred with all of the unions that had requested to meet and confer. It's just that at the time we wrote the board letter, we weren't sure if we'd be able to get meetings with them prior to today's date. And this, 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 that holds true for the entirety of the reorganization, uh, including the, the justice part, the public safety part? That is um, not affecting individual employees. It was the department heads of the departments that are being. Well, that's moved. not what I'm hearing from the labor rep. So I'm confused. Okay. What 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 happened relative to either informal or formal meet and confer relative to uh, the justice and public safety component of this, if anything? So um, I'm guessing not because the impact to those departments that are being moved to the new agency is to the department head. So the department heads that are being shifted from the social service agency to the public safety and justice agency uh, will have a, a new boss, essentially. Mm -hmm. But the department heads who run the departments that are within that agency remain the same, and so this um, reorganization shouldn't have an impact to the line level represented employees. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so the only change, though, and that you're you're uh, suggesting then relative to justice and public safety is just simply the the head of the the department, and that that doesn't necessarily trigger any kind of meet and confer or even the invitation for consultation with. Um, affected uh, labor well we probably should have told them and I'm not I can be honest and say I'm not sure if we did or not I know we notified um, all the department heads that okay. would be shifting that, that's fair I mean I, I, I get that so it sounds to me like this is not ripe for our approval today because we're gonna you know it sounds like we might entertain a, a an adjoining resolution to rightfully so to uh, capture some of the um, the concern from that has been expressed um, from um, some of the speakers uh, today, and if that is the case, and it, we we have some time left, I'm going to strongly suggest that that take place in the interim, that there be uh, at least some outreach from your office and to um, those affected um, labor organizations and their leadership. Uh, that are uh, going to be affected relative to having a different department head 
uh, for the part, that part of the reorganization that is focused on justice and public safety. Yes, although I want to reiterate that there will not be a new department head in the, in the actual departments that report okay. to. They're affected. They should, be, they should be consulted. That's the bottom line. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Cerna. Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to uh, weigh and echo several of the, the um, comments of my colleagues. First, thank the um, um, advocacy community for, for their, their comments about this issue. Um, I, I, it's, I, I very much appreciate their commitment to um, making reforms to our, our, our criminal justice system and, and, and looking at it in a more holistic way that uh, um, addresses the inequities and identifies ways we can reduce the jail population and prevent people from, from going, getting involved in the jail population uh, once again after they've been involved the first time while at the same time keeping our community safe. And, so I think that advocacy has been really what's informed our, our interim county execs' efforts to create this new agency. And um, you know, I'm very confident in my conversations with Ann that she is committed to um, what we have heard from from a lot of the public uh, with regard to their concerns for this new agency. And um, I certainly support a, a resolution to accompany the ordinance, and, and I, I'm assuming that the language probably in a resolution would would probably have already been memorialized in the, the mission, goals, and objectives of this new agency. So um, certainly look forward to, to the language and the resolution and, and look forward to supporting this, this uh, restructure that I think will, will focus um, our efforts more intentionally and more effectively on um, some of the issues, including uh, complying with the Mays Consent Decree and uh, uh, reducing our, our jail population while keeping our community safe. So thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. And I just want to uh, clarify, we had pulled item nine, Supervisor Natoli. Do you still want to pull it or do you want to vote for it with consent? Let me just maybe offer a thought in light of the conversation that we can introduce the ordinance uh, and then I, I assume we can have a resolution that accompanies the, this is the first reading today that, you know, when this comes back August the 10th, assuming that's the date it comes back, have that resolution will be publicly disseminated to accompany then the, what would be considered a final action for the ordinance, which establishes the position and so forth. And uh, um, I, if we could do that, then I'm prepared to support going forward this morning. Um, and maybe Lisa can clarify. Sure. That. Um, if it's the will of the board to do a resolution accompanying the ordinance, then yes, you are correct. Um, I do have one small change to read into the record um, for the board if you are planning to introduce the ordinance today. So should I go ahead and do that now? I, I'm fine with that, Madam yeah, Chair. Yeah, you might as well since okay. we're on it, and then we do still have some other public comments okay. ahead of this, after this. Um, it was just something that was overlooked. It should have been deleted. It's section 2.09.400, subdivision C should be deleted, and that is in reference to um, developing policy. I'm trying to get to it now, sorry. Uh, developing policies. Um, to ensure that there is no conflict of interest in the oversight and management of various departments, that the administrator of the social service um, agency oversees. Um, there are no departments anymore that are in conflict, so that provision does not need to be included in the ordinance. See, okay. If I could add, if we do that, my commitment to work with the labor organizations impacted by the public safety um, groups. Okay. okay. Yeah, you asked me, Madam Chair, so I, I'm fine, I think, with that direction to, you know, uh, meet with the affected labor groups to, um, you know, introduce the ordinance as part of the consent calendar and to do with the instruction also that a resolution would uh, be prepared to accompany this uh, matter when it comes back to us on August the 10th, so. Okay, great, thank you. And so our clerk will go ahead and have us voting item nine with the consent calendar. I'm in the queue, with that. Chair. Yeah. I'm sorry? Chair, motion? Thank you. Oh. I'm sorry, Supervisor Cerna. I, did, I, I was going to get to you, though. Oh, okay. Sorry. I do. Uh, please proceed. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, what's the sense of urgency on this? What, what, would, it, what would it mean if we waited to have the first reading in, uh, next, at the next meeting? I mean, there, the one common request from those that took the time to, to write us and to call in today was to take some time um, 
and so I'd like to understand what uh, what's the sense of urgency on it. Um, we have a real sense of urgency on moving forward in compliance with the May's consent decree, and we do with the departure of Mr. Ferguson. Uh, we do not have anyone in my office appointed to this, um, with the exception of me. Um, and I, I if we really need to bring somebody on board, and this delays. We have uh, we're ready to start recruiting, and we can't do that um, unless you take this action. Okay. And recall the ordinance doesn't go into effect till 30 days after oh, I understand. Um, adoption, so that's an additional 30 days. Oh, I get that. I get that. Yeah, if I could ask my colleague, I mean, with some of the comments, I Madam mean, Chair, just to, to just was certain that you know wanted us to have listening sessions and so forth, which we certainly can do. Um, but I think we, you know, I, I thought the essence was captured in what we just talked about. But I could be wrong about that. So if there's, if you think that, well, if, you know, if the if if the intent is to to take the time between um, now and when the ordinance would be uh, adopted, for, uh, finalized, to somehow meet with uh, you know, the groups that were represented that um, spoke to us today by phone and who wrote in and, and have them influenced um, reasonably so. The, the resolution that I think we can agree that's probably the right place to uh, memorialize some of their um, rightful concerns, then I guess I'm fine with that, but I need to hear that that is going to be the case. Okay. We can certainly do that. All right. Okay, so with that understanding then, um, again, puts a little more <laughs> work on your shoulders, uh, Anne, but I think that, uh, again, I think in light of what the comments here, that doing some of the outreach, and it may help in the Obviously, you can do recruitment, but it may help in the, in the in the selection process as well to to, to know that. So, so I, again, with that in mind, I would move <coughs> item nine, introduction of the of the ordinance, with the direction as outlined here. And I think you captured that, Alma. You have the direction that went with. Okay, and so that's my motion. Thank I'll, you, I'll Sup for that, Supervisor Cerna and Supervisor Natoli. We're not quite ready to take uh, consent. No, I wasn't moving. Oh, full. I, oh, I, just moving I, I was moving item nine. I just moved item nine. Okay. So, uh, I, I, so I, yeah. Can we vote? Should we vote on that now, Alma? Or yes. Are so, you voting to continue, or are you considering it today to introduce? Introducing the ordinance okay. with those changes described by County Council. Okay. Expected action and direction relative to resolution to outreach in between the time ordinance adoption and. Um, Effect and then the nego and then the outreach to the labor organizations. Does that capture it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. That was the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. And so we have a, a motion by Supervisor Natoli and second by Supervisor Cerna. Please vote. Okay. That uh, takes care of item nine. We do have uh, some public comments on item 12, 14, 16. And I have some comments on 27, and we have a public comment on 27. So at this time, I'll ask uh, for public comment on item 12, Sharish Casteda, and uh, followed by item 14, Sharish Casteda, followed by item 16, Gabrielle Ingram. Hello, you have two minutes. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, hello everybody again, Mr. Desmond, hi. I've been calling your office about eight times and they said they'd get back to me and nobody's gotten back to me. So if you could please look into that, I'd really appreciate it. I still wanna sit and meet with you. Um, but today I'm here for a multitude of things. Number one is item 12. When I read item 12, what I noticed was it seems as if the county is petitioning to try to make uh, memorandums of understanding an actual document. I work in the field office for the state of California. I'm an SEIU Local 1000 Union Steward, and I can tell you that a lot of the things that are going on are not okay with us. Maybe the higher representation of us was wrong in the past. We've, uh, we've addressed that problem. But memorandums of understanding, they are written uh, spur of the moment by management sometimes. And they're not accurate. They're not legal documents. So I totally do not consent to item 12 being passed where they edited and altered what um, type of documents we would be held accountable for if I understood that correctly. So item 12, um, we do not consent. 
Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I, I, I don't want to focus on every item, but I, this has to do with the terms of contracts. It has nothing to do with MOUs. These are legally binding contracts for work and or services that are uh, put out to uh, um, uh, you know, public uh, response, uh, and then uh, the authority obviously is delegated in some cases depending upon the level of uh, expenditure, but these are not MOUs. These are contracts that would allow the, the contracts to go from three years to five years in, 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 in certain cases. Is that correct, Ann? Correct. Okay, so it, I, I don't even see the word MOU mentioned in here. Um, then I must be referring to the wrong number okay. on okay. the agenda. Okay. I will get back on that one. Right. Um, okay. Should I just continue for number 14? Actually, you just had your, you just concluded for item 12, 12. and you can start uh, your two minutes for item 14. Awesome. Um, in regards to item 14, what this is doing is this is going to set up um, a way for more people to be discriminated against. For people's public health information to be for people's, pub for people's health medical information to be considered public, um, that's going to segregate a lot of the community, especially in the workforce. We're seeing this happen right now, bullying, discrimination. Um, there's so much coercion all regarding this COVID vaccine, the one that's experimental, the one that doesn't even last three to six months per Pfizer's new study. You know, this is setting it up for us to be discriminated against by our management, our coworkers, and it's not okay for people to share our, our health information. Some of us can't take that vaccine and don't have to take the vaccine because we have natural immunity and you're still not addressing that fact. So I completely do not consent to item 14. It's not okay for them to share our public health information our, our, it's not okay for them to share our health information and make it public. Um, in regards to communicable diseases, is coronavirus a virus or is it a disease? Because I keep seeing different words. Do we even know anymore what it really is? Um, I mean, th this is ridiculous. These, all these ordinance and these... Uh, these laws that they're trying to pass, they're all with one intention in mind. They're trying to segregate your citizens. Sacramento County is a diverse community. We all, there's so many different kinds of people in our community. I represent those people and we're not okay with this. We do not consent. Thank you. Thank you. Gabrielle Ingram. <clears throat> this is on item 16. Yes, um, so reading over, I don't know that I necessarily agree with the resolution. My concern on what this is about, my concern is the wording of the resolution. The second paragraph where it says, what are you doing? Be it further resolved that the Director of Department of Health Services or designee is authorized to amend this agreement for non-monetary changes, monetary decreases, to terminate or assign this agreement, to extend the term as needed, and to monetarily increase the total agreement, excuse you, <laughs> um, amount up to 10% of the total value of the agreement so long as existing budget appropriations are not exceeded. To me, that sounds like the um, met, they have blanket authority to amend the agreement. Now, I'm new to this. I mean, it's been a year I've been coming, but I'm still figuring it out. Does that go back through the board, or is this resolution giving them just blanket authority to amend, increase, adjust what the initial standing was Hello. for this budgetary amount? Um, that concerns me, especially when we're under a time where there's so much blanket power for the department, the director of health services, as referenced by the legislature and the health and safety code that legal counsel threw out a few weeks ago. So those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. Is it okay I, if I read the item into the record, item number 16? Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Item number 16 is authority to execute a retroactive revenue agreement with the State of California Department of Public Health in the amount of $300,000 $300, for the term of May 12, 2021 through June 30th, 2022 to provide support to school districts to facilitate the reopening of schools and authority to execute a retroactive expenditure agreement with Sacramento County Office of Education in the amount of $75,000 for the term of July 1, 2022. 21 through June 30th, 2022, to develop an updated 10-year student mental health and wellness plan. Thank you. Thank you. OK. 
Okay, Sharice uh, uh, Casteda on item 16. And follow and and then uh, following that, I have some comments on tw item 27, and we have three uh, public speakers on item 27. Hello again, guys. Hello. <laughs> oh, so, I'm sorry. Uh, did you have a comment now? At the end of a <laughs> okay. public comment. Thank you. Please proceed. Awesome. Um, okay, so this is in regards to item agenda item number 16, um, and my comment on this one is. Uh, I love that you guys are taking an initiative to start helping the kids' mental health because as a youth leader in our community, Sacramento County, this entire, I don't even know what to call it because it wasn't a pandemic, this entire joke of a staged crisis has seriously caused a crisis among our children. Our youth, they're suicidal, they're cutting themselves, they have no ability to connect or, or, or develop correctly the way that they should be developing because they've been forced to wear masks. You know, uh, kids learn through facial recognition. You know, kids learn through uh, getting close to their friends and feeling uh, belonging. But instead, this entire thing has done nothing but segregate kids. Kids are being bullied. They're being told if they don't get the vaccine that's experimental and could possibly kill them, by the way, that they will, they're dirty or they have some sort of problem with them. They can't go to parties. They can't go to see their friend's house. Houses. This is has got to stop. So if we're seriously going to talk about mental health of the children, we can't send them back to school in masks. We can't send them back to school with, with the vaccine that could cause more serious health effects, more serious health problems than the actual virus itself. How many of our community already have natural immunity to this virus? How many of us have got it and we're okay? Because the minute group of people that were dying minute they were not children they were not youth the youth does not deserve to be suffering right now and if we're going to talk about mental seconds. health it cannot it cannot be in this it cannot go on with masks in school next year so we really need to get together and adopt the agenda that the resolution that placer county and el Dorado county and put sacramento children first yeah. thank, thank you. you i wouldn't go to oh well you're okay so I'm gonna, uh, at this time, move on to, I just wanted to make a comment regarding item 27. Item number 27, resolution proclaiming, the August, proclaiming August 2021 as Child Support Awareness Month in Sacramento County. So this is, uh, today our board is voting on a resolution that's been brought forward by our Sacramento County Department of Child Support Services, and we're proclaiming August 2021 as Child Support Awareness Month in Sacramento County. Child Support Awareness Month highlights the vital roles of parents, partners, agencies, employers, the, um, and child support professionals for their persistence in ensuring that consistent support of the children of our community is provided. This resolution acknowledges the parents who have been through a horrendous year um, and they've persevered providing physical and financial and educational um, support and um, through a lot of upheaval um, caused by the COVID pandemic and the employers who are honoring wage assignments and ensuring that the collection of child support for the well-being of the children takes place. Partner agencies who regularly assist customers with many topics including custody, visitation, employment, public assistance, housing, parenting, and more. Our dedicated Sacramento County Department of Child Support Services has collected uh, 145.6 million while serving over 69,000 children in the last federal fiscal year. And so, um, and they did all that despite uh, teleworking, virtual communications, isolation. Um, they've done an excellent job with customer service and I just want to say on behalf of our board, we're, we're all proud um, to acknowledge everyone uh, of the partners and thank all of you for, for your efforts to make sure that our world is a better place for our children. And I know we have a couple of people signed up to um, 
for public comment on this item. And so I will call up Sharice Casteda, followed by Joy Nahijian, followed by David Nahijian. I hope I didn't say that wrong. Please correct me if I did later. That's okay. I, 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 think, they're, I think they're on an item 37, Madam Chair. I think the Nahijians. I, I was I was notified by the clerk that item I had two item 37 that were supposed to be 27. The other way around, 27s, it should be 37s. I'm sorry. That was, was my misunderstanding. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I apologize. No problem. Uh, so we have one public comment. So please proceed. It's Cherish Castaneda, like Carlos Castaneda. Oh, Castaneda. Yeah. Cherish. Uh, okay. I know. I have a feeling I'm going to know your name by heart. <laughs> I hope so. I'll try to get it right, and, and I thank you for correcting me. Yeah. No, thank you guys so much, and I'm really grateful to you for proposing this um, this agenda item because it shows me that you guys, as the Board of Supervisors for Sacramento County, the county where I was born and raised, and my children are born and raised, care about children's mental health and the children's well-being. Um, this, The reason I wanted to make a comment on this agenda item is to remind you all that discrimination is completely unconstitutional. And uh, what we're doing with this coronavirus laws and regulations, it has a lot to do with discrimination among the youth. Um, if the children are being told now that when they go back to school, if they're unvaccinated, they don't have to wear a mask. So we're going to be segregating them between vaccinated and unvaccinated. And that's completely unconstitutional. Everyone has a right to their personal health choices. And that is not what's happening in our school system right now. So I really hope that you do take the children's well-being and, and, and mental health awareness to heart when you're making your decisions as board members for our, our community. Um, I want to remind you that Title III of the U.S. Civil Rights Act says that in determining whether an individual poses a direct threat or health and safety or of others, a public accommodation must be made to take in individual assessments based on reasonable judgment that relies on current medical knowledge. Current medical knowledge, another thing, the PCR tests are out. If you guys haven't looked that up, go look it up. Okay, those PCR tests are no good. So we shouldn't be testing our children. We shouldn't be testing state workers. None of that is valid. We're not acknowledging current medical knowledge. This is something that is in Do Supreme Court seconds? cases, Murberry versus Madison states that all laws, practices, and rules which are repugnant to the U.S. Constitution are void. Please remember that when you're taking into consideration our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Cherish. Okay, and uh, at this time, we have concluded our consent matter public uh, comments, and Supervisor Cerna would like to speak. Uh, I'm simply going to make the um, uh, motion that we approve consent. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Cerna. And a second by Supervisor Kennedy, and I heard it this time, so I'm doing good today. Thank you. Unanimous vote, with the exception of item number nine where you took a separate vote. Wait, yes, thank you. Okay, now, uh, at this time we have uh, almost, we've gotten through consent and it's like almost noon and we're heading for public comment, which we have quite a few public comments. So uh, I'm going to call for public comment um, by, yeah. um, by three, uh, if you'll please um, approach the podium and be ready to speak. Uh, I'll start with Brenda Pandos, followed by Chris Wagner, followed by David Aria. Each one of you have two minutes, and I thank you for being here. For this is for off agenda. Okay. Hi. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Myself and parents alike respectfully ask the board to adopt a similar resolution passed in Placer and El Dorado County giving parental choice for kids in school. Children are, le are the least susceptible to COVID-19. Per the CDC, only 350 children have died from COVID in the U.S. That's zero percent. 
actually in California this past week, zero children have died. Um, and they, um, masking is dangerous. They can cause cavities, facial deformities, acne, increased risk of COVID-19, bacterial pneumonia, they're immune suppressing, germophobia, they contain graphene oxide, which is toxic, and they can cause psychological harm. According to the New England Journal of Mes Medicine, they say, we know that wearing masks outside healthcare facilities offer little, if any, protection from infection. Kalosha says that cloth face coverings do not protect against COVID-19. The California Department of Health says there is limited evidence to suggest that cloth face coverings by the public during a pandemic could re reduce d disease transmission. The FDA says that even properly fitted N95 masks do not prevent illness or disease. Neurosurgeon Dr. Russell Blaylock says there's no scientific evidence that masks are effective. If you're not sick, you do not wear a face mask. So I'm requesting um, that you put for, forth the same adopt, uh, resolution to adopt similar stuff that El Dorado County and Placer County give back the choice to, to parents in schools. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Wagner, followed by David Aria, followed yeah. by Ryan. Thank you, and I'm gonna piggyback on what Brenda said. This is the conclusion of the Stanford study that was done. Yes, it was revoked, not because of the um, contents of what they found, but because they said the person was not with Stanford. I'm sure that was political. So the conclusion says, data suggests that both medical and non-medical face masks are ineffective to block human-to-human -human transmission to viral and infectious disease, such as SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, supporting against the usage of face masks. They have substantial adverse psychological and physiological effects. These include hypoxia, hypercapnia, shortness of breath, increased acidity and toxicity activation of the fear and stress response, rise in stress hormones, immunosuppression, fatigue, headaches, decline in cognitive performance, predisposition for viral and infectious diseases, chronic stress, anxiety, depression, and long-term wearing can cause premature death. If you really care about our kids, like you say you do, then you would put forth a resolution to take those masks off of every single child in this county and in California if you care. Otherwise, we have to assume you don't. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Aria. I want everybody in the room to take a moment and think of this entire pandemic and what's going on with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus release from the Wuhan lab, uh, the people that planned it and, and uh, have patents on it for the last 20 years, and the, COVID, uh, or the uh, yeah, COVID injection, which is not even a vaccine. We'll talk about that later. Uh, the COVID injection is being used as a is a basically a binary uh, bioweapon, biological weapon. Okay, um, China uh, dissidents have come over here. Top virologists and scientists have come to the United States to seek a protection and asylum, and they brought computer hard drives with them and all kinds of other information admitting to this. China has programs that they've openly shared with the rest of the world uh, regarding their bioweapons uh, uh, programs uh, that they're doing uh, um, right now and uh, they've met with our generals there's uh, in the epic times there's an article called unrestricted warfare and again this is very open there's a book on Amazon where the top generals uh, from China have written this book on unrestricted warfare how they're going to take down the United States uh, and bioweapons is part of that formula uh, 55,000 to 100,000 deaths so far in the United States there's a major lawsuit from a CDC whistleblower and uh, several attorneys uh, that are saying the deaths are at 45,000 plus right now. This is a very dangerous vac vac uh, uh, injection. To give it to children in schools or actually to anybody else is a, is a war crime. You have to think about how uh, civilians are treated during war uh, according to the G Geneva Con Convention, the Nuremberg Code, the Helsinki Accords. 
Uh, yeah, I got that. Also, regarding the mask, it's child abuse. It causes permanent brain damage that's irreversible to children, and that's a violation of California Penal Code 2, Section uh, 273D, okay, which also can be mayhem if it's permanent brain damage, and uh, you guys could be arrested for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Ryan, Ryan, followed by Pamela Harris, followed by Gabrielle Ingram. Hello, do you guys pick and choose when you're gonna clean this? That's not my time, I'm just saying. Sometimes I've come and you guys clean it in between each person, and sometimes you don't. So the severity of COVID, does it get cleaned in between each person anymore? Can you please clean his, uh, are you concerned? Can you please clean his, Alma? Can you cl clean that between? I don't know how serious. You have a mask on, but did, w you're, others, we can clean it. Didn't, and they approached. Okay. I believe it's the first time. Just the, the, the mic, I think, is what he was talking about. No, surface. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alma. Okay, please proceed. Ryan, you have you two have minutes. Some papers here. I would like to help set up these. back hello most of you guys know why I'm here you guys know my name my name is Ryan Harris for those that don't uh, just in sitting in here um, I'm kind of seeing some things and it's just it interests me how you guys are able to kind of pull the blinders on what you choose to uh, talk about and what you do not choose to talk about uh, I'm still finding out what I'm permitted to put up there without it being insubordination <laughs> so once I get that figured out I'll be giving you more evidence as to what I'm talking about um, but since the last meeting, that very day of the last meeting, I did email all of you because you said you couldn't reply to me. So I did email you all and ask uh, each one of you to be my mentor and I haven't heard back yet. Um, so also going back to last meeting, I've been coming here kind of explain to you some of your managers and some of the actions that they've taken against me, including this lady over here to my left. And it's been disregarded and ignored. And uh, a great example of the power that you're giving her is that when I wanted to talk last week on the passing of the Officer Roy, this lady over here to my left again was able to wave her hands in the air. You can watch the video. She was able to wave her hands in the air to stop me from speaking on someone that passed away. So you can only imagine what may be taking place in the workplace if she's able to do that in the personal life. Um, if you look at these right here, this is getting, I'm getting in trouble for bringing up policies that are wrong in our workplace and that should be updated. When I come to my board of supervisors, the top of the top, you can look, one, your guys' paperwork is not even in line. And two, uh, Susan Peters, I don't think that's district three. Right there. So if your guys' paperwork is not even in order and it's top down management, of course our papers is not in order. You have 15 seconds. Thank you. Of course, our papers is not in order. So, you know, you guys, are, you guys are picking and choosing what you like to do and what you like to apply for, and it really sucks for the people that are fighting hard to help. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, Pamela Harris, followed by Gabrielle Ingram, followed by Lydia Matthews. Good morning, my name is Pamela Harris, and I come before the board today with several health concerns for our community. Number one, last year you actually converted $10 million of the CARES funding into general fund. I'm here today and on behalf of some of our community members to request that that money be sent back to public health. COVID is real, Delta is surging, people are dying, and we need to put that money back in our community. So that is our expectation. Number two, I'm also wanting to talk briefly about WIC women and infant and children's program. 100% of that program is funded by the federal government. However, there's a very small component that is breastfeeding. And we all in this room know the importance of breastfeeding. So we are requesting that you supplement that fund. We do not want to hear that we're gonna wait or maybe we may get the money that is just not acceptable because our children's health, you all know, from the beginning of life to the health span is impacted positively by that breastfeeding. 
Number three, the homeless situation. We need to take a recourse. We need to evaluate it. We put millions of dollars into this homeless situation, and it has not gotten any better. Last but not least, I'm sure glad to hear you guys speaking about racism today. Racism is real. It is a negative impact on our whole community. Each of you have people of color, indigenous people, brown people, and black people that you represent. And we are really happy to hear that you are taking verbal action, and we hope it's physical action as well, to support all the acts against, I mean, to not to support racism in this county. We are valuable people. We live with this disease every day, and we appreciate you supporting us in any way that you can. Thank you. Thank you. Gabrielle, um, Gabrielle Ingram. Madam Chair. Oh, just, yes. Just, just for Gabrielle. Supervisor I did, Just to the last speaker, uh, on our last agenda, we had lactation services. I believe that was fully funded. There was a discussion about getting some additional participation by some of the, our nonprofit or not-for-profit partners. But uh, just to uh, uh, Pamela's point, I, I thought there was no question, uh, again, that that was funded and we were in positions, people were being called back and so forth. Is that correct? Yes, we received um, contributions from a couple of health plans. We received, received a donation. And uh, Ms. Katari has indicated that that program will be um, completely the same as last year. We did not add any additional money. Most departments, including the health department, have some fund balance at the end of the year. If they are short, we made the commitment that we would, in fact, fund that by the end of the year. But the program is full, um, as sa same as it was yes, last year. Okay, because the staff report did say there would be, if there was any shortfall, correct. it would be covered. That's yes. correct. Okay, thanks. If I could add as well, uh, just the comment around the $10 million um, having left public health and wanting it back. I just want to state that the money has not left public health. It's still in public health. It was always intended to be used for public health. We have asked some questions about uh, greater specificity on how it will be spent, and we will be bringing to the board uh, that spending plan for that. I think it's $10.6 million, but um, that money never left and was never intended to leave. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, Gabrielle, uh, please proceed. Taller. Okay. Um, I'm here today to lobby a resolution in support of delegating control of COVID restrictions and mask use back to our schools and families. This should be a localized decision as a one-size-fits-all approach does not work. You may, have, you may not have the power to change the state mandate, but you can advocate for our children and put pressure on the state to give local choice for mask, local control for mass choice by following El Dorado County, Placer, Tulare, and Stanislaus has it on the agenda today. We'll see where it goes. Um, we're requesting that you affirm that the county will not be the enforcement arm of the governor and CDPH's arbitrary mandates. I mean, in the last 24 hours, <laughs> it has come down that PCR is being rescinded as a test, vaccinated people are filling hospitals, and our government officials are still urging us to get tested using PCR and get jabbed with the COVID vaccines. The science is not adjusting, or medicine is not adjusting. Science and medicine are supposed to be self-correcting, and the phrase, the science is settled, is anti-science in itself. Um, it's anti-questioning, and it's usually uttered by people who have a personal interest in maintaining the status quo. People are intelligent. They're able to make informed decisions, whether with their doctors or on their own. Um, and it should be left to parents to decide what is best for them and their children if a mask is needed or, or not recommended based on their own medical and mental status. Something interesting I saw that bears repeating, vax people can still get COVID. They can still spread COVID, they can still die from COVID, and they can potentially die from the vaccine. The last month has shown this, if you're looking at the data. Unvaxxed people can also still get COVID. They can still spread COVID. They can still, they can still die from COVID, but they cannot die from the vaccine. So it doesn't make sense when the arbitrary guidelines that are, are literally changing daily are being pushed down and mandated, whether for work or our students. Thank you. Thank you. Lydia Matthews, 
followed by Marilyn Truex, followed by Chris Wagner. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Um, I'm from your district, um, Mrs. or Miss Frost. Can um, you pull down both of those? Because uh, they have a tendency to, oh, yeah. we can hear Echo? better. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, I'm here to ask for you to please support and do everything in your power to advocate for mass choice in schools. Even if you are in favor of masking everyone, having a choice allows for this. I come to you with a solution-focused mindset. I've been called a conspiracy theorist because I have questioned the science. I hear individuals in meetings say, mass choice is not following the science. Is there a study that found masking children is safe? In addition, scientists supported tobacco, the tobacco industry, including uh, pregnant women. They were encouraged, oh, keep smoking. And that was scientific. And look where we are now. It was not safe. Scientists supported the use of antibiotics, overuse. Then the science changed. Scientists supported the PCR test. Now it's being recalled. Scientists supported heavy opioid use. We ended up with an opioid epidemic. My point is, science is meant to be questioned. You don't, you specifically, all of you here, and I'm looking at all of you face to face, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to hold the line in support of bodily autonomy. Don't be afraid to advocate and support choice. I found a quote on the internet. Those who are willing to risk everything and gain nothing are probably on the side of truth. Please stand up and support choice for everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Hello. Um, I did not come with a notebook today or a script as I normally do um, because I think I've pretty much said everything in the past couple of months in regards to masks and children and how I believe that the parents should have a choice for their children. Um, the people before me said it much better than I intend to say it today. Today. Um, they had their facts straight. And I, I believe that you should listen, especially to Chris, who gave us um, a list of m many problems that children are having when they are being masked for several hours in a day. Another thing that I would like to mention is um, these masks on the side of the box say that they do not prevent uh, COVID transmission. So I'm wondering, are we regulating a uh, an article of clothing? Is this since they don't prevent and they are not considered a medical device, is this an article of clothing that we are recommending that our, ch our children wear every day? And where is this gonna go in the future? If we are calling this a medical device, then these children should have a doctor making sure that they are fitted properly and that they are also able to wear these things for multiple hours in a day. My own children are not able to wear these things. And if this is what, just to let you know, if this is what we are looking at, my children will be homeschooled after this. I'm not sending them back in this crap. And a lot of parents will follow me too. You guys are gonna find an exit of the school system. We're not gonna do it anymore. We're just not. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually gonna give you guys a compliment. Um, I was really happy to hear how how concerned you were about the HIPAA for the, the records and the data. Um, if you are that concerned about HIPAA, why would there even be a mention of a vaccine certification or passport? That is a violation of HIPAA. I have to tell you my medical status and show my papers to some business. How is that a not, not a violation of HIPAA? Also, the PCR tests everybody's talking about, what will be the criteria? Since the PCR tests, they said it was recalled because it could not distinguish between the flu and COVID-19. So this whole time, we've had false positives and the cycles were up to 40%. Anybody, if you test them, is gonna test some kind of dead virus and it'll be a false positive. The day 
Biden was elected, they lowered those cycles. So then there won't be as many false positives and look, oh, everything went down. So what are we gonna use as a criteria, I'm asking you, to um, see who has COVID and who has the flu? What are we gonna use? And also, I would like to see a study, like somebody said, that masks are safe for children. I demand that from you. If you're gonna put those children, thank God my kids are grown. If you're gonna put those masks in kids, you better give us some definite, real science and not science with a narrative and a bias. So please, that's what we demand from you. We are we the people, we are your constituents, and that's what we want from you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. April Kukan, followed by Sharice Castaneda. Hope I said that right. Morning. Good morning. So I'll say something right there. Okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that I'm from the medical department side, and I just think as far as the schools and having the children wear the mask is not really necessary. There's no, like they said, science, there's no proof. There's really no need unless you guys are gonna fit those children for custom made ones and then even take into consideration the children with medical needs that cannot be in those masks. There's just no facts or no real statistics saying that that's preventing COVID and I'm coming from the medical side. I understand on that side that some of that is needed just to protect us as employees. But outside of that, you guys pushing that on the children, it's very unfortunate because that's just, it's all a scare tactic I think you guys are doing and it's again it's preventing the kids from even like developing properly there's kids with like suicide issues it it creates a lot of more problems and I think even you guys probably know that you're just maybe not admitting to it but I'm just telling you guys it's very sad and unfortunate coming from the medical side to see that you guys are doing that especially for my nieces and nephews like it's just very it's, it's wrong on so many levels. And you guys thinking that people don't have a choice or they're not gonna find out the truth to it is just, I mean, I don't know what you guys are planning to accomplish out of that. But hopefully you guys end up making the correct choices because like I said, from the medical side, there's no need that the children in schools, like, in a, like that's just normal, what you grow up with. They're supposed to see each other. They're supposed to be in contact with each other and the germs are supposed to be there so they be, build an immunity. And I just think that you guys are out here doing some wrong stuff. So if people from other areas need to come in and voice their opinions, then I just think that you guys need to dig deeper because it's not right at all. So that's just my input on that from the medical side. Like it just, there's no, there's no facts for it for you guys pushing that on the children. Um, there's no real need for it. Again, with the children, um, people with COVID aren't gonna be out, if anything. Can you wrap up your comments? Yeah, I can wrap up my comments, but if you've had COVID, you'll be fine. You're gonna be on the cat, like you're, it's a flu. You guys are playing a lot of games. So I just think that you guys need to do better for the kids at least, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, okay, hopefully this will be the last thing that I have to bring before the board today. Um, I do want to ask, where are we at with all the facts that the county lady was supposed to bring back to us about vaccinated versus vaccinate, unvaccinated deaths, the status, the stats. They were supposed to get data for us. Mr. Cerna, I believe you asked last time. We, we want to know where that's at. Where's all that data that they were supposed to bring forward? Um, of course, they don't have it today, right? It's okay. Um, I want to let you know that God created us in his image. We will not be coerced into obstructing our God-given breath. Masks are completely unnecessary on our children. They need to be removed immediately. You guys, this is considered psychological warfare. You can be held legally, financially, and criminally accountable if you continue to mask our children. We are not playing. We're tired of it, okay? That's it. That's enough. 
Um, I just want you guys all to know that this whole segregation between vaccinated and unvaccinated it's unconstitutional, completely unconstitutional. And that is what they're doing. They're trying to separate us between those who will accept this experimental vaccine, which is not being given full consent, by the way. Nobody's being told that they could die from it. These children are 12 years old and plus. Mr. Desmond and Mr. Kennedy, shame on you. Shame on you for for, for doing this to our kids in their schools, taking these vaccine clinics and, and giving them cookies, cookies and ice cream, really? Shame on you, okay? Do your research on this experimental vaccine, okay? It's, it's completely dangerous. Masks are dangerous. This is the kind of stuff that is considered criminal activity. If you continue to comply with criminal activity, you will be held financially and legally responsible. Get the masks off of seconds. our kit. I'm gonna remind you again the First Amendment. <clears throat> Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise, therefore, or abridged the freedoms of speech or of press or of the right to people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. The First Amendment gives us the right to free speech. How can our kids express themselves verbally if their faces are covered up? Mr. Kennedy, where's your smile? Are you not happy? Do you not want to share Can you your please smile wrap with up the your world? Comments, God please? gave us smiles to share because it definitely is important Can for us to- Can you please wrap up your comments? Yes, it's important for us to smile. Suicide, anxiety, heart, heart attack, autism, infertility, birth defects, up your comments? death, severe reaction. Those are all possible from the vaccine, okay? Stop pushing it on our kids. Thank you. That's it. I want to thank all of those who uh, came out to um, express public opinion. It's a really important part of the American process, and we appreciate you, you um, informing us as to your thoughts. Okay, we, uh, uh, we do have a person on the phone, so we're, we move on to the phone public comments, and we'll, um, we don't have any more from the floor that I know of. Not that I know of, no. Um, could you please send the, pub, the commenter? Hello, caller. Hello. Please start with your public comment. You have two minutes. I have been a long-term resident of District 1, but I may not be for much longer. My child attends school in Sacramento, where she is severely discriminated against due to not taking the dangerous experimental COVID shot. This has caused us to remove our daughter from the Sacramento school system to attend a school in a neighboring county where they value our constitutional freedoms. Sacramento treats its citizens like they are sick rather than starting from a presumption of health. This is unconstitutional. It's like a jury assuming that a criminal defendant is guilty before, taking, before being proven innocent. Your decisions are causing good citizens to leave Sacramento and to, to remove our children from Sacramento schools. Placer County and El Dorado County recently passed resolutions that were emailed to you that allow parents and children to choose as to whether they should mask. You all must adopt a similar resolution for Sacramento that allows for mask choice for everyone, including school children. Olivia Kassiri stated that our children should be masked in school because they may spread COVID to, to family members. This is completely without merit since family members can choose to either face a 99.5% survivability rate or take their own measures for their protection, including masking, vitamin D therapy, or pharmaceutical therapeutics such as ivermectin, whatever they think works for them. Masks do not work. They don't block dust, which is 0.5 microns. COVID-19 is 0.1 microns. An article from lifesitenews.com was emailed to all of you that explains 47 reasons why masks are ineffective and dangerous to wearers. Olivia Kassiri has not provided any clinical studies that are peer reviewed to support an unconstitutional mask mandate and to prove that masks are effective against COVID. Even if she did, parents and children have the constitutional have right. 
Even if she did, parents and children have the constitutional right to be presumed healthy and to choose whether or not they should wear a mask. Adopt, adopt a mask choice resolution for all. Thank you. Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with Hi. your public. Please start with your public comment. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Hi again, my name is Mackenzie Wilson. Um, I was inspired to call after hearing some of the off-agenda comments. Uh, I don't want to be condescending, so I'm gonna try this differently. I think that there is a lot of misinformation entering um, the, the, the Board of Supervisors today, and it has nothing to do with the fact that these folks are uninterested or not even educated. I think that this has to do with the way that this crisis and very real pandemic has been handled from the very beginning. Um, I think a violation of your constitutional rights would be me begging and making sure that you guys could stay away from my kid because 365 children dying is not zero percent. That's a chance that my baby could die. Um, these masks do not cause deformations. They're actually the reason that um, even flu rates were down last year. They're the reason why only five million deaths have occurred. Instead of pitting us against each other, mask wearers, not mask wearers, vaccines, those who get the vaccine and anti-vaxxers, the truth is, is that the reason that this is still a problem is because of the way that this pandemic has been handled, not just here in the city and the county, but here in the state, the nation, and the, and the world. This has been a, a profit over lives. This has been a, a uh, what we're aiming for is a plagued nation state. Y'all, like, I, I don't really understand why we're worried about, like, why are you worried about your child wearing a mask when it literally is gonna save a life? My child hates wearing his mask. I have to tell him to pull it over his nose all the time. It's gonna be normal, you know? Um, but I really hope that you like take a second to really weigh what matters to you. Are you are you worried about your child getting some acne seconds. in a pimple, or are you worried about people and your child dying? Because that's what I don't want for you. I don't want your child to die and then you to be like, damn, I really should have understood that this was very real. Keep it up. Keep the mask mandates, and we should be under a mask mandate because COVID is getting everybody, whether you're vaccinated or not. I hope you put the entire county under a mandate. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. And we have one more. This will be the last caller. Hello, caller. Hello, caller. Yes. Please start your public comment. You have two minutes. Hello, my name is Karen Younger. Uh, I was calling on uh, item number 16, but I guess they didn't see me in, on the hold queue. I wanted to urge you all to follow the World Health Organization's recommendations to not mask children at all under six, and then to consider, consider, I'm going to quote, the impact of wearing masks on a child's psycho social development. And then I wanted to read you another little statistic that's quite alarming. It says, this is out of the Placer Board of Supervisors pass a ruling. It said, um, compared with 2019, the proportion of mental health reported by the United States Centers of Disease Control beginning in April 2020, related visits for children aged 5 to 11 and 12 to 17 years increased approximately 24 and 31 percent respectively. I think that's really frightening. Those statistics, all of you are parents, should be rethinking any sort of mask mandate for children. And so that's, that's the purpose of my call. Please leave the children free to develop in a more healthy way. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our public comment and we'll move on to next item, please. Item number 29, hearing to lean delinquent water use service charges and adoption of resolution ordering delinquent utility water use service charges be collected on the property tax roll. Madam Chair. 
Oh, yes, Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of uh, perhaps saving some time uh, today, um, I wanted to ask if we could take all of the, uh, I think it's the next five items. Um, they're all similar. If we can have them uh, read into the record and vote on all of them at once, is that something we can do? County Council maybe needs to weigh in on that. Yeah, you have to have a public hearing open and close a public hearing on each one. So you could read them into the record, but then you would have to um, take a open and close the public hearing on each one. We'll move through them as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you, though, for trying to think of that because it would have been uh, ex expeditious. Hello. Good morning. Chair Frost and uh, board members, we'll go through this as quick as we can. We have uh, the next six board items, they're for hearings uh, to, to lien and transfer various utility service charters and utility tax to the property tax roll. Our office is recommending the board approve these service charges and uh, tax uh, transfers and tax to be transferred and collected on the property tax roll. The number of accounts and amounts will continually change until final transfer to the property tax roll at, is processed on August 28th, 2021. Item number 29 is uh, the board members are taking action as the Ca Sacramento County <coughs> Water Agency Board. Okay. And uh, your recommendation is that I open the public hearing and then we vote on it? Correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So at this time, I'm going to open the public hearing. I do not have any public comments on item 29. There are no public comments online as well. Okay, thank you. I'll close the public hearing. Move the item. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Cerna, a second by Supervisor Desmond. Please vote. Madam Chair, go ahead. Unanimous oh, yes. vote. Yes, Supervisor yeah, Natalie. I'm fine on the item. I just, I, and maybe Ben could shed a little light either at the conclusion or now. Interesting enough for 2021 that. Um, uh, there's a um, significant uh, number less uh, in 2021, not just 2020, going back for the five-year comparison. And I guess I'm curious as to why, and this is early. I mean, obviously, people still have a chance to redeem this over the next few days. Um, any speculation as to why in 2021 uh, that there's, you know, again, on the order of magnitude of a couple thousand in some of these cases, uh, less number of folks that are um, delinquent in, in, their char in their charges. We did see that in, yeah. in all across the board that we're, we were, collections are up. I mean, we are, I have no explanation as to why other than folks have been paying their bills. Well, again, it's a, it's a reversal from, again, even pre-COVID. I mean, you know, we can look at 2020 and people can draw conclusions about, you know, distress and stressors and so forth. But um, it, I just found it very uh, notable as I look at the charts here, and I thank you for those five-year lookbacks, um, as to, you know, as you said, you know, the, the collections are up and folks are, you know, not moving to a lean. And I know folks, some folks choose to do it. There's a, there's a, a small number, but the folks choose to actually have it roll with their tax bill for whatever reason. Um, and so you're always gonna have a probably a, a, a amount, it'll never be zero, but I'm just, I was just curious, so. Right, I, I do not have an explanation. Uh, are are the other, other, other entities, again, we know we're not the only one in the state. I, what do you hear from your colleagues, is that? I will actually defer to <laughs> Wendy uh, Randolph, yeah. uh, our chief of yeah. uh, consolidated utility billing. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to get into a long discussion. I'm certainly welcome Wendy to come forward. I just was curious, to, you know, colleagues throughout the state, are you seeing a similar trend? Uh, good morning. I've spoken with a few of them, such as SMUD. Yeah. They have seen an increase, but their utilities are a little different. Yes. Um, and I have spoken with the city of Sacramento, and theirs is about the same as it's always been, really no increase or decrease. But ours is showing a, 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 a significant decrease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. I didn't mean to interrupt the flow here. I just wanted to point that out. Thanks. No, those are good questions. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Supervisor Natoli. Okay. Next item, please. Okay. Item number thirty is the hearing for. We need to read that into the record. Item number thirty is in. hearing to lean delinquent storm drainage service charges and adoption of resolution ordering delinquent storm drainage service charges be collected on the property tax roll. 
This item was continued from June 8, 2021. And our recommendation is to approve those to be moved to the tax roll. Okay, uh, at this time I'll open the public hearing. Um, I do not see any public comments in chambers. And we do not have any public commenters in queue. So I'll close the public hearing. Move the item. Motion by Supervisor Cerna, second by Supervisor Desmond. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Next item, please. Next item, item 31, is hearing to lien delinquent solid waste service charges and adoption of resolution ordering delinquent solid waste service charges be collected on the property tax roll. This was continued from June 8, 2020, or 2021, sorry. And our recommendation is to move those charges over to the property tax roll. Okay, at this time I'll open the public hearing. I'm seeing no comments in chambers. There are none on, on the queue as well. And I'll close the public hearing and uh, entertain a vote. Move the item. Motion by Supervisor Cerna, second by Supervisor Desmond. Please vote. Thank you. Unanimous vote. Next item, please. Item number 32 is hearing to lien delinquent storm drainage service charges for the City of Citrus Heights and adoption of a resolution ordering delinquent storm drainage service charges to be collected on the property tax roll. And this item was continued from June 8, 2021. And our recommendation is to move those charges onto the property tax roll. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lamera. And I will open the public hearing, seeing no comments from chambers. There are none in the queue as well. And so I'll close the public hearing and entertain a vote. Move the item. We have a motion by Supervisor Cerna, second by Supervisor Desmond. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item is item 33, hearing to lien delinquent utility taxes and adoption of a resolution ordering delinquent utility taxes be collected on the property tax roll. And this item was continued from June 8, 2021. And our recommendation is to move the delinquent utility taxes onto the property tax roll. Okay, and at this time I'm opening the public hearing and seeing no comments from chambers. There are no publics in the, in the queue as well. And so I'll close the public hearing and Move entertain the item. a vote. M- motion by Supervisor Cerna, second by Supervisor Desmond. Please vote. Thank you. And the motion carries by unanimous vote. Next item, please. Item number 34 is a hearing to lien delinquent storm drainage service charges for the city of Ranch Cordova and an adoption of resolution ordering delinquent storm drainage service charges be collected on the property tax roll. And this was, this was continued from June 8, 2021. And our recommendations to move those charges onto the property tax roll. Okay, and so at this time I will open the public hearing. I see no comments from chambers. There are none in the queue. And none in the queue, so I'll close the public hearing and entertain. The item. We have a motion by Supervisor Cerna, a second by Supervisor Desmond. Please vote. And the motion carries by unanimous vote. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item is item 35. This is a a public hearing to adopt an ordinance establishing a fee for the management of groundwater in the Sacramento County Groundwater Sustainability Agency, San Joaquin Kasumnis Groundwater Subbasin. UEFO reading and continued from July 13, 2021. I'd also like to make a correction in the impact area. This is the unincorporated county only. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? (coughs) Great, how are you? Good. All right, Um, Chair Frost and members of the board, thank you for your time today. I'm here today to ask your board to hold a public hearing and ultimately adopt the groundwater fee program for the Kasumnas Subbasin for the county GSA within the Kasumnas Subbasin. The fee ordinance was introduced to your board on July 13th. There we go. Okay, a little bit of background into why the why we're here today asking for this fee program. Um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA, was passed in 2014 and became effective in 2015. Um, there are seven groundwater sustainability agencies in the Kasumnas Basin, and you can see the Kasumnas Basin on the screen. Um, the Sacramento County GSA portion of the basin is the blue portion in kind of the southwest corner. 
Um, so the GSAs have been developing a groundwater sustainability plan since 2015, and it's due to be submitted to the state in 2022, January of 2022. We've identified that in this basin, there's a problem. We have declining groundwater levels. We know that groundwater is dropping at a rate of about a foot a year. So the groundwater sustainability plan has to address this problem and hopefully the GSP will identify projects and management actions that will reverse this trend. Okay, so it's important to know that the seven GSAs in this basin have been working collaboratively to develop the fee program via the working group. The working group is kind of the, the structure that we've cre created to, to vote on things as we've developed the GSP. Um, as part of the GSP, we've gathered basin data, we've done monitoring, we've created a model, so we really understand what's going on in the basin. And as part of this, we've looked at implementation of the GSP and how much that's going to cost. So we created a long-term governance committee. The basin created a long-term governance committee to identify different fee approaches to consider. Um, and the GSAs in the basin were very clear that they wanted the fee program to be legal, to be fair, to be equitable. And so the GSAs agreed on a phased approach for the fee program. And so we would look at doing the first year, we would do one portion of the fee program. Second year, we would do the second portion. And we hired a consultant to work on the year one fee study for consideration by the GSA boards. And it's very important to understand that Sacramento County GSA, we are only taking action on our GSA area today. The other GSAs within the Cosumnes Basin will be taking action within their own GSA area. So just to be super clear about that. The first year fee program uses irrigated acreage as a proxy for groundwater use. We don't know how much people pump in the basin. They don't have meters. And so we had to identify a proxy and irrigated acreage seemed to work well. And we're focused on agricultural properties rather than residential or agress with the first year fee program. So the fee program calculates a cost per irrigated acre. And this um, is a consistent methodology throughout the basin, with the exception of Amador and Galt. Amador and Galt are a little bit different, and they're going to use existing fee programs that they have in place to, um, to gather costs to pay for sustainable groundwater management. And we kind of know how much groundwater Amador and Galt use. Um, Galt certainly um, identifies how much they produce, and so we're able to base their, their contribution on how much groundwater they use. So the fee program includes an appeal process. I think it's really important to understand that folks have an avenue if they disagree with the fee that they've been assessed. Um, and in the first year, the fee program will probably fund monitoring, personnel, data management, um, annual report. We have an annual report three months after we submit the, the GSP. Grant writing, the, the folks in the basin are very focused on looking for grant revenue to keep costs down. So, and this slide shows kind of the, the cost that we've identified as a working group. And you can see that um, the estimated costs in the first year are about 737000 and they go up in the later years. And that's because in the first year, we won't be doing much in the way of implementing projects. But in the later years, 22, 23, and beyond, we will be doing projects, and that's when the costs go up. We expect to generate about 500000 in revenue used through the irrigated um, acreage program. Year two, um, we expect we're probably going to have to generate in the range of four hundred dollars to $500,000 with the year two program. Um, we also, like I said before, we're hoping for grants. We're also looking for partners. SAFCA is 
has expressed interest in partnering with us on some groundwater banking projects. And so there is a possibility that we will have some additional revenue coming into the basin through partnerships as well. Excuse me, Carrie. Sure. Super Supervisor Serna. Thank you, yes. Chair. Um, so you mentioned uh, that there is uh, or there will be a, an appeal process. Yes. Um, is there a uh, administrative cost recovery fee associated with the appeal itself? No, not at this time. That is something that we'll look to do in prior years. One of the challenges coming out with a fee program fresh is we don't we don't know how much it's going to cost to go through the appeal process. So I think we would look to gather data the first few years of implementation of this program and then look at an appeal fee or an appeal fee later on. I assume though that um, at the time any appeal um, fee would be introduced that it would it would be based on what it costs us administratively to correct to process the appeal correct. similar to you know what we we do in other um, parts of um, county service delivery so um, I would just encourage um, uh, you and your staff at the right time to think very carefully about what um, that might be because uh, having had the experience of dealing with certain appeal processes and as it relates to um, planning and building um, the last thing we want to do is introduce uh, an appeal fee that people want to appeal. <laughs> so, um, but I, I understand that you, you need to uh, have some, uh, some uh, experience uh, administering this before you can right. figure that out. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate the comment. I think another thing that's important to note is we did create kind of a multiple stage appeal process, and the first stage is a staff level decision. So we are hoping to resolve most, if not all, issues at kind of the staff level. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Natoli had a comment. Yeah, you haven't yet gone through the slide, but it's pertinent certainly to. Um, some of what the Supervisor Cerna was asking about. And Carrie, as delineated on this um, uh, slide you have up, this is the portion that's uh, under consideration in the county. It's a, a blow up of a, of a map that's included in the HDR study that was attached to our report. And one of the issues I want to raise, and it kind of goes back to the appeal, because I don't know about the level of detail and we're relying on a 2018 study that the Department of Water Resources of the state did. And I will tell you matter-of-factly that, that when you take this blue swath, not necessarily in, in, in the county's GSA, there are inaccuracies here as it relates to irrigated lands, mm -hmm. clearly. Clearly there are. And, <laughs> and, and all the GSAs are relying on this data. And you know, I don't know if they did a flyover or what they did, but when we have folks who, um, you know, and I've talked to some of them, uh, and they've gone to the, the appropriate entities, and whether it's been Slough House, RCD, and I know that Gall Irrigation has their, you know, meeting later this week, and I've been hearing as the no notices going out to folks, folks that haven't irrigated land in 20 or 30 years or ever irrigated their land, and they're bound up in this report. HDR relies on it. That's what's given to the, to the governing bodies. And I'm going to just say for the record, because this is the beginning of a process that will take us well, we'll be back in these chambers this time next year, uh, talking about, you know, a parcel uh, application that may include all parcels, uh, whether they use only domestic use or farmed or irrigated for purposes of agriculture. And, and, and so what I want to what I want to ask about, and again, this doesn't just fall to our county department of water resources. There's going to have to be an accurate accounting, and somebody's either going to have to go out in the field and talk with people, or do a windshield survey, and you know, and validate this because it puts this board, but it puts other boards that uh, are considering this, you know, unified approach in a really tough position because you know it's not a matter of one or two people appealing because somebody misdrew the line. This map on page six. You know, you know, again, I could take you out this very day and take you to parcels that in, in some cases, you know, have never been irrigated or haven't been irrigated for 20 or 30 years at least. 
and, and, and but yet that's what bills, there's these prospective bills going out. And so the state's data that they're giving, I don't know, you know, who's concocting it, but it is not accurate. And, 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 and I wanna make that point clear because it puts, you know, folks that are having to consider this, certainly this board, but other boards in a, in a difficult position. And again, I don't know how much inaccuracy there's here, and again, I don't know all that gets, and so I, my question is, what did HDR do? We paid them a significant sum of money to bring this kind of coordinated program. Did they do any validation, or they just basically sit on this data and call back from three years ago in the state, who's telling us we have to do this to begin with? And so I'm really concerned about that because it's gonna, you know, the friction is already building out there, and irrespective of who may speak to us today or other, I'm hearing from other folks Again, I know what lies ahead if we don't do this, but I'm also concerned that we rely on them for accurate data just on the agricultural piece of this, let alone what we're gonna have to encounter next year. So, Carrie, I don't know if, you, again, you're probably hearing similar from, from folks, maybe not, uh, but I got calls over the weekend, um, and again, not for, the, not for the county GSA, but in, in, in other areas, and you know, there's this appeal process, but they're appealing on data that's not even accurate. And, and yet the, uh, these boards, including our board, you know, is relying on that as being factual. And so help me on this if you can. And if not, I wanna make it really clear that going forward, we're gonna have to help refine this and, 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 and you know, and, and whether it's the state either doing an update that's accurate and doesn't just take this kind of blue swath with, you know, intermittent white spaces in between because th that level of detail is not, is not correct, it's not correct. I'm not saying in every case, but certainly in a number of cases, and that, therefore, you're gonna have appeals at the various entities. We may have appeals here this morning, and thank you for your follow-up. I'll get to that a little later in following up on the 100 plus parcels in the county's GSA, but, so, are you hearing, this, are you hearing similar comments from folks? To be honest, yeah. no. Okay. Um, so we sent out mailers, as you Yeah, know, I don't mean for our 100 parcels, so right. you're talking, maybe, to, maybe yeah. Yeah, and I guess I'll be specific yeah. to the county GSA. Right, okay, yeah, I haven't heard on the county GSA, right. Okay, so we did send out mailers to each of the impacted parcels that, that were going to be assessed the fee, mm -hmm. um, and we have heard back from, I believe, seven parcels out of that 105. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one of them, um, he let us know that he uses surface water and he was able to provide his water right numbers and we confirmed that. Okay. So he was eliminated from the program. Mm -hmm. Another person, you know, uh, said that they didn't do any farming at all. So they were eliminated from the program. And then there are others that just got back to us and said, yes, the acreage you have is correct. There were several of those that came back and said, yes, this is correct. Now I would encourage um, anybody who still hasn't responded to that mailer to send us the information because we are interested in updating the data set. No data set is perfect, especially when you're looking at you know irrigated agriculture and it was probably done by a flyby. Yeah. So um, we're doing the best that we can yeah. to to update the data set, you know, with input from property owners. And again, our area, comparatively speaking, it's got you know seven thousand plus acres of you know right. uh, irrigated lands. But when I look at some of the other GSAs who can have a much smaller um, you know govern governance structure, uh, you know, don't have the administrative staff and certainly you know the the um, you know all that comes with that, the wherewithal. And so I'm concerned that, uh, and even in our case, if it's, you know, 2% or a little less than 2%, but if you look at some of the other GSAs that have, you know, many more hundreds if not thousands of parcels, um, and if you only have 2%, you know, the appeals process, and the reason I raise the issue is because the appeal um, is one where this is going on the tax rolls. And so as it's outlined in the ordinance, it will, you know, accrue just like any other debt that gets basically applied within the property tax framework. And you know, the 1% a month penalty and the 10% this and that, uh, if you don't pay it and you know, and, and, and ultimately, um, I don't know if it, can get, if it gets peeled off, but you know, uh, other tax charges if they accrue, uh, you know, can go into to default. And there's, you know, actionable items here that will allow you to go to Superior Court to recover the charges. Um, and so, I just, I think the accuracy of the, the database from which we're working, 
and we're relying on the state for, uh, and again, an even 2% error rate when we're, they're not the ones that are going out to folks and saying, yeah, guess what you're gonna have this year, farmers and ranchers and those that irrigate, you're gonna have $10 an acre charge. And then what lies ahead next year when you go to the ag res and to all other potential you know, uh, occupants and residents and property owners in those areas, so again, I appreciate you know what you've done. Again, we have a much smaller universe than the bigger hole here, and we're working in concert as we go forward. But I, but I just think that between now and then, again, I, what I'm hearing from folks is that you know how did you even how did my parcel even get penciled in? Because you know it's it's either full of trees, some of those out in the eucalyptus grove in the Herald area that you know haven't been irrigated. Those trees were planted and lived on their own for a hundred years, uh, and and. Uh, so I just um, can I, can I I, yeah. chime in. Sure. Um, so I, I, Carrie will, and, and Michael will remember during my briefing I brought this very issue up, um, and uh, having uh, worked once upon a time um, for the Department of Conservation, the Farmland Mapping and Monitoring Program, and uh, specifically, um, we know that that program, uh, which is run by the state, obviously goes out and um, they do um, remote sensing, they do uh, high altitude photography to determine crop rotation and they make assumptions about uh, what they see from uh, those measures in terms of the quality of the, um, the agricultural uh, property, whether it be you know farmland of statewide importance or unique farmland and so forth and so on. But we also know that those surveys are done well, t typically they, you know, they were done every two years. I think uh, Carrie mentioned it was three years, this case, and that's probably, I gotta imagine it's probably pandemic related, but um, that might be, you know, part of the source of the frustration that you're communicating. And I share it with you that if it's not ground truth, either by the state itself and, uh, and is close to real time or by us, um, it does set us up to your point, uh, I think, uh, to a great extent for, uh, for appeals because, you know, uh, if I have 100 acres that uh, I, I had in row crop uh, last season but I decided to fallow or put cover on or whatever, um, but uh, it's reported as having, you know, some pretty intense uh, irrigation for, uh, for what our purposes are. Um, you know, that seems to set up a system where dispute is gonna be pretty frequent. So I, I share the concern yeah. Yeah. and it'd be, um, I think uh, it behooves us to understand a little bit more clearly what the data set is and, uh, there, and, and how fresh that data is uh, for this purpose, so. Good. I, I, I appreciate those comments. And again, you know, we, we have, a, I say, a smaller compliment here, but nonetheless, it's still relevant and, you know, even one or two and, you know, again, in, there's no program that's perfect, but when I look at the scale of this and, you know, how many tens of thousands of acres and how many residents and properties are, are in, included in, in this and the fact that this is, you know, the first step of a second step, as you're going to explain in a minute. And, um, I do want to, at the conclusion of your presentation, talk a little bit about, because I think it's very relevant, and I know I spoke in my briefing yesterday with, uh, with Ann and, and Natasha about opportunities, because again, you know, what's being borne by, you know, rural property owners, and in this case, obviously, the, those that have, are farming and ranching uh, actively uh, on their parcels uh, versus, uh, you know, rolling the entire complement into that and then trying to bear those costs, not just for monitoring and reporting purposes, which, you know, again, is a piece of this. Uh, thank goodness we don't have, you know, meters on wells and such. But, you know, implementing projects, and it's great that Safeco may participate in, you know, in a part of the basin, but this is, this is you know, you know a, a large land mass with, you know, uh, diverse uh, uh, land types, and I think it's gonna be incumbent, if not in, imperative, that we have state participation, not just telling us what the rules are and, you know, dangling some money out there so we can put the plan together and again, in compliments to uh, all the partners for pulling down those dollars to help us get this far. But, you know, there's, you know, what lies ahead and how you actually implement projects. And, you know, again, I've seen some of the correspondence as well, you know, for us to bear that either as a county and or as small GSAs that are a partner in the, in the sub basin and, um, it, it, it's going to be a, a tremendous um, uh, task, and uh, the implications for the costs 
are great. And I just think that they're, you know, just, you know, if this is a good thing for the state and it's a good thing for us in our region and so forth, uh, for all the dollars that are available to do all kinds of water projects to help us be sustainable in the basin to do those things that help us one to um, uh, make good use of, of of water as a precious resource, but also, uh, you know, if there are projects that help, you know, uh, benefit and uh, you know make make it so that that is a sustainable basin. Then we need to have participation. I mean, I don't, I, I don't see how we get around that because to bear this with local property uh, owners uh, and even the county, you, you can bring something to bear. I, I still think it's it's, it's going to be a, just a overwhelming uh, cost uh, right. over time. So yes. anyway, uh, so I'll ask you some questions at the end. But, but thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for bearing with me. But I just wanted to point out as I look at this map and pondered this and saw this little cutout here, I thought. You know, th th this is going to lend itself to some some controversy uh, going forward. So yeah, and I think that we are all of the GSAs in the basin are interested in the best possible data sets. So well, we sure. will continue those efforts to you know look into other data sets. The other thing I'd I'd um, say is that the process of reaching out to those impacted parcels within our GSA and getting input from them has been a really positive process. And I think I would suggest as we're evaluating data sets in the future, that be part of what we do. Because I think getting input directly from folks on the ground who own this property, I think that's our best way of, of getting good data. So. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. Thank you. So I think we covered most everything on this slide. Um, yeah, the county GSA area has 105 parcels, and we have about 7,200 irrigated acres. So we talked about the data set quite a bit. Um, I think that's it. So the first year fee program, the calculation of the annual fee is very simple. It's really just looking at the costs of implementation um, divided by the number of irrigated acres in the basin. Um, we land on $10 per irrigated acre and that is an annual fee. And again, the costs for implementation go back to the slide that I showed you earlier. We did remove the $230,000 partner grant um, line item, though. So this slide shows the, the various GSAs in the basin and how much fee revenue will be generated in those GSAs. Um, Sacramento County is in the orange, and we should generate about a little over $70,000. I think um, it's important to know that um, with respect to this fee program, it will be acted on by each of the GSAs in the subbasin, with the exception of Galt and Amador, who are doing their own thing, um, and Slew House Resource Conservation District took action last week and adopted the fee program, as did Clay Water District. I believe Galt Irrigation District and Omochumni Hartnell are going to be taking action or considering action this week. So the public outreach process for this fee program um, has been ongoing really throughout the development of the fee. We did have two public workshops in the beginning of June. We had one virtual and one in person. Both were very well attended. We had over 100 people at each. Um, we've also had open um, working group meetings and GSA board meetings. Um, and then in the county GSA area, we did mail out the fact sheet and we did reach out to folks and let them know what their fee would be um, in order to get feedback, early feedback from them. Um, and then for the phase two fee program, we're looking at developing that in the next year. Don't have any details about that, what that will look like. But um, we, are, we have gotten some input from folks at the type of engagement that people would like during that process. And some have suggested a citizen's advisory committee. And so the GSAs are very interested in, in making that happen. So we'll work on defining what that looks like in the future. Can I just ask a quick question, Madam Chair? Sure. Um, sure. So in, in this summation here, the bullet points, talks about board hearings review proposed fee. 
we're using a calculation here, and I talked to council about this earlier, uh, using the, the what's under the Prop 26 for this particular application and, and what we're considering here, or at least would fall under that category. I, but my understanding is that it, when you go out to a broader audience that it's anticipated we're gonna use the 218 vote process, and I know Correct. not everybody subscribes to that, um, you know, the, the, the fairness of process, but that's what's in, embedded in law. And so I guess I would just ask, Lisa, when, we, when this says GSA board here means to approve the <coughs> fee, <coughs> basically it would be going out to <coughs> a vote of landowners, is that? Is that what's anticipated? It would be a standard Prop 218 process. Okay, so that would be utilized throughout the basin then by all the GSAs, is that? Right, I think my understanding is that is correct for the future um, fees. Okay, yeah. and, and, and would it include <clears throat> the component we're talking about <clears throat> Excuse me. today? So you would go for a validation of uh, this subset that is, you know, the irrigated acres, and so you would, it would all be rolled in together for a 218 vote because it would be over a period of time, is, is that correct? Or do you do a carve out for <clears throat> the parcels that were being asked to apply the fee here today, and then those that would be added that may have just domestic use or um, household use versus you know irrigated acres um, that are calculated on this, will everything be bundled together? Is that the, is it anticipated? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure what the process that um, the GSA is planning on using. Do you know, Carrie? I don't. Yeah. Okay. So don't. this fee in question is not a properly related fee or charge under 218, right. so it's not required to be noticed. But of course, any future fees that do meet that definition would be. Um, this could be a standalone, as you mentioned, um, or they could uh, roll it into any future fees. Okay. But I don't know what the plan is. All right, <clears throat> that's a key point for when we come back come back to certainly this board, but I, I trust other uh, m members of the, you know of the uh, GSA boards that want to take a look at that. You know, because right. again, this is utilizing a groundwater extraction fee uh, in, <clears throat> in lieu of obviously something that's related to a parcel right. tax. But um, so if there's going to be a delineation, I think that should be known fairly early on. Uh, and because if some get the vote on it and some don't, right. That may be an issue of some contention as well. So, sure, okay. that's Thanks. something we'll we'll talk about and definitely. Okay. Thanks. Get back to you. So, um, as far as the timing, probably we'll be looking at having board hearings for the proposed phase two fee um, in spring summer of 2022. This slide just shows um, what happens if, if we fail, if the GSAs in the Cosumnes Basin fail to um, sustainably manage the groundwater. Um, the state board comes in, that's the way Sigma is written, and when the state comes in, they, it's not cheap. And so, you know, I don't want to go through the specifics of how much it would cost, but I, it will be more expensive if the state intervenes. And so, I would, I would offer that I think our plan is better and more cost effective. So the recommended actions today are to open the public hearing regarding the proposed ordinance establishing a fee for the County Groundwater Sustainability Agency in the Cosumnes Basin, consider public testimony and objections regarding the matter, close the public hearing, and adopt the attached ordinance establishing a fee for groundwater management in the Cosumnes Basin and approve the resolution requesting to initiate the fee process with the county auditor's office. Okay, so seeing no uh, comments from board members, I will open the public hearing. We do have <coughs> two um, um, individuals in the board chambers who wish to speak, and we will move forward with Austin Miller, followed by Jay Schneider, and we thank you for being here and for your patience in waiting for this item. Hello, supervisors. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Austin Miller. I'm the district manager for the Slough House Resource Conservation District and the Kasumnas Subbasins Working Group uh, External Communications Representative. Uh, first, wanted to say thank you to the county for playing an instrumental role in getting the Kasumna Subbasin to the point where we're at today, which is a nearly finished GSP that will be 
uh, considered for adoption in the coming months, uh, as well as um, where we're at with this fee uh, process throughout the entire subbasin and the other GSAs. Uh, I would have been a hard lift for us all to do this individually, so first a, a sincere thank you. I wanted to address a comment by uh, Supervisor Natoli regarding the correction of the data. Uh, as we've been working through this, as Carrie mentioned, we have recognized that there are errors in the DWR data. Uh, we have the SLU House RCD board had uh, interimly approved a methodology of verification of that data, and uh, in the last few weeks we've looked at a significant portion of our listings. Uh, and before we submit data to the county by August 6th, I believe that we'll be able to take a pretty comprehensive look at uh, all of the parcels that are being impacted. Uh, that's specifically for the Slough House District, but my board has uh, made it clear that we want to be able to help the other GSAs as much as possible, and it is my intention to uh, work with the Galt Irrigation Board, the Clay Water District, uh, and the Omichamani Hartnell Water District Board uh, to make sure that we do as much uh, of that verification as we can uh, before it has to go to an appeals type process. Uh, and I, I again appreciate the comments that looking towards the future, we need to maybe reevaluate what data source we're using or build in a step to correct some of that data before it uh, gets to uh, a point where we're uh, communicating to the public with. So I definitely hear uh, those comments and concerns and, and want to uh, reiterate that it's very well in line with kind of what our planning team has been looking at. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to confirm that the SLU House RCD board did a approve our resolution on July 14th that adopted the fee and the fee study uh, and then the Clay Water District, as Carrie mentioned, on July 20th did the same. Uh, and Galt and Omna Chumney Hartnell Water Districts uh, are slated for tomorrow and the next day. Uh, so again, just thank you. wanted to make sure that uh, you all understood where the GSA's uh, boards are currently at and uh, the recognition that uh, we do have a lot of work ahead of us, but I believe in a collaborative effort, we, we can do it. So, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. Jay Schneider. <clears throat> I sent a letter in. Can you put it up? Can you, can you pull up on the screen the the uh, comments I mailed in, please. Uh, uh, Mr. Schneider says he mailed in some comments and he would like to put them on the screen. Do you have them with you? Do I you do have not. a copy yeah. of it? So they're right on there, right on your site. <clears throat> well, I don't have access to that right now. Let me see. We, we don't have our. Uh, we don't. You, Don. I have, a, I have a, a copy. Yeah, I have a co copy. So we have a can, copy. Can we uh, put it on the <laughs> screen for him? Here. Let's, Thanks, Don. Here we go. <laughs> this is the board item that came from staff. Do you want to, more than that one? Yeah, right. Can you put two side by side? Is that the way you do it? Yes, done? we can do that. No, I give me one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Tolly Chair, Mr. Cerna, for um, the comments you've already made. Uh, if you'll give me a few seconds, I'll try to make this, uh, I'll go through some very relevant items. And one of them, particularly that you talked about, Don, is how we got here and uh, what kind of data did HDR use. But right now, just real quickly, this is the area of Kona Depression at the Galt Irrigation District. It's right over the top of it. And Galt Irrigation District plus Slough House Research Conservation District, the brown area, we're going to be paying 72% of the tax. 72% of the tax. And you guys are number three. We're paying $170,000 each, and your, guys, your rate payers are going to pay 72. Yeah, um, this is tough, this way. So bear with me, please. Oops, where's this? Um, I'll go real quick here. In, uh, there's some facts on this sheet. 
that are pretty simple. First of all, we got the grant. We formed a framework agreement, and we appeared here in, 19, in 2017 and screamed that it was taxation without representation. There were seven GSAs, and regardless of size, they had the same vote. You can see by right here, the small, smallest districts comprising 16% of the basin had 57% of the vote. So when someone tells you everybody voted on, everybody agreed, this creaky minority is what agreed. And so then, then we got a huge grant, millions of dollars are spent developing data. And, and then we entered into a cost share agreement with the County of Sacramento that is good till June 2022. In other words, they contract with the Department of Water Resources to make and provide, oh, geez, excuse me, a uh, approved groundwater sustainability plan. And then we, all the little GSAs agreed, and we paid $32,000, I believe. But the government funded most of it with their big grants. Now we're being asked to thrust this thing on our ratepayers. If you have 50 acres, you're going to pay $500, never before, brand new tax, and it probably won't do a darn bit of good to solve the problem. But let's go to the real guts of this. I'll try to. Can you? Go, if you can put this page up. Can you please? We'll, we're, we've gone over, but please proceed I'll, and, I'll and try it, to get. I'll make it very, as quickly as I can, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to interrupt okay. you. But the, these is, this is the agencies. Okay, this is the percent of the constituents who are taxed. This is how the tax bill we're going to get, if you guys approve this out, it's 37% Galt Irrigation District. Imagine that, that little district. 36% Suez, 15% Sacramento, 6% of which 5% Clay Water District, and none of this, they don't have to pay any of this tax, but they voted on it. Uh, so everybody got one vote, and this is the percent of deviation. In other words, this guy's out here got seven times. So their constituents, there's a few thousand, they're, 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 they got seven times more representation. And Clay and Galt, Galt City and Amador County, infinitesimal because they're voting on our taxes that they're not going to have to pay. Okay. Mr. Schneider, can want, you... Let me, please let me finish this. Okay, page. This okay. This has gone on for since 2015. Okay. Then they put in a little... <coughs> they put in a small committee. They call it the project committee. It was secret, not open to the public. Yet, a majority of this working group board sat on that committee. So when they come out and made their committee recommendations, they all had the vote rigged. Okay, they made policies on every single project bar none, is a SAFCA project. Unbelievably, this plan doesn't include a conservation element. It doesn't even ask for voluntary conservation like the governor just did for everybody. And every water district in the country is asking for it. They don't want to do voluntary conservation because they want to do these pie in the sky SAFCA plans. You guys are all on the board of SAFCA. You need to tell SAFCA to get out of the Kasunis Basin and let the people that live in that basin make decisions. Okay, now this is the most important. Mr. Schneider, can you, please, can you please no, get to the... Please let me go through this. Yes, please okay, proceed expeditiously if, Amador, if you can. So, okay, Claywater District, 5%, $25,000. A board member who lives in the basin and lives in the district sets set on the plan. OHWD. 6%, 29,000. Board member who does not live in the Kasunis Basin and doesn't, is voting on taxes for people that do it. They recall the grand jury told Florida RCD not to do that. People that live outside the Elk Grove Water Works in the Florida District don't vote on the, how much taxes the Elk Grove Water Works pay. Sacramento County, 15% of the fees. You didn't have one single appointee, <coughs> not one person that lives out there ever on that board. Carrie, who's a nice person generally, but she, she has no right. You have five years to go out there like they did down in Salinas. They went out there and the landowners chose who the representative was, not the county staff. 
Why okay. in the, none of your members that you're going to tax had any input to this. Do you understand that? Okay. Slew us RCD. We're paying 174. A board member on our board, the only one that doesn't be in the district, declared himself the boss, and he voted on here. Four members of our board live in the Casino Basin. The one guy that doesn't demanded that he do Mr. the Mr. Schneider, can you please That's wrap it. up your comments? Golf Irrigation District, the board member lives there, but he can almost say a hard-working man, Lou Connor. So he could hardly have been there. But a man that sits on like five boards and wears a dozen hats voted in proxy for him. So these guys down there had no representation. Now, this is the last thing I'm going to get to, Madam Chair. Please, yes, that would be Don, great. when we were getting updates on the, excuse me, let me take this off. When we were getting updates on the HDR thing, I said at one of the meetings, we have a lot more information to give you on these kind of lands, where the problems are and where they're not. So I, I, we said, great, it was on a Zoom meeting. So I sent him some information on other information that was the only thing they got from the state. And this is the email I got back from Kerry. Jay, don't reach out to ADR. HDR works for the county, and I'm taking directions from the working group via the long-term governance suite. This was the long-term governance suite, right here. All staff people that don't live in the basin on that. Not from individuals. So we weren't allowed to give HDR information. You guys have to not approve this. And not only that, live up to the cost share agreement. You could, I don't know if you said validation there, but if you went into validation, I would love to hear discovery or de deposition on how in the hell you could do the Nexus study, the equivalent for a tax that a CEQA study is for a project, and say no one can put any information in, that the studiers would just have to rubber stamp. It wasn't a study. It's a joke. And Can you please wrap point. up your comments, Mr. Okay. Schneider? What we need to do, there's a whole list here, Don. It was kind of hastily drawn. First thing you need to do on the first page is to absolutely undo what you did in 2017. It says, never again, ever, we have such taxation without representation. That committee has to have representation equal to how it's going to pay. If this went to a 218 vote, the, those exact percentages is who would vote. 72% of the vote would become from the very people that are going to pay all the tax. Not 72% of the people that don't pay the tax and don't live in the area. I swear, I mean, Madam Chairman, this is beyond a uh, horrible issue. This is, mm -hmm. you said we don't have our constitutional right of representation. Imagine that. You said we don't have a constitutional right of representation. Sure, people could buy slaves when it was legal. Okay, but can you wrap up your wrap up your it's comments so that we can continue this to conversation? Have a system where you say your constituents and our constituents don't have a right of representation. I am sorry. This has been a long, hard, agonizing process because we sat there and watched as those that represent the great majority that are going to pay 82 percent of the tax couldn't vote. And the little committees went out, and they come back and stacked the vote in committees. At, there was no chance. Could you imagine we put in conservation projects Mr. Schneider, and vetoed them? Mr. Schneider, you've had uh, nine minutes now. OK, everyone else got two minutes. <laughs> if you would, please, uh, we, we're, we thank you for your comment. I think you got your message across very well. And please, the, the microphone is off. We're, we're yeah. can, can you please conclude your comments and we can move forward with the meeting, sir? And I thank you. I, 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 I don't, uh, I think right now you, you, we should conclude your public comments so we can move forward with the meeting. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I wonder if staff wants to respond to that. I was under the impression that each one of these um, 
uh, areas where this was just the beginning, um, where this is a process, but I did not I did not understand about re the representation part of it. Uh, so can you please respond to that? Absolutely. So the action that, that we're asking you to take today has nothing to do with representation. We're talking very specifically today about a fee program for the county GSA area in the Cosumnes Basin. And he's talking about a different area? No, okay. no he's talking about a, a basin-wide governance program, and we're, that's still kind of in development. So, so we're working on a joint powers agreement for the basin, and that will come before your board probably in the fall sometime. And that's going to lay out voting, how we make decisions. Jay is referring to the one vote per GSA voting structure that we've used, you know, since we developed the working group. That was the, the voting structure that was agreed to by everyone. So now we do have a joint powers agreement that we are contemplating. It's, it's not done yet. So he's kind of jumped the gun on that a little okay. bit. Okay, and so there will be, but there will be a public process, you know, in the formation of that JPA, yes. and there will be yes. proper representation for all parties. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. I thank you for responding. I do not have any more uh, uh, speakers in the chambers. Do we have any on the phone? There are no colors in the queue for this item. Okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing and Supervisor Natoli has some comments. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, and certainly thanks to uh, uh, our speakers uh, that you know <clears throat> waited out through the morning here and certainly um, appreciate the comments. I, a, a couple of things, and I referenced them certainly in some of my questions. Uh, I think it's very important, uh, you know, certainly looking to the action we're considering here today, but, you know, looking forward that obviously representation, it's not the first time we've talked about this and it won't be the last because I think it's, it, it is key, particularly when we're talking about, uh, you know, generating uh, dollars through public processes, ones that obviously uh, will place a, you know, a responsibility on uh, landowners and in, in, in residents, depending upon how it is ultimately crafted, uh, going through the 218 process. And um, when it comes to water, I think we all recognize that not just because of the current state of, you know, of our <laughs> of our situation in the state when it relates to a drought, but just generally that you know it's essential to life, it's essential to any activity that we do, and certainly to the prosperity and, and livelihoods and daily life uh, in our communities, uh, wherever you live in this county and in certainly our, our region, state, and, and nation, and the world. But I would <clears throat> say that um, you know for today's purposes, this has been a coordinated effort. I'm you know prepared to support going forward. I do want to uh, call out that um, I, I would uh, ask that you know we can have maybe some report back as to you know <clears throat> as we look to next year. I think we need to have frequent. Um, reports to this board. Um, again, certainly Carrie and, and, and Michael Peterson and our department uh, represent this board and the county's interest at the working group level, but if we get into a joint powers authority, what that's gonna look like. But secondly, how we uh, would look to the future for paying for what's gonna be required, not just, as I said, monitoring and, and, uh, and such and reporting, but actual um, efforts that will hopefully reflect um, you know, a positive uh, impact on the on the groundwater, uh, which people rely on in this in, in 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 this basin, but certainly throughout this county. And I would just say too that I think that um, I attended one of the public hearings uh, uh, in the Herald area, though, and you know, there's probably 150, 175 people there. The Herald Firehouse. It was a warm evening, and again, uh, Mr. Miller and others uh, uh, worked to do a presentation. But it was clear that I think. Uh, there's some contrast between uh, not just the uh, you know, r r folks that live in a rural area and whether they be on ag res or certainly an agricultural oriented parcel, and concerns about you know how a municipality only pays X and there you know there's new home construction the population is probably comparable to what you would find in you know in in, in, in the remaining portion of some of the rural areas. And you know their their, their responsibility is only X and uh, they rely 
solely on groundwater as well. And and, uh, and so I think there are issues that will continue to, you know, uh, you know, rise to the top. But governance is key. I've said that before, and, 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 and some of my colleagues have heard me say it over the years, is I think representation. And so that's going to be a key piece of it. And, you know, that hasn't been settled yet. But I think we are moving in a course that allows this uh, basin uh, to uh, develop a plan, hopefully one that will be well received by the state. Uh, we're bearing the responsibility along with obviously the grant monies that helped, you know, uh, put together uh, the elements of the plan. Uh, but I think long term, you know, to have uh, folks in the rural portions of the county shoulder responsibility for implementation um, is going to put a, be a tremendous burden in, in something that I think is um, really not reasonable. So I'm going to ask that as a part, maybe as a follow on, and I know we, in our briefing yesterday, that we get some information if there are additional monies available uh, for implementation. You know, that this basin obviously is key to you know, the production of food and fiber in our community uh, and certainly uh, beyond, but also. Uh, you know, the inhabitants are looking to this board and the, the, the other GSAs to be their representatives uh, on, you know, seeking, you know, funding and hopefully uh, a plan that does not bring in the state to, uh, you know, oversee this because, again, I think that would be, uh, you know, a, a very mi bad misstep uh, to allow it to happen. So with all that being said, and I know the hours late here, I would... Um, you know, <clears throat> move the, the recommendation here uh, with the expectation that we'll see this uh, again in the near future um, on, and uh, that would be regular reports to this board. But I, I really want to key in because I think if we go out to the folks next year, last thing I'll say, um, to the folks for a 218 vote, we better have a pretty solid plan about how we're going to help supplement some of that uh, work because otherwise I think it's going to, you know, the, the cost that would be associated with that are going to be, too much uh, for people to bear, and will might be reflected very well in the in, in, in the outcome of the vote. So, anyway, a lot of work ahead, and again, I appreciate the, certainly this board's engagement over the years. We've certainly spent a good deal of time in these chambers, and uh, thank our staff for their work. Um, and again, uh, I look forward to, to to moving forward. But I, I move the item. Second. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion by Supervisor Natoli, a second by Supervisor Cerna. I can't remember if I closed public hearing. You did. You did. You I did. did. Okay. The um, old age is not fun for some of us. Okay, uh, please vote. Unanimous vote. All right. Next item, please. Next item is item 36, and I need a motion to drop this item from the agenda. So moved by the chair, second by Supervisor Kennedy. Please vote. Unanimous vote, thank you. And right. item, Next item. item 37 is a public hearing to consider changing the name of a portion of Zinfandel Drive to Eagles Nest Road in the Rancho Cordova community. Can I have the overhead, please? Mr. Romo, we haven't seen you for ages. <laughs> Good to see you, Jose. Good to see you. Madam Chair, members of the board, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, actually. My name, my name is Jose Romo with County Engineering. The item before you is a request to change the street name of a portion of Zinfandel uh, Drive to Eagles Nest Road. The segment of uh, roads um, stretches from the intersection of Douglas Road southerly to Kiefer Boulevard. Um, on November 8, 2011, after the completion of the Zinfandel Drive extension project, the board approved a request by the Department of Transportation to change the street name of Eagles Nest Road to Sinfandel Drive to maintain uh, street uh, name continuity. I think the um, I think the, the 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 project then was up in this north northerly area, and it just seemed appropriate to change the name for continuity's sake at that time. Subsequent to the street name change. Uh, community groups in the area express support to have the street name revert back to Eagles Nest Road, indicating that the Eagles Nest Road street name is more appropriate for the character of the area. Letters are on file from representatives of various community groups, indicating that these organizations support reverting the street name back to Eagle, Eagles Nest Road. Therefore, staff recommends that the board adopt the, the attached resolution. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you for the brief report. Is uh, our golf course, the uh, Mather Golf Course, going to be the only address that would have to um, change back? Is yes. that correct? Back. Correct. Yes, okay. it is. All right. I just, I, I'm familiar with uh, street name changes and what that uh, implies for um, uh, for those that uh, you know incur, incur the cost of. Uh, changing their address, whether it be on their, you know, letterhead and, you know, all the materials that uh, have their address. I just want to make sure that uh, this is going to be minimal and, in effect, only affect the county of Sacramento. It sounds like it is. Correct. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cerna. Supervisor Natoli. Yes, I know we have some uh, public speakers. I would just say that was an important consideration that you know, the, the timeliness of this, the, uh, because it, just the... Um, uh, Mesa Lake Park and the golf course, and, and again, well, the one that has actually active use or the two that take the addresses currently. And, and it's interesting with the red line that was displayed on uh, the exhibit that, you know, part of the outcome of, again, this board's very w aware of the process we went through with working with Mather Alliance, with citizens, with uh, property owners, and certainly economic development and planning to. Um, Look at you know an alignment that would uh, you know protect additional vernal pool resources and, and environmental resources, and so the the straight red line is no longer a straight red line. It actually bows out a bit, uh, <laughs> and uh, again it was a positive outcome. And again I know this board weighed in you know going back a number of years ago when uh, when we took a time out on the process and you know re redid it and came up with a, a good outcome I believe. And so um, again that that, that was. And I would just say this is I know this was prompted by a discussion we had when we had Mather South before us in January of 2020, and uh, I appreciate the fact that it's here before us now. It, it's taken some a little additional prompting. I'll be very honest about that on my part, but um, I think it's it's timely, and uh, we want to hear from folks, and then I'll prepare to enter a motion. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor. Okay, at this time I'll open the public hearing, and we do have two individuals who have waited. Very patiently, I want to thank you for that. <laughs> we'll start with Joy Nahijian and followed by David Nahijian. Good thank morning. you so much, Madam Chair and the members of the board. My name is Joy Nahijian and I represent the Mather Alliance. We work with stakeholders to advocate for responsible use and management of Mather Field resources. And as, again, as uh, Supervisor Natoli mentioned, on February 28, 2020, we stood before this board and we supported the approval of the Mather South project and we are so grateful for all that process and being part of the process as stakeholders. So at that time, we made public, public comment and we submitted this letter to ask that you would reinstate the Eagle's Nest Road as stated um, by Mr. Romo, and we appreciate that so very much. And during that meeting, I wrote in my personal notes that Supervisor Natoli said <laughs> that we need to consider reinstating the Eagle's Nest Road name, and I wrote, yay, and there's a big happy face, <laughs> and uh, a public hearing was required absent any of the supervisor's uh, disapproval. And I suppose that none of you disapprove since we're talking about it today, and I thank you so very much for that. So uh, I want to say that I'm really grateful for the governance of this board. It's very apparent that you care about the consent of the govern, and you hear each one of us, and you listen. And so I can't thank you enough for that. I want to cry. <laughs> It just makes me so grateful. I'm going to cry, too, because we, we don't hear that very often. <laughs> You're the first person that's ever said that. No, I'm just kidding. At least you know, today. I heard it earlier once, but anyway, I've heard lots of being here lots of times. But I just want to thank you so much for the support that you've given us, Mather Alliance, um, Supervisor Natoli. You are so forever in our hearts. We, I'm really grateful. Thanks. And I'm crying because we're moving to Tennessee, and we're... It's really hard for me to say goodbye. So anyway, I just want to oh. say thank you. And I, um, the reason that we bring this up is that the driver speeds on Zinfandel have increased so dangerously, and it's next to a very sensitive preserve. We think that reinstating Eagle's Nest Road will uh, slow their drivers down and hopefully posted speed limits to, uh, are you crying? <laughs> You're making me cry. <laughs> 
buses speed limit is down to 35 miles an hour, and we're just really hoping that this will impact the, the driver's sense of awareness that they're in a sensitive area, and it's just really important. It's all part of the package, and we're just so really grateful for everything you've done, and we just ask that you please vote yes to reinstate this road name. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joey. Good Thank luck you. <laughs> Good afternoon, David. What can I say about after that, right? <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> yes, yes. So I just want to thank the board for, for hearing us. Um, about eight years ago, we got involved with um, just the impact that a development south of the golf course was going to make on, on our community, Mather community. And you guys just helped us out a lot. You, you allowed us to have our voice heard. And that was an unusual thing. I worked for the state of California government for 37 years. And um, it's, it was um, it, encouraging to me that I could just see that the public actually had s impact. And you allowed us to, to talk about that. And so this is for us, Joy and I, she kind of, I was supposed to tell you that we're moving. But, but she, uh, this is kind of our, for Joy and I, our final hurrah. We're, we, we were able to uh, get this one, uh, the, the name change for uh, back to e Eagle's Nest is something that many people in our community and, and Mather Alliance were really um, wanting to do. And so, so thank you guys for hearing us. Thank you for allowing us to uh, be a part of government and uh, hearing our voice. So we, I do support this, uh, this resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, well, I'm trying to avoid the tears. I would just say that, um, you know, it's been a real pleasure to certainly work with David and Joy, and I can still very vividly recall when they reached out via certainly a handwritten letter to begin with and then requested a meeting with me uh, you know, going back probably eight or nine years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly... Uh, brought forward some thoughts about uh, the planning processes for, you know, the uses of you know, lands out at Mather, and uh, you know, the rest of it is certainly history. A lot of hard work and uh, engagement by um, you know the broader community, and certainly they were leaders in that respect, and they're very, very humble and very kind, not only in their comments but certainly in their work, and uh, but also very positive and, and very uh, committed to, I think, not only the. Uh, place they call home, but for the long term as relates to, uh, you know, positive investment out at Mather, but certainly the preservation of the, uh, you know, the environmental treasure that we have there with the, the um, uh, Isla Column Preserve and certainly the wetlands. And this board, I know, uh, took it very seriously. And I know as three and two of my colleagues uh, who were at the time, uh, we had a pretty interesting public hearing back in September of, I guess, when was that, 2017 or 15, 2015. Um, and from that, though, uh, a lot of good work came. And again, I commend our staff. And I know that, uh, uh, again, they're not here in the chambers today. But I just want to say that uh, it's been a real pleasure to certainly have known and to work uh, with the Nahesians and, that, and the Independence of Mather community and, you know, the broader alliance of folks uh, from, you know, throughout the, you know, Sacramento <clears throat> County and Sacramento region. And uh, I had no idea you were moving. And, and I will certainly, you know, uh, uh, you know, miss seeing you from time to time, but you know, th th this I think is a reflection of of, of the good work that uh, uh, was done, uh, you know, <clears throat> by the community, but certainly in concert with this with this board and you know, and our staff. And so, I'm pleased to to support it. And uh, uh, again, if people don't slow down for the condition of the road as it ends the paved surface now, I'm not so sure what what will. But um, if it helps, and it helps to draw attention to the historical aspect of not only the road but the the area and. Uh, uh, then you know I think it's a it's a good thing. And uh, lastly, I would just say you know to to Joy and David, thank you for your public service. And I know you both re retired now, but um, wish you well and thank you on behalf of the alliance and your independent <coughs> Mather homeowners and others. Uh, uh, it's been a real pleasure having known and worked with you. And uh, again, I'm glad you do it, drew a smiley face back in 2020. Uh, it was a long time to hold a smile, but today you can. Put a you know, a, 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 you know a, another uh, additive uh, exclamation, exclamation point. And with that, I'm going to move the uh, staff recommendation and thank our staff for their help on this as well. Second. Okay, I heard a motion by Supervisor Natoli and then a second by Supervisor Kennedy slipped in there first. I'm going to 
uh, say that we do not have uh, callers on the line, so I'm going to close the public hearing and we're ready to vote. Please vote. Unanimous vote. And, and thank you, Ann, for getting it to the board. That's a, yeah, that's really great. And, and hopefully starting. you'll come back for the unveiling of the bronze bust of Supervisor Natoli. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And we're sorry you're moving to Tennessee. <laughs> Okay, uh, at this time we have, uh, we are going to um, adjourn to closed session. We, I anticipate uh, we will reconvene at 2.15, closed session on seventh floor. Thank you. Welcome back to the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors. Today's date is July 27th, and we are back from our <coughs> lunch recess. This meeting is called to order. The clerk would please call the roll and. Yes, good afternoon, supervisors. Desmond? Here. Kennedy? Here. Natoli? Here. Cerna? Here. And Frost? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, and so uh, item 38, this is your first afternoon item. This is the American Rescue Plan Act overview and project update. So good afternoon. I would just like to introduce this. We have uh, Stacy Larson, Emily Blumenthal, and Stephanie Chang from Deloitte who will be giving you a presentation on the findings from our community survey and outreach that was conducted. And we will be asking you to validate and or change and update some priorities that uh, came as a result of those, um, those meetings and outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. It's good to see everybody again. So I am Stacy Larson and joined here with Emily Blumenthal and Stephanie Chang who will be briefing on the uh, community and departmental needs survey that we um, discussed the last time that we were here. So going forward, we're gonna cover really the overview of the funding process that we'll be covering for the, our effort. Then we'll go through really the summary of all of those survey findings and what issues really raise to the top in terms of importance both from the community and the department for the potential use of ARPA funds. We'll go through the process that we use to prioritize those various issues that were raised in the survey and then um, the process also that we use to determine what the priorities are going to be for the county and then we'll cover kind of what happens next. Okay. So today's goal is really to determine what are the priorities going to be for Sacramento County for the use of the ARPA funds following the input that was provided through the community needs survey as well as the departmental survey. This is not gonna go into all the detailed project scoping and all those, those nuances of exactly where every dollar is gonna go, but what are the, the main issues that are going to really anchor um, how the programs are scoped and the projects happen to really solve these issues that the county is facing. Okay. The process for which Sacramento will strategize, Sacramento County will strategize and make decisions regarding the funds received through ARPA are documented on the slide. The first two steps have already been completed. The first step is, is what we spoke with you about last time when we presented at the Board of Supervisor meeting. We put together a survey to gather insight from both community members as well as county departments on the most pressing issues facing Sacramento County. We will be briefing out on the results of both of those surveys during today's presentation. The second step in this process outlined on the slide is where we analyze the results of those surveys to determine a ranking of the issues that the community and departments felt most strongly about addressing with the ARPA funds. We are currently in the third phase where priorities have been drafted. These priorities were drafted using the output of the community needs survey, the department requests, as well as with discussions with county leadership. 
The sole purpose of the discussion today is to get approval from the Board of Supervisors on the priorities so we can continue with the process laid out on this slide. In later steps, program allocation will be determined, projects will be scoped and executed. However, for today's discussion, it is critical that we align on the ranking of the issues that we've asked the community and departments to provide their feedback on. At the conclusion of this presentation, we will talk more in depth on the next steps outlined on the slide. Oh, I, yes, Su Supervisor Kennedy, I'm back from lunch. I'm here. <laughs> Low blood sugar. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to interject and, and kind of interrupt. I apologize, but um, because of what you're saying, I, I get it, and I just want to make sure that those that are listening uh, on the public completely understand what we're doing here today and don't have a higher expectation. Yes. You know, we're basically you're asking us to look at the priorities, and and so you're putting a skeleton before us with not a lot of meat on the bones. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. And I just want to make that really clear because I don't want people to come with the, the expectation today that we're going to have a full-fledged out plan by the time we leave here. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and this process was designed very intentionally, right? So we want to make sure that we have alignment on the priorities before we get into any discussion around how much should be allocated and then the projects that would be scoped within each of those areas. And, and, and quite, quite frankly, nothing to do with you guys, but from, from our perspective, I think that is a great approach uh, instead of just doing this piecemeal and not having that roadmap that you were going to put before us. So thank yeah, you. the point of this approach isn't to really just go and be able to spend money. It's to actually go and really make an impact on Sacramento County with these funds to solve the challenges that were exasperated through COVID and some, honestly, that were here beforehand that now we really see um, were made apparent throughout the, the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. I just had a, a quick question. Supervisor uh, Natoli. Yeah, just as you were reading the last couple of sentences, you said something about community and departments or a community department. What, could you clarify maybe just, what, what, what were you referencing? So we conducted two different surveys. Okay, the community first, and department. Yes, exactly. So the first one was conducted um, and was put out for community members, so residents and organizations, to submit their input on the most pressing issues they felt they wanted addressed via the ARPA funds. The second survey that we uh, designed was specifically for departments to provide their input on, um, on projects. And that was kind of that first step that we'll get to later down the road around potential projects. Okay, and, and I wanted to ask when it comes to departments, um, depending upon how narrowly or more broadly you might define that, so did you reach out to the sanitation district? Did we reach out to the library authority? Um, again, those are relative. We are part and parcel to that, and you know some of that includes infrastructure. There may be others. I just those two came to mind. So yeah, were they? I know for a fact, the sanitation district did definitely contribute to the surveys. How about um, I, I don't remember a library off the top of my head. And, and was that incumbent upon them, or was that an outreach that we did, at least we pinged them initially on this, and if so, I again, I'm not saying you excluded anybody intentionally, and maybe they were all included, but they're important components of the you know, Ecosystem. community framework and infrastructure Absolutely. and services that are provided, and so I want to be sure that we were inclusive in that regard, and maybe, you know, I. Think about the air district, maybe too. I mean, again, you know, these are uh, this is county, but we have folks that are involved in community health, community services, infrastructure, and I don't know how broadly, again, we saw it, or was it just defined by, you know, the list of department heads under the county's, uh, um, you know, listing or directory. Yeah, so um, departments reached out to encourage participation amongst exactly the type of governmental organizations that you were talking about, and I have um, libraries did submit a request through the community they, needs survey. They did, yes. San and Sanitation District did, I think yes. I yes. heard that. Yeah. Any other? Um, Let me check for you. I can give you, we have our listing of- Okay, I don't want to uh, yeah. interrupt the flow of your presentation. I just, but I, as I, you, you defined me what you meant, and I just yes. uh, started kind of pondering it as you were talking, so. Yeah, so the, yep. the specific county departments responded to the departmental survey, um, but they also encouraged their counterparts um, that were not specific county departments to respond via the community survey. And then the um, county as well, also um, through their various social media and communication channels, also um, 
provided the information for the community as a whole to be able to respond to the community needs survey. Okay, and what about dependent park districts? We don't have many of those. Park district, we got park a lot of responses. Park districts did respond. Yeah, we, yeah we, we have, we have yep. you know, separate independent and we have dependent park yes. districts. That, uh, okay. Yep. Yep, we have school district, park districts, public library, water authority, all under that other governmental organization. Yep. Okay, very yep. good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Please proceed. The Community Needs Survey was designed to solicit as much community input as possible. In that vein, there was a free text component of the survey in order to ensure that we were providing a space for community members to provide their insights without restriction. We also designed the survey to be completed in under 10 minutes to encourage participation. As a result of both of those measures, we had a strong response rate. We had over 1,500 community members and organizations provide their feedback through the survey. We captured contact information, organizational affiliation if provided by that respondent, as well as a narrative description of the issues that those respondents felt most strongly that the ARPA funds should be used for. Additionally, we asked for input on recommended solutions related to those issues. We did not capture demographic information, geographic information, or whether a respondent resided in an incorporated or an unincorporated area. Was that by design? Yes, yes. And why, why was that intentional? So one of the things we wanted to encourage as much participation as possible versus having folks who didn't want to maybe provide certain information um, or that might kind of turn them off from responding. And then when it comes to really being able to look at the use of the funds, the um, you know equitable allocation of the funds based on the various issues will be accounted as we go into program design and project scoping. But the, the issues as a whole are, are the countywide issues. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Well, just to piggyback on that, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I struggle with that a little bit because the issues are not all countywide issues. Um, the, the, the issues for the folks in the unincorporated area, uh, a lot of those issues are not dealt with at all by the, the cities, right, in Sacramento County. Um, they're, they're unique to folks who live in the unincorporated area. And uh, I thought we were going to try to capture at least at least what, what supervisory district maybe they're coming from. Um, so, so there's no way, now it's too late, we can't get any of that information. We so have we no do sense. have their contact information for those that did actually provide that information, for those that did um, respond to the survey. But as we were talking to different folks, not everybody actually knew exactly what district that they belonged in themselves as well. We wanted to be able to get everybody without having to have folks um, know everything about what district they were in and all of that stuff and just be able to provide their voice. Okay. I, I just think it's, it's, there's a lot of value in hearing from folks in the unincorporated parts of the county about the needs for economic revitalization yes. and opportunities uh, in those communities. Um, so. And I do think that as we decide how to allocate the money, yes. we will have to weigh those factors um, greatly, and we will. No, and I, I, yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and I, I just, I, I did think that we were going to get a little bit of sense geographically where, where the responses were coming from. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree. Our unincorporated area is important. To, they don't always get the resources because they don't have the the city resources behind them. So. For some of us that have a large unincorporated area, it it's an important behind. consideration. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also going to uh, um, suggest that uh, um, one of the shortcomings of this exercise, I think that's pretty obvious from what you've mentioned in what's on this slide, is that without demographic or geographic information associated with uh, this first attempt to solicit what the priorities are for Sacramento County. Uh, we, for instance, um, can't uh, deduce whether or not there's a set of priorities that are very distinct that are associated with disadvantaged communities or communities of color. Um, in addition to, I think, some very valid points that my colleague Supervisor Desmond makes about uh, incorporated versus unincorporated. And for me, um, that's ex extremely important because 
um, as the supervisor that represents the least amount of unincorporated area, uh, but who represents some of the poorest areas uh, in the region um, that it just happened to be within the city of Sacramento, but of course I'm their supervisor as much as I am for uh, uh, the unincorporated part. Um, that, that, leaves, that leaves me wanting uh, in terms of uh, understanding kind of the uniqueness of what the priorities might be for, uh, for certain uh, neighborhoods. Uh, for instance, given your N for this, which is what, 1,000, how many, 1,500? So, you know, hypothetically, without knowing the geographic part of that, that's 1,500 responses that hypothetically could all come from uh, East Sacramento, could all come from Fair Oaks, could all come from, um, you know, uh, Gold River. Um, and I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm taking it to an extreme, but the point here is that without kind of the ability to cross tab uh, geographically where these responses come from, there's not a way to kind of temper our consideration of how we ultimately will be appropriating uh, resources based on kind of what we know about our districts and what we know about our neighborhoods, what we know about unincorporated versus incorporated, and certainly what we know about um, where there's the greatest <coughs> greatest amount of need in the county. So um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that based on what the county CEO just mentioned that that uh, can in fact be uh, something that is a uh, intended complement to what we're seeing today. I'd, I'd consider what we're seeing today pretty, pretty elemental without that other um, aspect of, of what's uh, important for me at least, which is the demographic and geographic components. And as um, Supervisor Cerna, as you've and I, you and I have spoken about before, um, you all know your districts really well and um, can likely provide us as we begin to scope projects some guidance on um, where those resources should go and i also think you'll see in slides coming up that the um you know lion's share of the responses fell into to two areas that um, are issues facing the entire county both incorporated and unincorporated thank you thank you supervisor cerna and and Supervisor Natoli. <laughs> yeah, just again, I know we're going to leave this part of the presentation, but so you didn't even do zip code capture? Not for the community needs survey. Well, it is what it is, and I and I get a lot, you know applaud the you know fact that you got more than 1,500 respondents, and you know I take all that seriously, but I, you know, it seemed to me without outing anybody uh, that zip code, I mean. When we deal with all kinds of issues, at least you capture some sense of where geographically your your you know your respondents are coming from. You know, they obviously you still depend upon them to disclose that. It doesn't determine any more than just tells you a general geographical area. And if we're going to parse this further, then I think you know you need to look to uh, one again, maybe for future. Uh, again, I'm just going to offer this. We we didn't really weigh in on this, but I think that you know the zip code is pretty essential just as background data, I mean, nothing else, you know, what's your zip code? Um, and if you don't know or don't want to disclose, you can have a column for that too. I think also to uh, some of the other comments made here that, you know, uh, the distinction between urban, suburban, rural, uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, th those are important too, because again, you know, maybe, uh, you know, in every case, it rises to the top, but, uh, you know, you've got a broad enough band here as it relates to uh, your uh, public health response, your your um, infrastructure uh, impacts, uh, you know, I mean, you're going to go through these slides in a moment. Um, again, maybe in retrospect, and again, it's not being critical, so don't take it personal or even uh, critical, uh, you know, as far as your professional approach to this thing. Again, I'm not anyone that has the insight into that. It just seems to me that to bring it to today's discussion, and we're gonna set priorities, to have some sense beyond whatever correspondence we've received, the comments we received today, certainly on this item, and you know the input we're getting uh, from different quarters, um, you know, we're largely dependent upon what you bring us, and uh, frankly, I mean, to Phil's point, you know, you could add, you know, um, you know, everybody in the city of Alton uh, responding, you'd add half your respondents. I mean, that's being silly, and it's you know not. But so I don't know where you know you know you know I, I could guess, you know, but I just think zip code would have been would have been a real helpful piece to 
give us some sense of, you know, those that chose to respond, those chose to participate. Uh, and again, it's not the only determinant by any means, and so I, I, I don't want to overstate it, but um, again, you know, I guess you'll help us work through this. We've got more work to do, and I appreciate what Ann said, and again, certainly the you know, level of, you know, interest that you brought forward by doing the survey and getting more than 1,500, you know, folks, uh, respondents, and that's, that's a good thing, so I don't want to take away from that, but I, I think it's just a little bit short of what might be useful in today's setting to help us give you some more, you know, give more guidance around this, but I guess we'll see how it plays out. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. Supervisor Cerna. Yeah, just, just real quick, and I, I want to hear the rest of the presentation, but um, a little foreshadowing here, I think at the conclusion of this presentation, but um, and through the chair, before we hear from members of the public, I think I have a suggestion I'd like to, to, to make, um, and certainly I want to do it before public comment, so the you know, those members of the public that may uh, join us by telephone have a chance to react to it. But I think what I have to suggest might ameliorate some of the concerns that I think have been rightfully expressed by Supervisors Desmond and Natalia and myself, and Supervisor Frost as well. Certainly, thank you. Go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Um, Alrighty, so due to the free text nature of the responses, there was some subjectivity involved in analyzing the survey responses, and our analysis was limited to the information that was provided by uh, respondents in the survey. So we just wanted to note that at the top. Again, our intent with this survey was to cast as broad a net as possible in terms of soliciting feedback. So we open this up um, to both residents and to organizations. As you'll see, we received over 1,500 responses, of which over 80% were residents. Within the 20% that were organizations, we've laid out uh, the breakdown within that, but almost half were submitted by um, nonprofit or community-based organizations. Within our residents, we saw alignment to the top two issues that were focused on. So the number one issue that community members, or residents, excuse me, um, reported on in the survey was homelessness, directly followed by housing. Um, under organizations, again, with that top group, the 49% that were nonprofit and community-based organizations, we saw the exact same thing. So homelessness was the number one issue, followed second by um, housing. Within our second respondent group under organizations, so business organizations and the Chamber of Commerce, um, again, homelessness was the number one issue reported, uh, second followed by economic response. We touched on this earlier, but governmental organizations include groups such as park district and libraries. Um, and finally, we, we touched on this earlier as well, but departments did reach out to these organizations to encourage participation and to solicit additional feedback. Community respondents were allowed to submit responses for multiple issues as well as select as many issues as were relevant for each issue that they reported. Homelessness was overwhelmingly identified as an issue by every respondent group, both organization and residents. 60% of our respondents that responded to the survey noted homelessness as an issue. Within the resident versus organization breakdown, 60% of residents noted that and 45% of organization responses noted homelessness as an issue. Housing was also identified as an issue um, by 45% of respondents and the lack of affordable housing was the top issue theme identified under um, housing. I do wanna note also under homelessness, the number one issue theme that we pulled out was homeless encampments and nearly 43% of all issues submitted uh, via the community needs survey mentioned homeless encampments. The issues reported under the economic response area includes support for small businesses, worker shortage, loss of revenue and additional expenses, excuse me, due to COVID, 
And then our other bucket includes food insecurity, disaster management, and support for tourism. From the department survey, health was the number one issue that was reported via department requests. Over 65% of the projects that were submitted via the department survey were related to health. Health was the fourth issue identified by the community uh, survey. There were some areas in which the department responses aligned to the needs that were identified by the community. For example, there were 16 department requests that were directly uh, related to housing, which obviously ties to one of our top two themes. Um, and there were some areas in which the issues identified by departments were not noted in the community needs survey. So for example, 35% of all department projects that were submitted were related to HVAC improvements. Um, and then rehabilitation of water storage tanks was also another issue noted by department requests that wasn't really brought forth in the community needs survey. I want to just, uh, I just want to point out in, in, in this, uh, in this community survey results snapshot, <clears throat> I followed up and got some numbers on, you know, how many people felt homelessness was a priority versus housing and all the other categories. And you have health, there were 496, and under homeless, there were 906. So homeless was by far the overwhelming, overwhelming mm -hmm. concern, but I want to submit that health... Uh, mental health in particular and drug addiction, uh, I believe are, and I think a, a lot of people might agree with me, are a major part of homelessness. So There's not a line where homelessness ends and health begins. It's a very fluid line and even the housing, you know, there's a whole spectrum that everything's kind of working together on that. Yeah. And, you, and you'll see in the slides that we cover, um, I think in a few slides, we, we specifically recommend looking at health, homelessness, and housing, um, looking at the intersectionality of that, right? So there are things where there's significant overlap. There are some issues that kind of exist within each one of those on their own. But generally speaking, that's one of the things that came through incredibly strongly in the survey responses mm -hmm. was that those issues oftentimes were reported within one response. Yeah, I, would, I didn't. I just wanted to throw it out there as a, pri pro a priority of mine would be mental health and um, drug addiction treatment. Um, and I don't know where you're, what you're looking at, what category you're looking at, but I'm saying it, it's in the top one. It's yes. in the big one. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, just as you were going through the departmental responses, you said that H back. Now, is that upgrades because of? COVID or you said H, how many, you said 35 or 49 percent? 35 percent. Said right. what? Were related to the need for HVAC improvements. And related to what? To because of health upgrades or just because of old systems? <clears throat> Relating to creating healthy working environments as a COVID mitigation. It is, okay. That's, exactly. that's how it could be um, framed as an eligible expense within yeah. our All providers. right, so you, you, that wasn't a matter of interpretation, that actually was stated? by the departmental respondents? Yes, correct. Okay, I just want to be clear because I was, I was puzzling over just, it was just purely HVAC, but it is related to the health It's not response. because people are too cold or too hot. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, no. got it. Okay, no. very good. Thank and, you. And again, to that point, so part of the reason why we've structured this in the way that we, excuse me, in the way that we have is to get alignment on the priorities and then revisit based off of really this group's input how those projects should be scoped, right? So to your point, projects will only be scoped to adhere to the requirements of the funding. Um, and so we'll work and, and county leadership will work back with department heads to make sure that those projects that come forth really are representative of how the funds are supposed to be spent. Okay, and just one follow on then under the category uh, of the water, sewer, and broadband, um, were, you said there's 150 requests. What was the number of requests uh, under that category? The subtotal? For departmental. For departmental? Yes. Give me one moment. Under, so we had, under department projects, we had 20 uh, department requests related to infrastructure and one related to broadband. And, and, and those are solely water and sewer, right, or, or stormwater? 
The way that we framed infrastructure in yes. the survey and in the definitions we provided mm -hmm. in the survey, infrastructure encompasses water and sewage, and then we broke out broadband. Yeah. The rationale there being that from a layman's perspective, at this point, some people may not automatically think broadband when they think infrastructure. Okay. And is my understanding that the, in the state budget that there's been billions of dollars allocated for uh, broadband upgrades, and I know that there's, you know, parts of the uh, of the county, uh, some of the outlying areas, but maybe even uh, mm -hmm. closer in, that um, from a standpoint of competitiveness, but you know, even usage for students and you know, and, and others, uh, broadband is sketchy at at, at best, um, and uh, you know, maybe that's been revealed in your survey, but in fact you only had, in departmentally you only had one project for broadband? Correct, and again, the purpose of structuring this the way that we have is is really to use this time to align on priorities, and if broadband is something that from this perspective moves up, then we'll work with the departments to, to really scope projects around those areas. Again. And again, we're going to have the conversation here, and you're helping us with that. But you know, the fact that we only got one response on broadband, you know, doesn't you know doesn't show that it maybe was a massive response to you know improve broadband for the entire county for every citizen. I don't know, but uh, I'm just you know it, it makes it a little difficult in the conversation. Again, this is a survey instrument, but if we only had one departmental response, and obviously maybe going back to that slide up there, um, it received you know I guess what 250. Responses. 150 uh, department. Uh, 150. Yep. Uh, uh, no, no. I'm looking at the, the chart. Oh. I went back to your previous one where the community response. You had 500 respondents. It looks like about a half, half of that. So about 250 people noted that as a priority. So we had 1,500 um, community respondents, and again, community members could select multiple yeah. issues. So I just want to be clear on the numbers there. That the right. So if I if I were responding, I could write down my issue, and I could say it relates to. Broad, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, broadband and for you can make them all. You can make them all a priority. They didn't have to rank them. They yeah. they were able to select. Um, for they reported at an issue level and then selected within the issue what the uh, how the it aligned to the, exactly the category. But did it? But it, how did it rank against the columns? It didn't. You just they selected within that column and they could select multiple columns. Right. But it was all given equal weight. No, so then we, so sorry, so during our data analysis phase, we analyzed all of the results and pulled out themes and then did a strength assessment essentially to say this is a number of times that this theme came through. Okay, yeah. again, I don't mean to be so dense on this, but again, this is what's being presented. I'm trying to get some sense about how this was weighted and you're helping me by explaining that. So, okay. Yeah, and we'll touch on that a little bit more. Yeah, as well. thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. Supervisor Cerna. So, uh, isn't some of this, or maybe most of it, um, the way that it's, the words that you use are based on uh, the Treasury guidance, correct? Correct. Okay, so that's why broadband is pronounced in this. That's why water and sewage is pronounced in this. Okay, just want to make sure. I'll, I'll just say this. It would have been, and, and maybe forgive me if, if we, we already received it, but I think it would have been helpful in the materials for the agenda item to actually get the survey instrument just to see how. And I know it wasn't it wasn't mailed. This was over the phone. Um, it was online as well as hard copy. As well as hard copy. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe some of these questions would be uh, better answered if we had a chance to actually see what was in front of whomever we're asking to take the the survey. Just a note. Okay. Did you want to see? I'd the like survey? to at some point. Yeah. Can we see the whole survey? The, yeah, the complete survey. Yeah. Sometimes it helps us if we can see the survey and all the cross tabs and the, the entire survey that gives us a chance to analyze it and um, wrap our heads around it. Yeah. I, I want to make sure I, that. I, I want to make sure I understand you want a copy of what the survey looked like that was presented to the public? Correct. Yes. Okay. Oh, Thank I you. thought I thought you wanted the entire survey. No, no, no. A, an example of the questions. Yes. And, how they, how, you know, the, the process that we were asking respondents to, to use, whether it was ranking or not, and, and then how do you draw themes out of yeah. what was used, that kind of thing. Can we yes. get the whole survey? All of the details for yeah. all the respondents? Yeah, we can work with county leadership to go ahead and get that to you guys. Thank you. I would like it. I don't know if yeah. anyone else wants it, but I like to look at the surveys. Thank you. 
I'll now hand it over to Steph, who will review the prioritization process. All right, so we used a three-step process to prioritize the issues. From the survey results, we derived a set of scores. One set of scores was for the theme score. As Emily said, there's, there's the issue, the high-level housing, homelessness, et cetera. There were themes within each of those issues. So within homelessness, for example, one theme was homeless encampments. And at that level, we came up with a score based on the frequency with which it occurred across all of the community survey results. We also came up with a funding fit score. So this is based on the ARPA guidance. What potential activities that could address that theme would be fundable by the, the funds that are available. These were then combined into a, a theme level score and rolled up into an issue score. So we came up with the themes example for homeless encampments, um, for homeless support services, combined those to come up with the homelessness score. This gave us this first column, the quantitative analysis. The quantitative analysis is based purely on the results from the survey, recognizing that the survey, what the survey does include and does not include. Um, there is some subjectivity to the funding fit score. The, the scoring that we used is basically high, medium, low. If it's low, it's not fundable based on what's in the ARPA guidance. If it's medium, it may be fundable, but really it depends on how the project is scoped. And then if it's highly fundable, there is a, a strong case for how these kinds of activities are fundable. There's many different ways to, to justify it based on the guidance. This resulted in the calculated draft priority list, again, based on just the numbers. Next, we moved into a subject matter expert analysis. Working with county leadership, we reviewed this quantitative list. We took into consideration the department survey input. We took into consideration where other funding sources may be available. We took into consideration where the county has existing resources or capacities, for example, programs that address ARPA-related areas that may be leveraged in the projects. From there, we came up with a reviewed priority list. That's what we'll share with you today. So that's a combination of the quantitative scoring as well as the county leadership review. And then that brings us to the third step in our process, which is where we'd like to present this to you, have a discussion, and put this to you for your approval. Okay. So I'll take us into our discussion of priorities. Just to level set um, as we go into this, there are a couple of considerations that I'd like us to keep in mind, both what we're covering and what we're not covering, and what will need to be revisited throughout this process. So some of these things um, will, will need to be considered as you move forward to program allocation, you know, how, how much dollars to put against what priorities, as well as the project scoping. For example, the county may wish to consider setting aside some funds for the administration of these funds, the, the grant management process, the compliance, et cetera. The county may also be eligible and interested to pursue funding from other sources, such as, um, as Supervisor Natoli said, the state may have funds for certain issue areas, and so you may not want to use some of your ARPA funding for that. Finally, in the left side, Sacramento County has received or has been granted $300 million under ARPA as of now and received a portion of that. We recommend that the county create a plan for the entire $300 million, but phase how you actually encumber that fund, encumber those funds to departments or partners to, to implement. The reason for that is that there, there is some risk that the county may not receive the, the remaining balance of that, Part of that is due to the conversation that is going on in Capitol Hill around other, other priorities such as the infrastructure bill and where funding may or may not get kind of reallocated. So we recommend having a plan for all 300 million so you can show that you do have a plan and an intention for it, but being phased in how you formally encumber that. Excuse me, Stephanie. Sure. Uh, Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. Um, so with all due respect, I would say that you missed uh, a, a a statement or a question, I guess, is how you posed it under the 
other funding opportunities column. And that is, you know, we're not working in a vacuum. Uh, we have um, other cities in the county and uh, those cities, uh, most of them, are uh, in receipt of their 50% of the 300 million as well. And so what I'm getting at is that there may be plenty of opportunity, maybe a great deal of opportunity uh, for us not to let someone else fund it and therefore preserve our uh, ARPA appropriation, but to think very carefully about how we work uh, together and um, address uh, common issues that are countywide, in fact, that have no respect for incorporated city limit lines. Um, so I would also add to your other funding opportunities column a very distinct statement about the, the opportunity that working with other jurisdictions presents to, to address some of these common um, issues. Excellent thought. Thank you. Yep, thank you. And we actually had conversations when we were talking about all this that we realize there are great partnership opportunities with cities around some of these high priority areas. So it's not lost on us. Thank you. Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, just to the um, discussion about, you know, what, what, <clears throat> what is the county going to receive and, you know, we have already on deposit 150 million and anticipate probably a little bit, you know, just a tad bit more than that for the second uh, tranche. But I thought one of the exercises, maybe this later in your presentation, was is that in addition to what is coming directly to the county, there are, to some of the points that were being made a moment ago, um, other funding streams that will be available. And again, maybe guidance isn't you know, clear around those, and maybe it's not yet defined, and the federal government's still doing its work. But, and I guess I'm curious, uh, just as we stand and sit here today, um, what's, what are the estimates around that? Where, where the, some of those are competitive, some might be direct, they may filter through the state or through other federal agencies. Do we have any idea, uh, any best guess at what, when there might be at least eligible dollars that this county uh, could, uh, could seek in, in maybe the programmatic areas where those would be available? We don't have a figure for what else the county may be eligible for. We do have within ARPA, what are the other funding streams that are eligible to the county? The specific dollars that are eligible in some cases are still to be determined mm -hmm. and that guidance hasn't been released. We don't have an indication of when that guidance is coming out. Um, we're working closely with county leadership mm -hmm. to provide those updates when we receive them or, or receive a heads up that they are coming. That's part of your work. I mean, if I recall just when the contract came before us, and again, I, I know this has required a lot, of, a lot of effort, but I thought that was part of where you were going to, you know, certainly through time, assist us not only with the survey, but with that, you know, pinpointing those, and obviously, we, you know, we have folks that are very skilled in grant writing and seeking those funds, but to really help guide us so that we can expand upon the opportunity to bring additional dollars for a variety, um, and I don't know how large a variety, I guess maybe I'd like to know some of those programmatic areas where we know that there's competitive funds that either will be available or may already be available, and, and I, I didn't see any listing of those categorical areas, if there are categorical, but maybe they're in housing, maybe they're in transportation, maybe they're in special needs populations. I don't know. I mean, again, I don't, I'm, it's not clear to me, and so you, you folks are more expert on ARPA than I ever, ever will be, so what are some of those, can you just share, what, you know, what might be available out there? Maybe Ann, you know, I don't know, I just, so curious. So there, what we are providing as, as part of our, our scope of work is we're providing guidance, sort of high level process and considerations for the program allocation and for project scoping that does include consideration of other funding sources. Um, we've drafted reference sheets which show for each of the issue areas, housing, homelessness, health, et cetera, what are the other funding sources under ARPA that are currently available to counties or, or county level departments? So what's that general pool of what is available? In many cases, as I said, that guidance is available, but we've, we've essentially flagged what are those funding sources that should be considered and we'll provide guidance of how that can be brought into the, the process as the county moves forward. 
And then depending on specifically what the funding source is, it may be that the county applies for a competitive grant from the state or you know, works directly with the state on different issues or that they need to um, apply for those funds in a, different, in a different fashion. And so we're laying out based on the specific fund and the eligible activity that it covers where that those funds are gonna go before you kind of tap into the county specific allocation. Yeah. No, and that's important what you just said because that was my understanding. <clears throat> Those dollars would be additive to what we know uh, will be coming to the county, uh, and that's part of the wrapped in discussion today. But then, you know, in what sort of time frame? I, I assume there's still limitations uh, relative to 2024 uh, being, you know, the end date for at least uh, the use of a lot of funds, unless there's some specifics on contracts or infrastructure. And so, you know, that's going to be a pretty rapid rollout. I mean, that could be subject to change. I guess Congress or, or uh, the administration could, could change some of those timelines, although I don't think if they required congressional and presidential approval, they're pretty fixed. And, you know, how fast do we need to get into, you know, move into action? Uh, you know, and again, as a county that has talented people, I think we want to be poised, if not immediately, certainly very soon, to, you know, try to capture some of those dollars as well. Um, Recognize that you have to put a lot of you have to put work into you know to attain those dollars. So you have a you said a reference guide or something that you you have that our folks have in hand or will have in hand shortly that will will have in hand shortly. Okay, yes. and that then certainly under Ann's direction to the departments uh, they can. Um, will you have a summary that will provide provide us Ann so we can have some understanding as we're talking to people and you know getting ideas uh, beyond what we have here today. So we'll. Sure, and it is it is definitely our priority to access any and all funds first before using any of our identified funds. But yes, we'll, there will be a comprehensive look at all of that, and we can share that with you. And when I think about special population, seniors or children or you know it, you know disadvantaged communities or uh, you know whatever it might be certain health needs uh, under that under the health component, is, you know again as a social service provider and a public health provider, um, again, those go countywide, um, you know, if there's eligibility, then, you know, we want to be aggressive in, in, in seeking those dollars, and I don't know if they require match requirements or, you know, what stipulations, you know, come with those individual funding streams, but, you know, we, we, we ought to be really, really active in trying to bring those dollars home and, and, and services to, to our community, so. Agreed, and we need, we're, watching closely for treasury guidance because that's the key okay thanks thank you supervisor natoli please proceed okay um, under eligibility so are the proposed activities eligible that was part of our scoring it was also part of that subject matter discussion that we had as part of our second step um, and as i lay out the list of priorities and walk through each issue area, I'll further unpack the eligibility of the, the different themes within the issues. Finally, under feasibility, um, this, this covers whether the county has existing resources, capacities, as I mentioned, that, that can be leveraged um, because there is a, a fixed time frame in which this ARPA funding would need to be spent and these programs scoped executed, reported, closed out. Um, anywhere where the county does have existing capacities, that may be potentially an area of, of, of interest that you might want to prioritize. Okay, And again, these are important to consider when prioritizing issues, but also to continue to revisit during program allocation, allocation of the funding, as well as during project scoping. Or is the timeline on, on the money different in different areas? So under the local fiscal recovery fund, the, the, the pot of $300 million, that is under one timeline. For some of the other funding sources, um, as Supervisor Natoli was alluding to, there are different time frames, different cost shares, different reporting requirements for, for those. And that for information many of those, we're still waiting on the rules around them from the federal government as well. It's complicated. <laughs> <Yeah>. It is. <laughs> Thank you. Here we have the draft prioritized list of issues. As stated before, housing, homelessness, and health were the top three issues across both the community survey as well as um, health being for the department survey. Economic response, essential workers, premium pay for essential workers, 
infrastructure, meaning just water and sewage, education and broadband, those rounded out the, the group. Education and broadband scored the lowest um, in the community survey. Some of that in discussion during the subject matter review with county leadership, you know, is recognizing that there are other funding sources for that. Those are areas that the state may be prioritizing, for example, and so um, we didn't manipulate the, the ordering. Of how how did housing get above homelessness? So the scoring that we did was based, so what, what we showed before the community survey results, that's purely the theme strength based on the number of responses, the frequency with which things, with which issues occurred in the community survey, what came out on top. Homelessness came out on top there. Then we combine that with a score of what is fundable from, from the ARPA guidance. And within homelessness, there were a number of different themes, some of which were more fundable, some which were maybe more moderately fundable, depending on how those projects would be scoped. For the themes that were raised in housing, those themes were all highly fundable under ARPA. So when we combine those scores, housing came out on top. And then through discussion with county leadership, um, we, through, through that discussion, felt comfortable leaving housing men in that top spot. As you said before, though, housing and homelessness and health are all very interconnected. When you consider the priorities and then thinking forward, when you consider program allocation, that's something to keep in mind. The projects that may be scoped may touch on multiple of these issues. When you say housing, do you mean affordable housing? That is one of the themes that was raised. So the number one theme yeah, that was raised from the community needs survey was affordable housing under that housing. Bucket. When you say, but you, this housing here means affordable housing. So housing here means affordable housing. I'll click forward just for a moment. Here you can see the two main themes that emerged for housing. Oh, okay. Affordable housing and rental assistance. And unpacking that from an ARPA perspective, there is a little bit of overlap between housing and homelessness. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Cerna had some comments. Yeah, quick question. Um, I assume there's no open-ended other uh, category that was used, correct? So in other words, you gave respondents a list of treasury acceptable um, issue areas, but you didn't leave it up to the respondent to uh, give you an open-ended response in terms of um, what, they, what, they, what they would like to see uh, funds spent on uh, with perhaps no understanding what the treasury uh, guideposts are. There was a section in the survey for other, which was open. Mm -hmm. We did receive some responses in that area. Would you like to elaborate? Yeah, um, so we received some responses in that area. There wasn't, I can highlight some of the trends that we identified, but there wasn't significant enough responses that, that were fundable given the requirements that we elevated in here. Okay. So Thank other, you. the responses we received under other from the community included food insecurity, disaster management, and support for tourism. Then food insecurity also plays then into health and some of the economic response, and you know, so there's a lot of interplay through all of those. Those, those themes, because there is a, a rationale for them being fundable, we move those into, you'll see when we get to the economic response slide, mm -hmm. you'll see those themes reflected mm -hmm. there. So we can revisit um, this listing again. I'd like to then step forward and go through each issue area and talk about some of the themes that emerged. Before I step forward, just the note that we have on the bottom here. So some of the considerations that should be considered in project scoping across all issues, across all themes, um, are cross-cutting topics such as racial equity, inclusion, um, really trying to target these programs and these funds towards those most disproportionately impacted communities. This is explicitly noted in the guidance to, to do this where possible. Um, and these were concerns that were raised through the survey and because they apply across all project areas, they don't show up kind of in their one own standalone bucket, but we, we do encourage that to be considered across all. So for the top three issues of housing, homelessness, and health, we wanted to look at them all together because of this interrelationship between these issues. I'll just highlight 
um, an example of a theme in each of these issue areas, just to give a sense of the kind of eligibility that the county could be looking at when considering uh, programs and projects. Under housing, as Emily said, the top theme that emerged was affordable housing. Under the guidance, uh, building stronger neighborhoods and communities, including affordable housing development, housing vouchers, fair housing counseling, ca case management or legal services related to maintaining or obtaining housing and trying to mitigate housing instability would all be fundable and eligible underneath housing. You can see how this interrelates, starts to interrelate with the area of homelessness a bit. Under homelessness, I'll speak to both the themes of encampments and support services. So some of the eligible expenses underneath this area would be supportive housing and other services for individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Also, some of these support services and wraparound services could be mental health services, substance abuse services, um, behavioral therapy, um, education, job retraining, et cetera. So you can see how this starts to then naturally blend with health a little bit as well. Um, under health, the theme that I'll just touch on to give some examples of the kind of eligibility that's here is under equitable access to health. So here, funds may be used to facilitate access to health and social services, in, particularly in populations that are experiencing a disproportionate impact of the pandemic. This can be benefits navigators, marketing efforts to increase consumer uptake of, of other federal benefits and assistance programs, could be provision of alternative care facilities, enhancing healthcare capacity. Um, this could also be used to include, to increase access to broadband as telehealth is an area that's increased through the pandemic. So while on this slide we've shown the interrelation between housing, homelessness, and health, we also recognize that across <laughs> multiple issues there are relationships and, and interconnectedness um, that, that may exist. So projects that are ultimately scoped, ultimately funded, may touch on multiple issues, not just these three here. Do we have, um, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, do we have an area in Sacramento County that needs broadband? Or where, where is it? Rural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rural areas. Okay. In some, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I just was trying to, okay. Please go ahead. No problem. Right, so I'll, I'll continue to just go issue by issue area and just touch on one, one theme as an example. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free. Um, under economic response, this encompasses quite a number of different areas. The example that I'll share is just under impact on business and small business. Um, as Emily mentioned in the survey, one of the constituent groups within organizations that responded was the business community, <laughs> and this was their top theme. Um, some of the kinds of assistance that would be eligible under the current guidance would be loans or grants, um, mitigating declines in revenues that, that they've experienced from, from the pandemic. This could go towards supporting payroll, supporting their benefits, supporting some of their operational costs, such as the mortgage, rent, or utilities, or other, operation, other operating costs for their business. It could also include loans, grants, or in-kind assistance to help businesses implement COVID mitigations, um, how to create more healthy work environments, um, make any physical changes to their facilities that are needed, um, help to fund some of the enhanced cleaning efforts or infrastructure that they've needed to get in place. Could also be used to provide counseling, technical assistance, and services, uh, other support services to support business planning needs. Excuse me, uh, Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, just in that same vein, I, and I don't know that you saw it, but we got a letter from uh, an alliance of organizations uh, representing the arts, and uh, I trust they weighed in, and so to the, some of the outline you were providing, they could fit into those categories as it relates to the business aspect and, and impacts of COVID? So community organizations can also receive some funding um, 
I would need to just double check and yeah. make sure if the guidance is exactly the same as those sort of the eligible fund uh, eligible expenses for businesses, but certainly community organizations can receive some. But of nonprofit benefits. or for profit, um, if they have employees and you know conduct certain activities, again recognizing the distinction you just offered, um, and had impacts of the pandemic, generally. Would be it'd be applicable to? It wouldn't be a distinction between uh, nonprofit and, pro, and for profit. Would it? It would be whether they fit the guidelines as it relates to employees, payroll impacts, revenue impacts, those types of things. Is that accurate? I think there is. I, I would need to just confirm and then get yeah. back to you on that. Sure. I I think that nonprofits are eligible in many of the same ways, but I can't say. Right now, it's exactly okay. Well, the maybe same. we can share the letter again. It, they speak on. You know, they, they've written to us as board members and to the county executive just in the last few days yeah. uh, with you know some specific requests but um, I think are pointing out the business impacts and certainly what they do to the local economy but the impacts that they've uh, and, you know felt during this you know past you know 16 18 months so um, again it might be helpful for you to have a copy of that letter at least you can see who's represented there and what their particular uh, uh, take is on the impacts to them and what they're asking so Sure. Okay. Some of that, again, will come up in the mm -hmm. project scoping conversation, yeah. mm -hmm. um, where these nonprofit organizations, they may be arts organizations, but their work may serve a mental health or behavioral therapy yes. kind of benefit. If they can be scoped in that way, then there may be multiple ways in which those yeah. expenses could be justified as eligible. Yeah. And one of the reasons why we asked for that contact information in the community needs survey was for that reach back. So noted, you know, what organization submitted responses and who that was and the contact information. So depending again on the priorities as a result of this discussion, um, that is something we anticipate happening once kind of uh, funding is set aside within each area that departments kind of close that feedback loop and, and work with either the community organizations or the business organizations or whomever it is to make sure that the projects that are being scoped and then that will get put forth in front of you represent those needs. One other question, so are you, are you, is your expectation by the end of uh, today's session that with the broader categories and as you've gone through this that we would then give you some allocation towards, towards those particular categories or no? I'll take that one. No, <laughs> definitely not. Okay. Uh, we're not ready for that. We are presenting to you the issue areas that uh, were the highest priority for the community and asking you to either validate those priorities or give us some direction on what you think the highest priorities should be. Staff will then go back and we'll come back with some recommendations on funding allocations and then after that, uh, projects. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Go ahead. The next area is essential workers, and this was an area of interest in both the community survey and the, in the department survey. So this is a highly fundable area under ARPA, but there are very specific terms around who is eligible for the premium pay and how that, that pay can be determined, which we'd like to review. Um, this, in, in the legislation, this funding is really intended for low and moderate income persons, and in critical infrastructures such as healthcare, education, transportation, sanitation, grocery and food production, public health, safety, et cetera. The county does have some latitude to add additional critical sectors as it deems appropriate, uh, but this is what's been outlined in, in the legislation. In terms of how this premium pay can be um, determined, so, and, the, the premium pay, it can't exceed $13 an hour um, on top of what a worker's base. base salary and benefits would be. It can't be used to replace some of their base salary and, and benefits to, to be paid in place of what an employer would pay for that. Um, the total amount for a worker can't exceed $25,000 per worker and also the total compensation of this premium pay on top of their base salary and benefits cannot exceed 150% of the average compensation for their typical type of role. Um, and there's a, a number of ways that that average can be calculated. Um, as a result of these guidelines, we, we don't expect that um, there would, we, we expect that this would 
again, it would, it would benefit low and moderate income persons the most. Um, <laughs> county leaders are continuing to evaluate this area and, and work on some of these calculations. And the county may want to consider setting aside some funds for this area while these calculations are ongoing. And just a quick note on that one as well. This isn't intended only for county employees in these areas. These are for you know workers in the county, both county employees as well as other organizations. You know, much to what Stephanie was saying, whether they're childcare workers, grocery workers, restaurant workers, you know, essential infrastructure workers in this area. This you know, from the legislation is intended to kind of cover kind of the wider variety. Are they, um, do they have to be receiving pay? I mean, like some of the essential workers like in-home child care may have lost all their clients. They may not be receiving any pay. So do they have to be receiving pay to get premium pay? I would have to look up the exact rule on that or if they may not have issued the rule on that yet, but we'll get back with what the, at least if there's guidance on that yet or, um, and what that is. And that's a very good point, yes. Just a follow on, and so how would those dollars flow though? So say you took the, you know, uh, you know reference that the uh, supervisor um, made, uh, chair, chairwoman made, uh, or if you had agricultural workers, uh, grocery workers, then is it to the employer or is it to the employee? We don't have access to, I mean, if you have a sector, it's one thing, but then do you use a nonprofit as the partner to try to flow that to the, you know, and, and again, ultimately, I guess the audit trail still f falls back to the county to have to try to, you know, provide all the assurances that are necessary to, you know, make sure the funds were expended as, as, as prescribed, but what are they doing in other parts of the country? I mean, you know, obviously you're a nation, national firm, so how are they looking, if they're looking to those sectors to actually provide relief? So most places across the country right now are kind of in this same stage, figuring out where they need to spend, because these are, you know, the recovery funds, they do have longer to spend them. So most places across the country right now are figuring out where it's really needed, and then they'll go into the mechanics of how to then execute on all of those as they get into kind of scoping their individual projects, as well as, you know, once Treasury, you know, issues more of the specific guidance and rules as to what is allowable and what isn't and what needs to be done. And when you said the $13 an hour, so that's the, the maximum level of compensation they could receive before they got some of these monies, or that's, that would be the total. If they're getting paid $10 an hour and you supplemented it, by so three. if they're getting paid, say, $20 an hour, the max that they could receive would then be 33 an hour, oh, okay. but it added. cannot also then exceed 25 k yeah. and it cannot exceed yeah. the 150%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got that, okay. okay. Lots of levels yeah. of rules. And I think a big part uh, of the problem that I'm hearing in my district is that the businesses cannot get people to come back to work because they make more money doing nothing and they spend less doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And how you, how you, how do you climb out of yeah. that? The chicken you, or mean, the egg type. Of that's topic. more than thirteen dollars an hour, I think. I mean, in some cases, so it's it's a difficult, it's a challenge for the business owners. Yeah. That's why I think the economic um, recovery or economic response is really important because they're the ones that got hurt the most. Um, well, I wouldn't say the most. And you're I better not say the most because everybody, it was a struggle for everyone, but yeah. they, they didn't get a lot of the resources that some of the other areas did. Supervisor Desmond. Thank you. And, and I think, you know, this, this area, it would certainly benefit employers because people would have to be working to be eligible to get this additional benefit. So um, my, my question is kind of alluding to what Supervisor Natoli mentioned is, the coordination among uh, municipalities because uh, I mean when it comes to essential workers how do you handle someone who maybe lives in the unincorporated county works in the city or vice versa and then you know if it's what what are the cities doing are, are they paying or are they saying hey Sacramento County is going to help all our essential workers so we don't need to spend money on that you know we can spend it on all these other things for people who live in the city have you been seeing any of those conversations taking place in the, in, in in California for instance 
I've started to see a couple of those happening in Southern California personally. Um, but you know, one of the things that we are intending to do as part of the overall plan is some of that coordination regionally um, because it needs to happen. You know, we don't just live our life in a you know I'm not entering city because I'm focusing on right. county. It's it all blends together. Okay, thank you. Please proceed. Um, and just to touch on that point about workers returning to work. Um, under the economic response area, one of the eligible expense areas is um, worker sh the worker shortage. And some of the kinds of eligible expenses under here would be back to work incentives, job training, um, child care assistance, assistance with transportation to and from a job site, to and from interviews. Um, and that back to work incentive can include, can include some sort of financial um, incentive. So a couple of different levers that could be looked at there. Okay, stepping forward to infrastructure, and as we noted previously, infrastructure um, in this framing is focused on water and sewage. Um, we did receive a number of inquiries around parks, recognizing that the pandemic has um, put additional extra wear and tear on, on parks as people move to use outdoor spaces. So I just wanna highlight here, um, Treasury does recognize that parks have had increased usage, they recognize that parks may be used disproportionately by disadvantaged communities and that they're also part of um, a healthy living environment, which are all very much in line with the objectives of ARPA. So eligible expenses here would include investments in parks, public plazas, other public outdoor spaces that can be responsive to the needs of, of disproportionately impacted communities. Um, there's, there's a number of different ways that that could be used, park upgrading, park maintenance, park rehabilitation, et cetera. The roads, how about? R roads get into a little bit of a, a crafty area. Um, you know, I wish I could fix all the potholes in our general area, that would be amazing. You must live in Sacramento County. <laughs> <laughs> um, if not, you travel here. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I've driven on Grant Line plenty of times. So, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, so roads are, if it's something that is around fixing a road because you need to fix a watershed, you need to have you know better sewage, better you know drinkable water. So it's all about how it is specifically scoped or something that is done, and the road is part of what needs to make that happen. But just going and, and fixing you know J Street because you know it keeps causing some flats is probably not something that's going to be eligible. So were our w water districts included in the yes this vocally questionnaire? <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet. Oh, good. I'm glad. And rightfully, Super yes. Supervisor Desmond has a question. Thank you about the roads. Just to follow up on that. So, for instance, maybe we couldn't get a, a general allocation to improve roadways throughout the county, but if it's maybe improving a portion of roadways that would. Um, uh, incentivize investment in some disadvantaged communities is that something that could possibly be included it would have to be looked at in detail in project scoping I would say um, and then I would also say that you know that could all change because we've got this infrastructure bill kind of looming and what exactly is going to be in there and all of that stuff as well right. so it's a big it depends great okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> so when you say water infrastructure like we have a road in well, Scott Road that floods every year. <laughs> yes, Can do. we use that to fix that water problem? Um, I would need to look at all the rules, but if you know that flooding that impacted drinking water and all of those types of things, it could probably then be you know done okay. accordingly. But it all, you know, roads get tricky. Okay. I want to just ask a question, and I intended to actually bring it up during supervisor comments later today, but I'll ask it more generally, and then I'll get to the specifics when I'm like off this topic. But when it comes to rural areas where you're dependent upon not necessarily a municipal water system, but private wells, um, you know, that may serve one house or two, and, you know, individual septic systems that, you know, um, uh, folks are responsible for, but when failures occur, again, just the general economics anymore, we're finding heavy requirements on folks. Do those fit in any particular category? I mean, I, you sort of can make the health argument from the standpoint of potable water, availability of water, so I'm just curious as to, is there anything that's been called out for in your 
kind of parsing down through this that would, you know, because, you know, rural Sacramento County is, you know, is, um, you know, there are rural, far more rural frontier communities throughout the, you know, the country and nation. I'm just, I'm curious. Um, is there yes. anything in ARPA that would lend so you to? Water enhancement, upgrading, and water infrastructure projects are one of the most broadly defined areas in ARPA. And explicitly in the guidance, it, it notes that it can be at the level of a household. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think, a, a little bit wider, la wider latitude for interpretation yeah. under this issue. For area. water and sewer. Oh, well, okay, that's, that's good to know. I'll, I'll, I'll hold my comments till I'm supervisor comments this afternoon. <laughs> that, that helps, thank you. Very good. So we're getting to our two final issue areas. Um, the next one is education. Education, so we recognize here that red, education is led really by the state and by school districts, and there's been a strong focus on funding at these levels to address the issues that have been raised by the pandemic. And likely because of that, the, both the community and the department surveys um, ref reflected a, a lower level of response in this issue area as compared to those previously discussed. There are some topics that did come up and that ARPA does associate under the umbrella of education, particularly around childcare and access to childcare, um, which could be an eligible expense under ARPA. And then finally, we have broadband, which we've touched on a little bit before. Broadband is also an area that's very generally um, eligible under ARPA, there are some requirements for any any projects that are done to have ensure a minimum level of upload and download speed so that it is truly broadband. Um, and these projects also should be targeting underserved or unserved communities in this area. Um, this funding can also be used in a couple of related ways, such as digital literacy training or promoting access to the internet, which would also be other ways to, to truly connect the population that remains either underserved or, uns or unserved. Do libraries bring that point up? I bet they did. I bet that that would be an important category for the libraries. So I'll turn it back over to Emily just to um, wrap us up on next steps. Excuse me. When she's done. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. In the subsequent weeks, Deloitte will draft recommended allocations at a program level for discussion with county leadership. The programs will mirror the issues we are seeking alignment on today. We will be providing we will be providing recommended allocation amounts based on the discussion today, the input from the community in terms of the issues that were most significant, and additional factors, such as other funding that is available to address those issues. Those recommended allocation amounts will be provided to county leadership. County leadership will then work together to finalize the recommended program allocate, allocation for presentation and approval to the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> Once program allocation has been approved, project scoping will begin. Project scoping should not happen until priorities are finalized and allocation amounts are determined. The manage and track guidance is currently in process, so step seven um, on the slide. We will be providing a recommended high-level process and templates for Sacramento County to leverage to create a centralized management oversight function over the funds provided through ARPA, to track against the compliance requirements, and to be prepared to report out on the use and outcomes of the funds to the federal government. With that, I will turn it over to Anne. Well, now it's actually time for you all to talk about uh, what you think are your <laughs> highest priorities. And maybe we can go back to the priority slide so that you can see the items and we can, you can have a discussion about um, what you think are the highest priorities. Okay, well, Supervisor Cerna is the first one in the queue. Great, thank you, Chair. <laughs> and thank you to the uh, Deloitte team for um, for the uh, obvious work that, that and thoughtfulness that you put into uh, the survey instrument and uh, for joining us here in chambers today to report out uh, what your uh, findings are. I think this is um, helpful 
I think it's, uh, um, I think it validates and confirms uh, what uh, we, we kind of know uh, in the first place, but I, I think what it does is it, it does for the, the public put some, um, uh, some horsepower behind um, understanding uh, maybe at a, at a greater level of detail some of the, the needs that have been expressed through the survey. Um, I think based on the questions that uh, you heard from uh, all of us during the course of your presentation, um, I think uh, undoubtedly there's, you know, there's, there's some shortcomings to it, but there, I've yet to see a perfect poll, a perfect survey that, you know, guarantees us uh, that we, you know, have exactly uh, the kind of thumb on the heartbeat of uh, the community that, we, that uh, we would ultimately like to have when we make decisions, but uh, we always try and get as close to that as, as possible, and this is was helpful in that vein. Um, so um, I wouldn't expect the Deloitte team uh, to, to, to know this, uh, or necessarily um, uh, Supervisor Desmond, who was the only one of us that was not here uh, last year when the first of, I guess, the first of the three um, levels of federal assistance that, that are COVID-related uh, became available. Uh, it was known as the CARES Act, which I'm sure everyone's now familiar with. And as chair of the, the Board of Supervisors last year, having the, the, the joy of being the chair during, uh, during COVID, um, I think one of the lessons certainly that um, that I took away from uh, that, that experience, and, and, and believe me, it was not a uh, pleasant one for most of it because, um, quite frankly, I think we uh, trusted um, our then administration to, um, uh, to function somewhat unilaterally. Um, uh, and it had to do, uh, in large part, I think, because of the timing. Um, you know, we didn't have the uh, the convenience of looking out uh, uh, three and a half years, we had to um, gauge what uh, we were going to prioritize uh, and ultimately appropriate from the CARES uh, Act funding uh, within months time, not years time. Um, and so perhaps shame on me, shame on us for, for trusting um, in that process. Looking back, I think we probably would have done it differently. I think we probably would have taken a little bit more time uh, to do maybe not a full-blown community survey, but I think we would have done something more than just let the uh, then CEO come and report back uh, what uh, he thought was uh, was was priority. Um, so with the sting of that still smarting for me, um, and knowing um, what I do now, uh, having been on the board for the last 11 years, and certainly Mr. Ntoli can... Um, uh, uh, can share this um, uh, this thought as well, is that, uh, as uh, Ms. Edwards said earlier, um, none of us in this room, besides the five of us, know our districts as well as we do, right? We're elected to represent a constituency um, and to know that constituency as best we can to, to best represent them. Uh, in many instances, uh, we've spent our whole lives in the districts. Um, uh, so we, we, we have a lot of confidence, I think, to a person up here that uh, uh, we know what the homelessness needs are. We know what the housing needs are. Uh, we hear constantly what the, the health needs are, and especially in the time of a pandemic. doesn't mean that we're omniscient. We don't know everything. But um, we hear it hourly. We, we get it in the form of emails and calls at night and calls on the weekend and, um, you know, and, and folks that uh, want to come and, uh, wag their finger at us, which that's part of the job. We, we welcome that. That's, that's part of the process. Uh, but, but given the fact that we know our districts the way we do, and given the experience of last year, I thought it prudent uh, to have a conversation with, uh, with our uh, interim CEO before we left for break um, a few weeks past. And um, I invited uh, Supervisor Desmond to, to uh, participate in that meeting. So it was the three of us. And what I'd suggested uh, in that meeting is what I'd like to suggest now. And I think it's the appropriate time to do so, given the fact that, um, you know, we're the next steps, as was pointed out in that last slide, is going to be to begin to move into kind of an appropriations um, uh, uh, part, of the, uh, part of this process. 
um, and hear you know what the recommendation formal recommendations are from our CEO and her executive team with the help of what's been provided obviously by Deloitte but the suggestion is this and it's pretty it's pretty simple is that I I feel strongly that um, there should be a portion of uh, the ARPA funding that is expressly dedicated uh, to be uh, decided upon and determined, uh, the determined use of should come from each of the districts. So in other words, what I've suggested is one sixth of the total amount be appropriated to uh, the board itself, each of the five districts equally. So that would be 10 million each of the 300 million. And um, it doesn't mean that you would leave to Phil Cerna, depending on what you know, side of the bed he woke up on and what he feels like doing that day, that he, you know, he wants to send millions to some particular CBO or wants to provide one department you know, millions to, to do what his quote unquote pet project might be. No, that's not what it means. It means that there would be uh, a certain portion of the, the proceeds that uh, we, through a system that we can all agree upon, and with certainly the continued um, recommendations coming from our executive team, that we could uh, channel uh, as we see necessary to continue responding uh, to the pandemic, again with the guideposts of the Treasury guidance, now with this tool, um, understanding some of the priorities that have been uh, detailed through the community survey, and certainly, uh, what we do day in and day out, which is listen to our constituents. And, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, and I, I don't know about other districts, but I've received a number of emails and phone calls, even text messages uh, from people that took the survey that thought it fell flat. And it's not a reflection on the, the good and hard work that Deloitte has done. Um, I think it has to do with the fact that, you know, people bring their own perspectives to um, what they do, what their charge is. If you're, for instance, a, um, uh, a health-focused uh, CBO, nonprofit, um, is, you know, is broadband going to really resonate with you as much as, you know, wanting to dedicate resources towards uh, continuing to vaccinate folks? Uh, just use that as an example. Um, and so uh, what I'm suggesting is that um, we could use what we know about our, the, the needs geographically, based on the demographics of our districts, um, based on the fact that some of us almost entirely represent an unincorporated area and other of us uh, represent almost entirely an, uh, a city uh, district, <laughs> that we could tailor, help tailor that. Uh, that being the, the, the appropriation of resources, federal resources um, for these purposes. It also gives us in my estimation, the opportunity to partner with one another. So for instance, if districts one and two, uh, basically the only two districts up here that represent the city of Sacramento understand there's a common interest uh, that the city of Sacramento has, they've decided to appropriate some of their ARPA funding, we can get together and figure out, hey, perhaps there is something better than the, the sum of the parts here, and we could be even more effective in whatever it is that we might be trying to Address So I think it gives us a lot of opportunity. And I'll, I'll just end with this. The one word that hasn't been mentioned here today is accountability. And again, as chair last year, part of that sting comes from the criticism that because it was left to the CEO's office basically to, uh, to manage much of the CARES Act funding, uh, you had someone in an administrative role that's not directly reportable to the people and the voters. Guess who that is in this room? That's us. So to me, I don't think it's too much to consider, too much to suggest that, um, that 50 million of the 300 million, the 301, uh, be designated uh, equally for the five districts, 10 million each, that would be subject to a thoughtful system of how you would appropriate it, making sure that it respects the Treasury guidance in that we set up a system that, uh, that permits um, our partners, the nonprofit community, other governmental agencies, park districts, uh, library, uh, uh, library authority, um, air quality management district, 
it gives us that flexibility to be, I think, much more responsive uh, to how we continue to use this rare opportunity uh, to work with uh, hundreds of millions uh, to address a historic pandemic. So that, that, that's a suggestion, and I'd be curious to know what the thoughts are of my colleagues to that suggestion. Thank you. Okay, you said 50 million, 10, mil, 10 million each to you each should. district, and while we're thinking about that, we'll, maybe we can move on to the next uh, person on the queue, which is... Madam Chair, could I respond oh. directly to sure. Supervisor Cerny, sure. just because he mentioned, do you mind, Don? Yeah, um, go ahead. No, appreciate that, Phil. And yet, we had a discussion, and I think it even, and I think Phil maybe had alluded to this a little earlier, just the fact that we we don't have a sense geographically where the, the input came from. Um, so you're going to be, I think, relying more on the elected officials to, to um, figure out or understand where those needs are greatest. And, and the survey is only one point in time. If we did a mechanism like this, like Super, Supervisor Cerna is suggesting, we would be involved in continued engagement with our constituents, I think, to have a better understanding of what the needs are um, as we're, as we're uh, rolling out these uh, resources for folks. And I, and I think it's important, obviously, to keep in mind, you know, we, we, have, a, we have a process that, that where we go through this kind of exercise. This would be that same process on steroids and obviously informed by the, the guidance that, uh, that the federal government gives us. And, and also, it, it certainly would not supplant um, any collective decisions this body makes to put a larger portion of those funds maybe towards certain homelessness programs that benefit the entire county. Um, so, I, I mean, I, th I, think, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think it's, it ensures, I think, a kind of a maximum level of responsiveness to the unique needs that uh, our constituents have in our respective districts. So, thank you, uh, Supervisor Serna. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Natoli. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, um, very intrigued by the suggestion Mr. Cernas makes. And I think that, um, you know, listening to certainly his explanation and thinking about some of the funding processes, I think, again, maintaining consistency, I think it's elemental that consistency with obviously not just the guidance, but certainly the accountability that goes behind it. And I think, obviously, keeping faith with the, um, you know, the survey structure and the Good faith responses received from, you know, 1,500 plus respondents. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, certainly appropriate guardrails, but would allow, I think, you know, out of the total amount to look at, you know, things again that fit within the priority structure, but certainly um, may reflect in, in investments that can either be partnered with and or shared. And I think there's, you know, do, there, there can be a process, that's certainly a public one, but obviously it still requires concurrence by. Uh, you know, this board uh, and, uh, you know, certainly good uh, oversight uh, uh, by those who are responsible uh, for, you know, keeping track of the funding. But, I'm, you know, again, it's not out of character of some other funding streams that we uh, make decisions around and certainly I'm, I'm, you know, very open and I think the idea makes, makes good sense. I wanted to um, make a couple comments too that I think might help us again since there's a three-year clock on these dollars again thank you to the delight folks to those that you have stood up there now for well over an hour and uh, <laughs> certainly put you know many many hours of work into this and i know you've got folks in the audience that have been a part of your team um that you know when it comes to some of the investments that we make uh and i i think about the conversation we had just a few weeks ago and and um, the uh, budget approval approval process leading up to the, the final the final budget uh, in a few more weeks, and we talked about investment uh, in, you know, in human services and in priorities. And again, and, and thank you to Ian and the team. Uh, you know, we worked through a lot of different elements, and you know, there was, you know, many hundreds of millions and you know several billions of dollars uh, going, you know, countywide uh, for a whole range of services. But in some category, some some areas, we have. Um, Ex explicitly or expressly either put general funds or realignment. And again, I'm not looking to supplant or necessarily displace, but I think being um, strategic, and again, that's why I maybe looked at the Deloitte team working with obviously Ian and Amanda and others. If there's ways to maximize internally over the course of a three-year period uh, investments in, in recognizing 
dollars that we as a board look at annually uh, that would help us, one, in the competitive process, but even in the process of where the 300 million lies, recognizing that it's, you know, it's not by any means broadly available as say general fund or even realignment in some cases. But I think that could be an exercise that could prove very helpful, and I can think back to Supervisor Cerna's point where um, it's not directive as much as it is, I think kind of key looking at, you know, uh, programmatic areas, service delivery, um, you know, infrastructure investments, certainly our central workers, uh, whether they be, you know, county employees or elsewhere in the, um, you know, in, in the community. Um, and we, you know, got an economic development branch. We have, you know, we received airports through CARES, I mean, through uh, CARES for airport support. I mean, there's a lot of uh, elements where either they may be enterprises, but they may have general fund. And, and I even think about in the homeless programs. Our homeless initiatives have a general fund component, in, or, unless that's been displaced in the most recent one, for years now. We've put millions. Uh, the efforts along the parkway, where, again, we're not going to necessarily supplant or displace. I'm not suggesting that by any means, but. Uh, either supplement or allow us to um, go in in a uh, in a precise fashion, and uh, if nothing else, to maybe where we've got infrastructure improvements contemplated. I used to use parks. Maybe it's a it's a fair example where we might be able to allow us to address some of the staffing needs that may again tie back to working with some of the uh, at risk populations. That you know, I just think there's some layered effect here, and you've kind of touched on it today, and I, that was very helpful, and, and again, I, you know, th this probably could go on ad infinitum, but I just, I think there may be ways to, to maximize this that, you know, don't even occur to me, and I guess I'd like us to take a, take a look at, at those things if we aren't already, and maybe already task folks, and people have already got not just the ideas at the departmental level, but have got ways to, 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 to look at it, you know, translating that in, because to the point that uh, Phil made, uh, you know, last year uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, fairly round criticism and some of it, you know, uh, fairer in, in, in a number of respects about how we swapped out CARES Act in order to, you know, to make available uh, general fund dollars. And there were benefits that accrued to public health, but we got criticized for the way that was handled. I think with the oversight and the, the engagement of this board, certainly your leadership and that of departments, the assistance of Deloitte and certainly the benefit of the community feedback, I think we have a real opportunity here. I mean, Probably never in, in, in anybody's lifetime, uh, and I could be wrong, uh, are we ever going to have, um, you know, the opportunity that comes with, you know, one to 300 million that comes in a, you know, in, in a, you know, a one time, but then what may be additive with the infrastructure bill and also these other related streams. And so, you know, to play catch up, but also then to look at, you know, some of the things that we've been on the cusp of as relates to, you know, trying to, you know, um, change some of the service delivery, recognizing some of the, the areas where we need improvement, where we've, you know, maybe have been in a deficit, and, you know, a lot of conversations we're having around health, mental health, public health, uh, law and justice, uh, you know, a variety of things. Um, I just think this presents a, a tremendous opportunity, and we ought to capture, engage this board, engage community as we have, continue to, to do that, and uh, look at ways Again, the mechanics of how we can, you know, align dollars to, to you know, really maximize the investments. Because it's not just the here and now. I mean, this is for the future. Uh, you know, never, you know, in my years of service with the county, has there ever been an opportunity quite like this? You know, there's been times when there's been reform and you get, you know, a tranche of, you know, millions in welfare reform or in, you know, um, you know realignment or whatever. But to come to the county, even with the, the guardrails it has on it, to have the ability of this board and this community with the leadership that we have, both in the public and private sector, to try to figure out a way to make these dollars work best for this community for the here and now, but for the future. Again, this is a kind of a, a once in a career. I don't know if it's a once in a lifetime, but once in a career, and certainly comes on the heels of a very challenging, difficult time for this nation and for the people of this community and, you know, and, and, and um, all around the world. And so I think, you know, as we look at the, 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 the priorities here, you know, they make sense. You can look at those up there and, and, and uh, uh, you know, add the subcategories and so forth. I'm, you know, I'm fully supportive of using those as the, the backdrop. I like the suggestion that Supervisor Cerna made. And to really look at ways that we can use the dollars that we have here that are available to us through our own funding streams so when you recognize the great effort of workers in this community at all levels, uh, if there's an ability to do that, certainly our, the businesses and the, the people who uh, have provided goods and services, um, you know, throughout the pandemic, but will hopefully be here, you know, for, for years to come. 
a lot of things. And then when you talk about housing and such, there's just, you know, ways to, I think, maximize this, you know, and not to spend it all in one fell swoop, uh, recognizing that, you know, we've got a couple of years here, but to be smart about it and to uh, maximize every penny. And if we do that, um, I think that this community will be well positioned wherever you live uh, and whatever your walk in life, you're going you're gonna to know that there's an opportunity, if not multiple ones, that have been afforded because of our tax dollars coming back to this community uh, via the, you know, the ARPA Act. And so I'm encouraged. I really am. And I think keeping the accountability, keeping this before this board and discussing it, certainly the work that goes on and uh, you know, holding ourselves accountable, but I think reflecting you know, the, uh, the desires to let's get better, to recover, and to uh, to invest and reinvest, and, I, and again, I just uh, I, I couldn't have imagined this a year ago when we were going through some of that. Uh, <laughs> you know, this, this was probably furthest from our thoughts. I mean, we knew the CARES Act money was coming through, and we were in the midst of the pandemic, and we're still struggling with certain aspects of COVID. So, all that being said, I didn't take so much time here, but I, I'm encouraged. Again, I don't take disagreement. You know, obviously, that's those are results as you've called them out. I think giving the board. Uh, the opportunity as representatives and working with <clears throat> very capable uh, staff to look at how we best parse those dollars. But, and again, not to spend it all in one fell swoop, but we need to move, I think, with some, some degree of, of, of swiftness and urgency because we're still trying to recover. So I guess I would stop with that. I don't, Ann, maybe you want to respond to what I said. So. Yes, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, first, I want to be really uh, perfectly clear about the process. We will not make a single spending decision or allocation without bringing it to the board for approval. So in terms of you know, accountability on how those decisions are made, my team and I are perfectly clear that all decisions are to be made uh, by this board. So I just wanted to um, put that out there. Um, also, just a couple of comments about the, the, the 300 million. I think it's really important that we keep in mind that there, is, there are discussions in Congress right now to use some of this money that has been allocated to cities and counties to pull back in order to finance the infrastructure bill. Um, now, no one knows what's going to happen with that. Including the 150 that we have? No. Okay. No. We have that. Uh, it is important that we develop a plan, and that's why uh, Stacy said earlier, I think it was Stacy that said, um, we really need to develop a plan for the full $300 million, but we also need to be very aware of the fact that we might not get the second tranche of money. So we need to keep that in mind as we talk about how much we're going to spend on what. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember if it was Emily or Stacy said, uh, we also need to consider... Um, administration because um, it costs money to do all this work and we do need to set aside some money for administration um, as well and then finally and I'm going to ask Ms. Travis to weigh in on this one you know when it comes to and I'm going to share with all of you what I shared with Supervisor Desmond and Cerna when um, they raised this to me about each board member having an allocation just to be clear we have to be really careful that um, we're following all the ARPA guidelines in terms of what's allowable to be funded. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there's some requirement, and maybe Deloitte staff and maybe Ms. Travis can say whether or not we're required to do a competitive bid process. And so we, we talked about the fact that some department would have to do that for you, likely. I don't think you have staff to do that. Uh, so there are a lot of things to consider. Um, and then there's the accountability of where the money goes, because we are ultimately responsible for how that money is spent and for tracking, and there's a lot of uh, pretty rigorous rules around the tracking and accountability. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there uh, for your consideration. But most importantly, I want to say that uh, no decisions will be made uh, without coming to the board. And to Supervisor Natoli's comment, we are always thinking of ways to use other funding to fund things that we're doing so that we can maximize all revenue streams and we will continue to do that i would just you know um, say that maybe we got to get that invoice off to the federal government for the other 150 million tell them where we get it <laughs> we're, wait, we're waiting for that let's, let's, <laughs> let's, get, let's submit the bill right now so exactly. um, but if I just could, and maybe Lisa wants to weigh in, but, you know, the way I understood certainly what, you know, the, uh, 
what uh, Supervisor Cerner put out was is that we would adhere to all the county processes. I mean, again, you know, we're not the ones that issued the contracts. We, we don't have an appropriate role in that respect. And federal anyway, guidance, guidance, I mean. Yeah, and, 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 and working with our respective departments within the priority framework and so that meets, again, that only makes sense uh, in, 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 in my view that, you know, this is to create some other, you know, kind of set aside, but I think some, you know, the ability to work with that and know that's an amount uh, you know, did you look to infrastructure, to housing, to homeless issues, health, uh, and there'll be carve outs already for some of those anyway in the more general, part. I would, I mean, significant carve outs if there's $300 million, which that's what we're working with here today, so. Okay, that's all I had, thanks, Madam Chair. Okay, we do have some uh, people on the line for public, and in the chambers for public comment on this other, item. Yeah, the other members of the board. I know, I know, I'm just r okay. reminding oh. everyone that we still have public comment waiting. Supervisor Desmond. So in other words, keep it short. Keep it no, short. I, no, I'm not <laughs> saying that at all. I just, I guess well, I'm reminding the people that have been so. sitting here for two hours you that said, we know they're there. <laughs> we know you're there. We're, we're working toward you as quickly as we can. So I guess, take your time. I guess th this question is for um, um, our interim county exec. I mean, exactly what do you want to hear from us right now? From uh, do you want to hear our thoughts and ideas and priorities? On the priorities, C keeping in everything, mind these, okay. yes. What, what, do, do you think those are good yes. priorities? Do you want to move them around? What, okay, great. Yes. I mean, I, 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 I do. I, I, I have a couple questions about some of these priorities. I mean, for instance, when you talk about, uh, and, and, and again, there's a, I know there's a lot of overlap um, in terms of economic response and, and health, and I'm thinking, Okay, an economic response, maybe, you know, more job training programs, um, things like that would be, I would imagine, might be eligible under different categories. Funding for youth programs and maybe disadvantaged communities would be, would, would be eligible for, for um, funding. For, for me, I, I, I absolutely agree with those categories. Um, when it comes to, to homelessness, I mean, I think we need to make a very big and bold investment on, on homelessness programs, and some of those programs would be countywide to assist in the cities uh, with from a behavioral health and social services support for some of our <laughs> own programs including supporting our own programs in the unincorporated areas um, uh, everything from uh, uh, emergency shelters and, and navigation centers to transitional housing permanent supportive housing i mean i, mean, I, I really want to see some bold um, ideas for this problem that is obviously the, the I think the biggest crisis affecting Sacramento County and many counties in, in California and I think you know along with it in terms of economic investments I, I would like to see is obviously especially in the unincorporated area where we're dealing with the municipal services but um, I'd like to see a, 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 an evaluation of could we could we go in and to incentivize maybe investment and development in some of these neighborhoods? Could we? I know I know roads gets tricky, but could we invest in upgrading upgrades to the water infrastructure or the, the stormwater uh, drainage infrastructure, sidewalks and lighting in some of these areas? And and do two things: one, improve the communities, but also offset some of the fees that potential you know affordable housing developers would need to would need to pay. Um, and, and I would that investment in those communities not only to incentivize housing but to add more uh, programming and more resources to folks in terms of you know job training programs and youth programs and things like that that we've been talking about. Um, obviously, the help with the with the special districts. Um, you know, my district. I think I have nine park districts in my supervisory district. Most, uh, several of which are are dependent districts, and some are independent as well. So, we'd really like to see a plan for how we're going to support those park districts. And I, and I would imagine this would be a, a grant process thing. Those park districts would have to apply for funding based on certain criteria, of course. Um, and the other special districts, you know, I have four water districts in my district and same kind of process. They, they need to upgrade some of their infrastructure, particularly in some of these disadvantaged communities. So I, I would imagine that would, um, um, that would certainly, you know, qualify under, under the, the act. Um, so those are, you know, those are, some of my ideas, and, and again, of course, I want to I uh, again underscore the idea that Supervisor Cerna brought up, which I which I support, and, and I think we have we already have a, a process in place with the, we have a TOT 
grant program. There's a competitive portion, then there's a discretionary portion, but it, it has a process. Obviously, it would need, getting back to your decision we need to make about administrative costs, it would take some funding to handle the administration of those kinds of programs, but I think we have something in place that we could really mirror. Um, so those are some of my thoughts for what that's worth. That's very helpful. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. Um, regarding the um, the proposal to separate some money out district to district, I, I find merit in having that discussion. I am, as someone who's somewhat process oriented, I it, it concerns me a little bit how that would work. I mean, we we allocate five hundred thousand dollars every year, and it's like giving birth. Um, so I can't imagine what this would be like. Um, but but I, I certainly think it's worthy of the discussion. Uh, for the housing um, and homeless, I mean, I first of all start out by saying, yes, I, I do think that you did a very good job. I mean, your priorities are very aligned with my priorities. Um, for housing, a couple of things I want to look at focusing in on is two is one is an opportunity to utilize resources to jumpstart some supportive housing that we've been talking about for many years here. Um, a few pro projects of which uh, are in the pipeline, but probably need a little help to get over the line to, to be viable. And Stacy, I think I already sent a couple of people over to you um, to have that discussion. Uh, on uh, the other thing about housing too is that's that's for potential new construction, uh, which will uh, not necessarily uh, tie us into because this is one-time money, won't tie us into money down the road, but it will get those projects finally done and come to fruition. It could, potentially. The other one is, though, is I'm concerned about the rental assistance issues um, you know, when it comes to housing. Uh, I was talking with a bankruptcy lawyer the other day who's just waiting for the flood to come in. Um, you know, the, the, the rental assistance was not a gift. It was not a... Uh, and ex you're not excused, it was a deferral. Eventually those bills are gonna co come home to roost and these folks are gonna be in a world of hurt, a lot of them. Um, so that's something I wanna look at. Now when you get into, and as Supervisor Desmond said, he's absolutely right, you know, I, I understand and you did a good job of explaining why it is that these are separate categories, though they have so much overlap because of the different rules and so forth. And, and I, I appreciate the work that you did to, to delineate that. Um, for the economic response and the essential workers, which obviously would have a lot of overlap, um, I, I really also want to see uh, that essential workers who have not had a tremendous voice in this throughout the begin from the beginning of COVID-19 and I'll speak specifically to my own experience in South Sacramento, uh, where you have uh, zip codes which have been very, very stubborn to get uh, vaccinated and to get healthy um, for a variety of reasons. But those same zip codes are zip codes where with perhaps, you know, many of which have a very high Latino population uh, who did not have the opportunity to stay home and were essential and put at risk and suffered because of that risk in many cases. So I really want a concerted effort to be placed on when we go forward, this may be outside of Deloitte's scope, but more direction to Ian and your staff is to make sure that we're looking at those zip codes that were the hardest hit and we're doing adequate outreach because I don't just want those who are the loudest to be a part of this process. I want those who are those that have the greatest need. And that doesn't always happen in processes like this. So uh, that would be uh, some of the things that, that I would be looking for at this point. But as I said, I mean, I'm, and I'm not gonna get into the weeds of homelessness. We have a fantastic staff that will do that. Um, obviously it's a huge priority for this community and every community but uh, overall uh, i do uh, agree with this framework and i appreciate the work just a, a quick response um you mentioned the the process and i'm a process nut myself as well so i do appreciate that um but to um talk a little bit about the process in regards to supervisor cerna's um kind of suggestion and idea um, it would need to be something that is managed, like you said, very 
-hmm. very carefully. There are so many rules around federal grant um, application that it would need to be something that the uh, specific use of those funds you know, is coordinated throughout kind of the county departments and all of those operations to make sure that there's not an inadvertent duplication of benefits or inadvertent, you know, ineligible cost and all of that. So while it is one of the things where it, it's a bit in the gray area of could it be done that way? Yes, but there's also going to be a, it does increase the risk a bit as well. But there's ways to manage that risk in a very, very tight process to make sure that the specific need that it identified for the use of those funds runs through the appropriate kind of grant process, county processes to monitor duplication of benefits, program integrity, um, eligible you know expenses, the you know all of those different rules to make sure that they're all eligible, and then the actual accountability side of things as well to make sure the tracking and reporting of not just the use of those funds but also the outcome of those funds as well. And I completely agree. So I mean, it falls under the category of the devils of the details. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. And so I, I just want to say that um, I really appreciate your presentation and all the work that you've you've done on this. Uh, I am I, I I'm uh, I'm happy with the priorities. I do want to say that I feel like homelessness, I, I get that homelessness and housing are <coughs> interconnected, um, but I do feel that uh, a big big problem, uh, ongoing problem, and it, it's gotten even worse with COVID, is the um, mental health and drug addiction, uh, the homeless situation. And so for me, that's a priority. Uh, I'm also aware that there are a lot, the business community has been devastated by, you know, uh, essentially before COVID, we knew that any business that did not, you know, even if they had a plan B, if there was ex an extraordinary event, they would have about one week before their doors would be closed because they didn't have a way to come back from that. And they've gone for a year and a half now. So they found different ways to do business. They've been creative and innovative, and that's really great. But I think if there's a way that we can help them climb out of debt, many of them have incurred debt on their homes and businesses, and now they can't get their employees to come back to work, and they're having trouble opening up on that yeah. side of it. So, and the question of, you know, I, I think it's really great you know, these ideas about, um, what is that, matching funds, uh, the um, giving, you know, uh, providing uh, added funds, what is the? Oh, the additional funding streams. Uh, yeah, the additional available. funding yeah. streams, that only goes so far. And then they are, you know, they're happy with that, but it, they can't continue it. They may not be able to continue it. And so, I, I think those the idea of grants and um, added resources for the small businesses uh, who were damaged in COVID is important. I just want to underscore that, you know, when I saw this 300 million, I saw an opportunity for Sacramento County to um, maybe catch up on some lost time with reserves and maybe um, shore up our, our sustainability in a time when, you know, uh, we have, um, we don't have a lot of reserves and we don't know what's coming and um, we do have the Mays consent decree. We, we have uh, a new, you know, or, organics facility that we have to figure out how we're going to, you know, move into the next phase of recycling on solid waste. We have water, we, we're raising water fees and solid waste fees and dealing with, um, you know, added um, people just throwing stuff on the road because they don't want to pay to dump their garbage. Um, we're, we have a situation on the roads where we have, um, I guess, you know, when I was elected in 2016, it was 450 million in deferred maintenance in Sacramento ro unincorporated roads. Now it's over 795 million. It's probably way more than that because that was last year. And so 
you know, our, our, um, you know, our roads as they deteriorate become exponentially more expensive to fix. And so while we're not fixing them, we're losing more money. I also think um, it's really important that we made a commitment on the May's consent decree that is um, something that we should respect and do our best to deliver on. And this could be a, a huge opportunity for us to uh, deliver on that commitment um, and catch up for lost time on that. And I, um, I'm, uh, I believe, you know, I, I'm happy to have that conversation that Supervisor Cerna wants to have. Um, I'm not against it. I do think um, when you start dividing the money up between poli the politicians, it might um, impact e e efficiencies and it might, um, and I would want to understand, because a lot of the cities ha are getting funding and are, we're getting funding for the unincorporated and the cities are getting their funding. And I get, you know, that we all have a different amount of the unincorporated, but I, wanna, I want us to remember the unincorporated is getting an allocation. And I know there's overlap, so I get that. So I'm happy to have that conversation. I'm just saying I want to know if we can even do that. I don't know if that's even possible and what that would how, what that would look like, you know, uh, could we do that and do that efficiently? Um, and I also now just want to focus on two other, two last things, and that would be that um, we have, you know, new construction in our county that wants to happen, um, but for the fact that we cannot uh, f pencil out those finance plans, the road infrastructure, the water plan, we can't, um, they, they can't afford what we need them to do up front in order to make that work, and so they would, and even if they could, they'd have to build six or seven hundred thousand dollar homes in a current market that really calls for a three hundred seventy five thousand dollar home. So we have a we have a stalemate there, and we could use more, you know, more funding for affordable, um, you know, the, the when we lost, um, you know, w w affordable housing, you know, has to be subsidized in order to, for it to happen. So I get that. So I just wanted to, um, I guess, point out your comment regarding the infrastructure on the roads has to be, you know, include water, or fixing something, or or that, and I don't know if there's some opportunities there. Um, what my priorities are, um, I guess if I was gonna say in order my priorities, it would be, you know, the business, you know, I think we don't know what's, we don't really know how, how this is gonna play out, if we're gonna have a, you know, truly have a foreclosure market, if that could ultimately catch up with us on our most stable form of income, which is taxes, property taxes. Uh, we don't know how that could happen, so re reserves is important. Uh, the people who are actually, you know, the services that we deliver as a county is delivered by people. And so I think it was Supervisor Natoli that made a comment about, you know, shoring up some of those um, programs, the programs that we're delivering are the payroll. Um, and and um, I know there were people that didn't understand that um, before, but there might be some opportunities for some sustainability there. I think the businesses are, and um, you know, the premium pay is what I was trying to get the word to. I wrote the note, but I just <laughs> forgot to look at it. But um, I, I want to support them uh, as well as mental health and drug rehab and the parks um, took a hit, and we have issues with our with our park system, American River Park system. That it's not on my, it's not really backed up to my district. But I see the importance of it, and I understand it, and I support uh, those that do uh, live with it more closely every day. I support their effort in that, and so uh, those are, you know. You know, I, I would probably put homelessness first, but I get your comment about how those are intertwined. So uh, those are my comments. I hope what I said made sense to, uh, to what you're looking for. Yes. Could I just make one comment? I wanna be clear that um, what is a very hard, not allowable 
under the ARPA funds are a couple of things. One of them is putting money into reserves. Oh. Correct me if I'm wrong. Another one is okay. paying debt. And another is paying for pension costs. Did I get those right? Okay. Good job, Ian. So those are things we <laughs> absolutely cannot use ARPA money for. Yeah, but we could use that money in areas that could free up general funds. Yes. And I think that's what we were, the conversation, we were the opportunity we were Correct. thinking would I maximizing to, our dollars is kind of what I was referring to. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to be clear that we can't yeah. use the ARPA money for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, at this time, Supervisor Cerna has a comment. Yep, thank you, Chair. And I wasn't expecting to comment again, but because I know we have some very patient people that have been waiting to testify. But um, since uh, a couple of my colleagues uh, have expressed some skepticism about what I've proposed, um, and and Deloitte has underscored the fact that it has to be a tight process, I guess I just need to underscore it again because. I thought I made myself clear in my original testimony that I, I get that. I understand there are very strict, there's very strict guidance here. All I'm suggesting is that there's going to be a certain portion of the funds that it's going to have, a, it's going to have much more discretion coming from the, each of the five of us because we know, you know, where those needs are. As Supervisor Kennedy mentioned, sometimes those needs just don't show up in a survey, okay? Mm -hmm. We know it better than anyone. And so to me, to pass up, to forego the opportunity to have just a fraction of what we're talking about here apply to that particular process, I think is, sets us up quite frankly to get, go to battle, which I don't <laughs> want to do later when someone, you know, Ann and her staff are making a proposal, Deloitte's back up here if they're retained to help us, saying, well, you ought to spend it on this. And I said, well, no, I've been beating the drum on this homeless program, which I know is fundable through this funding source, and you keep coming back with something that runs contrary to what I'm telling you, I know we need in the community, the district I represent, the place I grew up. That's all I'm saying. I get how strict that is, okay? So here's what I would like to, to suggest. Since I clearly heard three of us generally agree with the concept of doing this, uh, I know it's not agendized, and I get that, but Again, the next step, uh, my understanding, the next step is getting closer to the discussion about appropriations. I would like the CEO to come back, working with uh, Ms. Travis and her executive team, come back with what they think a manageable process would be that is complementary to the general process of appropriations that, that would incorporate the concept that I've, I've tried to articulate here today. Yeah, I think that I appreciate that. And when you come back, I'd like to know what we, you know, what we, if there's something that we left behind. I mean, I want the to see the analysis of it. You know, what because what we were looking at as a whole versus looking at it this way, is there something that gets left behind, or that we're, you know, are we going to have to make choices? Because I was hearing in in meetings of the past that we had, you know. Uh, we would have to make it, we would have to take it from somewhere. You know, are we taking it from somewhere? And if not, that's great. I just am curious to know that. So I think we can do that. I would like to do it very quickly because we cannot start making funding allocations unless we know whether or not we're going to set this money aside by district. Um, and my staff are probably groaning watching. I don't know how quickly we can do this, but I'd like to come back fairly quickly because we really want to start making some funding allocation decisions, um, knowing that the first round is $150 million that we can actually spend. Mm -hmm. We want to do a plan for more than that, but we could only spend 150, which then this would take it down to 100, if in fact that's what um, the board decided to do. What I would what I would assume is you take 25, so you keep it. Oh, you, OK, you, perfect. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Half and half. For at 25 now. 25 and, now, and 25 we if other, we get the next exactly. tranche. Okay. okay, thank you. But I'll include as as part of the overall 300 spend plan Correct. for the county. Yes. Okay, and uh, Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, I was just going to, I think you touched on it. I was just going to say that that's expectation. The next move was this kind of draft allocation plan, and you, and you captured it that if we only have 150, then you would do 25. And again, fitting with what's up there. You know, that, that, that's, that's the thing. So it's not like we're deviating. In fact, 
we may find that something that was already, to Mr. Cerna's point, you know, already being contemplated fits very well. And so, you know, but I just, I, I think it's doable and I don't think it has to hinder us in any way. And uh, I think certainly with Ann and Lisa and Deloitte folks working together, we can have something that would, uh, we can find comfort in, with and have the accountability that's desired here. So, thanks. Thank and I know, I know we still have public comment, but and I think I saw five head nods generally with this prioritization. Am I correct? Yeah, I'm okay with having that conversation. Oh, with the with the prioritization. Yeah, but I'm dreaming. Yeah, I'm, I'm dreaming. You'll keep all my priorities in mind. Oh, understood. And we've we'll be, we've been documenting those so that we know what is of interest to all of you. But in terms of the large issue areas, this is consistent with what you're okay with is that in that order not necessarily. I, I think the majority liked that order i mean i i think pretty much the university you're working with i mean okay know, i just uh, want to make sure because I mean, that I was our the housing, biggest uh, housing and homelessness thing is is it's connected yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure because that was our, our biggest ask of today. Thank you. And can I just add one thing? I, I forgot to add from mine. We talked about the economic response, and, and certainly I, I'd like to see when you come back some ideas to help small businesses mm -hmm. in the communities yes. too because that's Absolutely. something specifically we didn't mention. I don't know what that might look like. Maybe it's giving businesses a break on licensing or, or something somehow or um, giving them some kind of assistance, but I'd like to see that as well. Is Maybe. that captured in the economic response? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Or grants or what? Yeah. yeah. Different ideas. Okay. That's a good, good idea. Okay. Uh, we do have some public comment on this item, and we have um, Hiro Okoro, I hope I said that correctly, is in our chambers, and then we have, I believe, three people on the phone. Okay. Hello. Hi. You uh, have two minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Good evening, uh, Chair and Supervisors. My name is Adriel Okoro. I am the Policy Director for the Sacramento Housing Alliance. I met many of you via Zoom, so it's nice to see you in living color. Um, the American Rescue Plan Community Needs Survey showed that the top two priorities are housing and homelessness. <coughs> and given the critical affordable housing needs exacerbated by the pandemic, the county must make significant investments building new affordable housing, especially permanent supportive housing, in addition to continued investments in rental assistance to prevent homelessness. Additionally, the funding should be prioritized to support programs and strategies described in the housing element scheduled for adoption today that support individuals and families that are housing insecure or unhoused to obtain safe, accessible, and affordable housing. Deloitte has been tasked with creating an inventory of funding sources, identifying needs, and aggregating project requests from county staff and community stakeholders to ensure alignment with funding restrictions, and then strategizing and planning a recovery vision that targets available funding to meet these uh, priority needs. There should be further required a consultation with critical housing stakeholders, um, some of which uh, Supervisor Kennedy had mentioned, um, to really make sure that we have an effective and transparent process for the allocation of these needs. Um, there are too many people in our region who don't have a, an affordable place to call home. The board should affirm the prioritization order of these issue areas, prioritizing the American Rescue Plan dollars um, and other resources to affordable housing and homelessness resources, setting up a specific expenditure plan with evaluation criteria to ensure that these public funds are spent where they're needed most and have the greatest positive impact on people's lives. When individuals and families have a safe place to call home, there are co-benefits of improved health outcomes, education outcomes, many of those other outcomes that were listed um, in the issue areas. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you for your patience in waiting so long. Okay, we have five callers on the phone. Please transfer the first caller. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, could you mute the meeting in the background while you're talking? I just did. Okay, thank you. All right, you can go ahead and start. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, I reside in District 2. I'm a volunteer with Sacramento Act. Um, I'd like to invite you all to imagine that you see a fire breaking out on the days right now. That would be an emergency, yes? We would not be able to continue this meeting. We would not be able to continue business as usual. Everything would stop. And we would all, our priorities would change dramatically. So we're in the midst of a fire right now. Um, it's called the climate crisis. And I appreciate that the board on, on December 17th, 2020, adopted a declaration of climate emergency. So thank you for that. Um, I haven't heard any mention um, of that in, as far as informing the prioritization and of spending of, of these funds. Um, also, what I haven't heard much of is reimagining public safety, which there's great discussion of in the community. And by the way, community survey, I wish you all had given some more time for that to um, be administered because I did not get a chance to put my input. Um, but for priorities from the, my community members, um, we would like to see more emphasis on, on transformational justice, environmental justice, um, because addressing the climate crisis in the most efficient way would be via an equity lens, looking at systemic racism. Now, I've talked with some of you um, in phone calls about learning more about um, systemic racism, and I really you applaud have you. You seconds. Um, thank you. I will fo be following up with, um, with you on that, and I invite you to look at the intersections of systemic racism um, with the climate crisis. That was bad before, and the pandemic has exacerbated everything. Can you please um, wrap up your comments? Um, Deloitte has done a lot of research on climate, um, the climate crisis. I wish you would all address that. The house is on fire. Please help. Thank you. Thank you. We send the next caller. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good afternoon. This is Brenda Ruiz from the Sacramento Food Policy Council. Um, what a great discussion. What a wonderful opportunity to um, be able to spend um, $300 million on the needs of Sacramentans. Um, uh, the design of the scope of inquiry was flawed and I, we believe in not having identified zip codes and demographics. We encourage uh, staff and the board to be accountable to um, the needs to support equity and justice in communities, especially uh, in service of those most impacted by um, historical disinvestment and in under-resourced areas, um, and especially to mitigate environmental justice. Um, uh, problems. Um, specifically, the Sacramento Food Policy Council is requesting 1% of the funding to go to resilient and equitable food systems. So implement environmental justice policies EJ12, 13, 14, 15. These policies were enacted um, as part of the environmental justice element. Again, the community came around to support environmental justice policies, and now we have an opportunity to fund some of the, the work that the community could really get behind to support uh, the economic development of BIPOC businesses, farmers, infrastructure needs uh, for food businesses, um, food education, food access, food security, and the necessary planning and implementation for the food system assessment and action plan to realize these wonderful ideas. Once again, we request 1% of the funding to be made available for resilient and equitable food systems. Why 1%? Because we know that the 1% uh, dialogue uh, illustrates very clearly that oftentimes dollars are spent in one area um, when really dollars are needed in places that go unseen or unserved. So please uh, allocate 1% to resilient and equitable food systems. And what, Can a, you what a great time. Can you please wrap up your comments, please? 
Sure. What a great time to be in Sacramento and to work in a community and in partnership with the departments and with the supervisors and with staff to realize the vision. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello? Yes, you can start with your comments now. Oh, perfect. Okay. Hello, my name is Kalima Mutaki, and I'm calling as an organizer of the Sacramento Act and a resident of District 1. I want to start off by thanking the supervisors who brought up key concerns with the survey. Many of the congregations that we serve that were located in low-income zip codes reported that congregants had difficulty accessing the survey, be it due to lack of translation languages, adequate internet, and many who did not hear about the survey until last minute. And although I know we're working in a short time frame, I do hope that in the future outreach efforts can include multiple public forums centering communities that we know were drastically impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this disparity highlights the importance of interpreting this information and setting your priorities through a racial equity lens. At Sacramento Act, we've heard through many listening sessions with directly impacted low-income black and brown congregations that specific and community-based solutions need to be funded urgently to support holistic recovery. This definitely, definitely includes that which was highlighted in the survey, such as affordable housing, resources for homelessness, and culturally competent mental health support. And one of the most devastating consequences of COVID-19 that we've seen is increased youth and gun violence as the county reopens, the likes of which we just witnessed at the Cal Expo Summer Carnival. This is largely a result of a lack of support systems for youth during a year-long pandemic and lockdown period. We encourage you to prioritize violence prevention as part of your public health strategy, as, as it has been federally recommended, and invest in community-based organizations like Advanced Peace, Killing the Hood, Vich Advocates, and Impacts, who are currently doing violence intervention work throughout the county and will, and will require further investment to adequately address the issue moving forward. Please know that allocating this funding through a racial equity lens will you save have 15 lives. seconds. Thank you. Particularly those communities that have and continue to suffer great loss at the hands of COVID and its after effects. Your constituents are watching and expecting you to do what is right. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Um, Hello? Hi. Can you mute the meeting in the background while you're talking? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and start with your comments now. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here before the committee here and the Board of Supervisors. My name is Julius Tipito. I'm the Strategy Program Manager for the Advanced Peace Organization of Sacramento here, and we deal strictly with uh, cyclical and retaliatory gun violence. Uh, in addition to everything that has been stated here, I love all the uh, the points that have been making that have been made, uh, touching on homelessness, uh, you know, home home improvement, all those things, uh, affordable housing. Everything that here is 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 is, is totally vital, totally important. I think one of the things that COVID has shown us is how much we need one another, how everything is important. And, and I think when you talk about tourism and everything else that has been mentioned here, it's hard to imagine public safety not being a part of that. Uh, with the uptick in violence that has been uh, made nationwide, uh, I think it's important that we invest in addressing public safety uh, in the reduction of gun violence uh, from the intervention perspective and also from the uh, prevention perspective. It would be great if we could get some programs in school. Sacramento has the highest rate of suspension in the state. Uh, really no alternatives to, of, to violence are being taught to our young people. Uh, no conflict resolution and no anger management, just life skills that they would need in cognitive behavioral therapy that would help address gun violence 
and all forms of, of violence for our young people and for the future of Sacramento to be the kind of place that uh, that represents everything that you guys are talking about, all the things that we're addressing here. It's very important to include public safety, reimagining public safety, and working together. You have 15 uh, seconds. Okay, and I just would want to close with saying that if, if COVID didn't do anything, COVID exposed uh, how much we need one another. And so being someone who's uh, involved in public safety, I would hope that we would be included in moving forward in that and making Sacramento a, a greater place to live. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please transfer the final caller. Hi, caller, you have two minutes. Please start with your comments. Yeah, my name is Lamaya Coleman. I'm in Supervisor Sternis District, and I'm a leader with SAC Act. Um, I only found out about the survey because I'm a leader in SAC Act. Um, I wouldn't have known about it otherwise, and I'm an educated, middle-class, fairly aware citizen. Um, Supervisor Desmond also noted that we don't know where respondents came from geographically, and I don't believe we know the demographic information either. Uh, so we can probably assume that um, most people, but also especially those who are low income, who speak English as a second language or are part of oppressed groups, likely responded to the survey at, at much, much lower rates. Um, therefore, as we prioritize issues, we really need to, to do it through a racial and class equity lens. Um, we need to be fun, uh, funding investments in community-based solutions and organizations. Um, we all know that the pandemic caused mental health stress for almost everyone, but not equally. People in low-income jobs that lost their jobs or essential workers that brought COVID home to their families um, have been much, much more impacted through this. And we, we talked a little bit earlier about people who are going to be looking at as the forbearance ends, really intense situations. Um, so we need to invest in the health, mental health and housing stability especially of those most impacted. I mean, I'm not just talking about homeless. Uh, violence prevention wasn't really brought up, and I know Advance Peace just started to talk when I, when I couldn't hear anymore, but we need to be investing in violence prevention as opposed to law enforcement, um, and that's, that wasn't mentioned. Um, in a similar vein, we need to be investing in mental health through the Behavioral Health Department, um, especially looking at youth mental health as kids return to school. You have 15 seconds. Um, thank you. Uh, we need to invest in peer mentors and advocates, for example, expanding the triage program. Um, also, uh, the county pay for trauma-informed training for different staff and others that deal with youth, like CBOs and school and county staff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That concludes your public comments. Thank you. Yeah. And at this time, I'm going to ask the our... Um, Stephanie and Stacy and Emily from Deloitte, if you would mind coming back up for a couple more questions. And Supervisor Cerna has the floor. Thank you, Chair. So um, you just heard the, uh, the, the half dozen speakers or so that, that we heard and undeniably there's at least i i heard a theme there um seems there was some concern about um, um violence community violence um, gun violence um, there was concern about whether or not the survey actually reached disadvantaged communities um, some of the same concerns that were expressed during our opening comments um, how how much of the survey instrument was by design intended to be strictly uh, to, to strictly identify what the treasury says you can spend the, the funds on and how much of that actually influenced whether or not something like gun violence didn't make the survey uh, i guess that's my first question so for the community-based survey, there were multiple different sections of that, and this goes to kind of your guys' request that you see kind of what that survey looked like, the kind of the picture that um, 
you know, that you guys mentioned earlier, so we'll provide that, you know, through Ann to you guys. Um, but so they could, the community respondents were able to write in free text anything they wanted. And then they were asked to classify it based on the specific um, treasury guidelines with some definitions around kind of what those meant as well. It didn't always happen that what was actually written into the box matched the boxes that they checked. Sometimes what they wrote into the box and then they checked other. Um, but we, part of the analysis that we did was looking at the boxes that were selected as to what is this, what categories does this kind of, you know, fall underneath based on the treasury guidelines. And then the kind of open free form text, did those align or not? And so, you know, we received comments around, you know, California's taxes are too high. Well, that's not something that ARPA can really help with, nor is it intended to help as part of an overall COVID response. And so um, they, the community was able to put in anything that they wanted in that box. Um, they could talk about you know, gun violence and, and those types of things. Um, I don't think we received anything along those lines. Um, there may have been a few one-off responses yeah. around gun violence. <clears throat> there were several comments around public safety. Yes. Some people did elaborate, some people did not. <clears throat> and under the ARPA guidance, um, community anti-violence yes. programming is an eligible expense. So that can yeah. be an area that's further explored in the program allocation yeah. and project scoping. So, so I, mean, I guess, I'll, again, this goes back to my earlier request to at some point see the survey instrument itself. Not every survey response, but the survey instrument. So that I have a better understanding of, for lack of a better phrase, how leading the survey instrument was in terms of it, is homelessness something that appeared on uh, on the the survey so that it, it encourages someone to think carefully about hey homelessness and then I'm going to cross reference that with guidance homelessness is, is my number one priority or I don't see gun violence but gun violence concerns me and I'm going to put it in the other box do you see what I'm getting at yeah so the way that we uh, structured the survey was the issue was requested first. Um, and it was an open text form, so essentially what is the issue that you'd like to provide feedback okay. on? And then once, within all in one page, but after that then came the ask to designate what eligible bucket that fell under, we actually changed some of the la language specifically to make it more in layman's term and not that technical language that um, ARPA uses. So, you know, we talked about obviously the water, sewer, and broadband. We broke up into a couple different buckets. Economic response, we broke mm -hmm. up into housing, homelessness, education, things like that, um, and we provided some of those definitions. But the first question after some of that contact information was, what is the issue you want to provide feedback yep. on? Open text, and then asking them to essentially designate which area that falls under, given that we need to stay within the confines of what's eligible, um, and there was always the option for other. Yep. Okay. I, I, yeah, it remains a little disconcerting to me hearing what I heard, and I know that that's that's six people. It's not 1,500 people, but um, they're, the fact that they took the time to provide us their perspective is important to, to me and I think all of us. Um, and knowing what I just heard about um, some aspects of public safety being eligible, and then of course knowing the district the way I know it, knowing the county what, the way we know it, um, certainly public safety um, has been kind of at the forefront of our agenda in di different ways uh, over the last couple of years, year and a half, especially with what happened last summer. Um, and that could probably be said for every local government across the, the country. So I'm a little surprised that that it didn't it didn't come out in the the survey results if, or the ranking as as high as it as it did. And is that something that could be? Regardless of where it fell out in the in the survey, is that something that you think you would want to think carefully about and bring back as a priority? Well, it was it fell very low, as I recall, the public safety and what some of the comments were. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but some people were advocating for additional deputies on the street to address public safety, and others were advocating for somehow addressing safety around homeless encampments. There was I don't I didn't recall seeing anything around gun violence particularly or violence prevention. Well, and some of the um, public safety related things were um, comments that were related to public safety surrounding the, the overall topic of homelessness yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I know public safety is, can mean many different okay. things to different people and organizations. It means something besides people with badges and fire hoses to me, which I have all the respect for, but, but public safety is a much broader definition for me and perhaps others. Um, so I'm just, I'm just a little, I don't know, I guess uh, it makes me uh, have more questions than, than answers at this point about that, that element of it. Take that for what it is. I just like to say that in my district, there are a lot of advocates for more boots on the ground. Um, the response times are slow; they can't get through, and the homeless is exacerbated with COVID, so they can't. So, I that makes sense to me that response that you got, and I also want to say that um, the food. Uh, Sacramento Food Policy Council, I think, brought up a very valid point, and that's actually uh, what I consider a priority. Also, I want to go on record to say that food insecurity and um, finding food ways to put food, local food systems like local farms, uh, find, finding ways to promote that um, is going to, I believe, that will be important in the next decade, especially with a water shortage and who knows what kind of um, disruption in our supply chain we're going to experience after COVID. Uh, I believe that's really an important uh, sus to sustain our communities during difficult times. Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a brief comment. Um, I always wanted to draw attention. I, some of the speakers uh, identify themselves as um, with different organizations. We received yesterday a very uh, thoughtful, um, I think, uh, well-crafted letter on behalf of uh, dozens of organizations, uh, some of who were represented in the uh, comments uh, here a moment ago. And I guess I would just suggest that, and I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at that. It came through yesterday. Uh, but I think it would be helpful for folks at Deloitte to take a look at that. Um, um, I think uh, they reflect what was said by some of the speakers and touched on by Supervisor Cerna about you know, how their um, how they were able to voice and or not, and I think but they've summarized in a fairly uh, succinct manner uh, some of the priorities, some which align with what we saw here today, others which may be in a different order or have a different emphasis to them. So I guess I would just encourage us to take this into account. This is a public hearing, and obviously you've sought you know comments from this board and gotten plenty today, but I guess I would just encourage us to include this as a part of the, the thinking, and I think there's some points may or may not have been reflected in the survey in a certain manner, but this is not unimportant uh, as other information we received, but I would just draw your attention to this letter. I think it's a, it's a good framework and backdrop for the discussions that are gonna go on between now and the time we next see this uh, uh, matter before us. So um, I draw your attention to it. Thanks. I Thank actually you. provided that to the Deloitte team <laughs> yesterday. Okay, good. Yeah. So, yeah. so no, thank, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. So, I think uh, what you're looking for is some direction on whether or not you can go forward with these priorities as expressed today. And we did, we did have a request from Supervisor Cerna to take a look at 25 million divided by um, between uh, five districts, and um, I don't. I don't know if that gives you enough that you can come back maybe with with that in mind and with you know with the perspective that I that some of the rest of us requested as you know how will that impact the overall funding opportunities and needs for the county um, unincorporated and so does that give you what you need it absolutely gives me what I need and we'll come back in a couple of steps at least the first uh, return will be with a pro what a process might look like if you all did have a 25 and 25 million dollar allocation um, you know a, a formal process uh, for you to utilize in partnership with uh, county team um, and then you all could bless that or not and then that will help us do the overall allocations which will come after that well, I, I just want to thank Deloitte, and I want to thank um, each of you ladies for a, a very uh, professional presentation, and thank you for putting up with all of our comments and questions. Uh, this is a big job, and we're delighted to have you uh, help us through it. And so thank you very much. And thank you, Anne, for, and the staff for working through this. I want to thank them too because and it's not just the three of them they have a pretty massive team behind them and we could not have done this 
ourselves. We couldn't have done it as quickly. And I have to give a shout out to Jeff King. I hope he's watching because he's county staff that in addition to his regular job as a deputy director for uh, DC FAS, we asked him to do this and be project manager and said, oh, it'll be like half time. <laughs> and it's, um, he really has two full-time jobs right now. So if you're watching, Jeff, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jeff, from all of us. All right, thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. All right. Next item. Ma Madam Chair, just, oh, so when sure. we when do we expect to see this back next? I'm sorry, that was to, to kind of then before final with final budget before final budget or. Well, I'm right? hoping before, but I don't want to commit to that because I just don't know uh, okay. who to assign this to and how we're going to put it together and timing. And I know a lot of the budget staff um, who do some of this work are working on final budget, so. Um, I'm hoping before final budget, but if not, it'll be September. Yeah, because we only have two more meetings. I know, there's before, not much before time. Before final budget, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. What's the deadline? What is the deadline, the drop dead line? We don't have a deadline. We, we want to move as quickly as we can so that we can get the funding allocations done and get projects developed so we can get money out there on the street that's much needed, uh, but we also want to do it right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Okay, next item, please. Item 39, this is the um, Kitchen PCN, a request for a letter of public convenience or necessity for a Type 21 beer, wine, and spirits liquor license for a new retail establish establishment store located at 2225 Hurley Way in the Arden Arcade community. Good afternoon, Chris. Good afternoon, Chair Frost, board members, Chris Bahuli, principal planner. Um, staff is recommending approval of the request by the kitchen uh, for a letter of public convenience or necessity to allow them to obtain a type 21 alcohol license uh, from the state to operate a small retail shop adjacent to their restaurant. Uh, I do have a, a presentation that I can provide to the board with more information on the request and staff's analysis or alternatively the board can forego the pre presentation. I am available to answer any questions. Uh, I do know that the applicant is on the line, or at least I believe them to still be on the line. Um, so they are also available. Okay. Um, this is Supervisor Desmond's district, so I will defer to him to whether or not he wants the presentation. Thank you. I, no, I, I don't need the presentation. I'll defer to my colleagues if they'd like it. I, I don't think there are any issues here. This has support in the community, and I'm prepared to move the item. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Desmond and a second by... Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear who, who gave Cerna. the second. Cerna. Cerna. Mr. Cerna. Mr. Cerna? Oh, Supervisor Cerna, uh, please vote. What, what, do you have any public comments? Oh, I'm on, sorry. Yeah. We do. Uh, we do. We have public comments. We did not have any public comments. Okay. I guess I got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> Must have been a long day. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, no disrespect to the applicant who is probably on the phone. We are looking forward to voting on your item. So please vote. Unanimous vote. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Made it worth the wait. <laughs> okay. Item 40 is the housing element. This is a general plan amendment to update the county's housing element. Are, are we going to take a dinner break? <laughs> oh, don't say that. <laughs> yeah, this could be a while. I'll do my best to keep it moving. Um, Leanne Moffitt, uh, your planning director here with the staff presentation on the housing element. Uh, I want to lead off by recognizing that it took many people uh, to develop this document. Um, I won't really be able to recognize them all as they come from throughout and across uh, the county organization, but when you look at the programs and the implementation measures and you see all those various uh, departments and divisions and agencies, you can see all the many people um, who helped us do the analysis and put that together. Uh, there are a few people in the room here that I want to point out. I want to start uh, off with the executive director of the Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency, uh, Lachelle uh, Dozier, who's in the back, um, along with her staff, Christine Weikert and Tyrone Roderick-Williams. Um, I want to, uh, Emily Halcon, our new director of homeless initiatives, was here earlier, but she had a conflict and had to leave, uh, but we have been working closely with her. Um, and uh, we also have our consultant, Chelsea Payne, 
uh, with Ascent Environmental, our housing element guru who has guided us through this and ho who knows lots about housing elements. Um, and then last but not least, uh, some of my staff, uh, including Leanne Mueller, the other Leanne M. Um, we have two of them in planning. And then Kate Rose, our project manager, who has done so much on this element and deserves special recognition and appreciation. Um, and then I also, as I get started, want to thank the many public members, uh, the advocacy groups, uh, the uh, private sector builders, and those with market rate housing interests for their passion, their time, and their thoughtful comments, because there has been quite a bit of public um, participation through this process. Uh, so with that, I'll start off with the slide on the overview. We are amending the general plan today. This is the only item in this general plan round that makes adoption a lot easier. It is one of eight required elements of the general plan, but it is the only element that has to be certified by the state. It is the county's overall plan for meeting the sh our share of the regional housing needs. And between in, in this evening's presentation, I'll focus on three key chapters. The assessment of fair housing, a new component, chapter 11, the land inventory that relates to the uh, affordable sites and a rezone program, that's chapter eight. A handful of components from the, the heart of the element, which is the housing action plan chapter, chapter three. Um, and a uh, few uh, of the other ponent, the components, uh, which are really interesting and important, I won't focus on in the presentation. I will assume you've looked it over. Uh, I do want to note um, chapter two has a really excellent section on all of the funding sources that housing and redevelopment agency staff help us put together. That's a really great resource when you want to see the whole picture in one chapter. It's a really great primer on where money comes from and how it's used. Um, so I want to emphasize that this is the overall policy plan, kind of the strategic plan. Um, there are a lot of other actions that will be undertaken, uh, some of which will have to come back to the board for discussion that are uh, sort of uh, uh, policy in nature. Um, and so you are making, in many cases, a commitment to address a topic, but there are a lot of details that staff may have to return to you for how you want to go about addressing that. So that was something I wanted to um, emphasize. So the next slide is just kind of a preview of the overall schedule. Staff started this in our background work in 2019. We were ready to launch our public outreach in spring of 2020, of course, right at the outset of the pandemic. Um, so we had to do a bit of adapting and juggling uh, to make it through that. Um, we prepared the draft element um, through uh, 2020 and have continued that through the whole process. We've held workshops for the Planning Commission and the board. We did a round with all 14 community planning advisory councils and a second round of public outreach. Um, we had a public review draft issued with a comment period in February of 2021. Um, we did a couple rounds of HCD review in early 2021. Um, we were at the Planning Commission and then here today. Um, hopefully for your adoption, and we have a couple of immediate follow-up items we want to do, tackle including the rezone program and the housing trust fund. So the overall housing element goals are to provide an adequate supply of land for housing, to reduce constraints to housing production, to preserve existing housing in neighborhoods, to improve housing opportunities and conditions for special needs groups, to provide and maintain housing affordability, to promote the efficient use of energy in residences through alternative and innovative conservation measures, and to promote and affirmatively further fair housing opportunities for Sacramento County residents. <coughs> One of the key components of any housing element um, is getting the regional housing needs allocation. That's kind of your target for new housing uh, con construction and provision. Um, that starts at the state level uh, with Department of Financing, estimating population projections, projections, then HCD calculates housing need by region, and then in our case, SACOG, uh, along with the MTP process, allocates that out to each jurisdiction, and that becomes one of the key components to start the housing alone an analysis. Due to unmet needs for housing, the state and regional housing projections are substantially higher than in prior periods. This table shows the county's total unit allocation of a little over 21,000 uh, units to be uh, constructed uh, by 2029, um, with over 7,000 of those uh, needing to be in the lower income uh, categories, over 4,000 at moderate income, and almost 10,000 units at above moderate income. 
Excuse me, Supervisor Cerna. Yes. Sorry, real quick, Leanne, just to yes. be clear, uh, not constructed, but zoned for? Thank you. Well, yes, zoned for with the hopes that they will be constructed right. by the private sector. It, Excellent point. Thank yeah. you. Yes, good, good uh, clarification there. Um, I was going to note that the regional share to the SACOG region went up by 50%. Um, the county's share of that regional share is almost the same as during the last period. It's only 1% higher, um, but our overall numbers are up because the regional share went up by 50%. Hmm. Um, so the next step, uh, as Supervisor Cerna pointed out, is to provide land for the um, appropriately zoned uh, for the private market to construct uh, this housing. Um, and so we have done a land inventory as required under state law, and we've broken that up um, into assumed various income categories uh, as we do with every housing element. Um, we are required to, to have a parcel-specific inventory of appropriately zoned and available sites for the provision of housing to all income levels. This table summarizes the results of our inventory. Uh, as you can tell, we have sufficient capacity to accommodate the allocation and the moderate and above moderate categories. However, um, we have only uh, appropriate zoning for 4,324 4, lower income units as compared to our allocation of 7,158 in the lower income category. Therefore, there is a current shortfall of 2,834 units. A component of that um, is that state law requires our inventory to um, be in a zoning category that allows for at least 30 units per acre to be built. Excuse and, me. Yes. Excuse me, I, uh, Supervisor Desmond. Sir, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Lan. I just figured I'd, I'll have more questions as you go through this, but since you're on, on this slide with the ADUs, how did you come up with that, um, and I don't know if that's a projection or current inventory of 224 ADUs in the low-income category? It's a projection, okay. um, and SACOG came up uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, SACOG came up with a um, a methodology that many of the jurisdictions, including us, are using as to how many ADUs um, uh, can be produced. And so there is a methodology uh, that it aligns with what other jurisdictions are using. Okay, thank you. Is that methodol? Are we required to adopt that methodology, or could we make different projections in Sacramento County? And and the reason I'm asking is that is because I think that you know that is a housing prod, uh, product that I think is um, uh, very desirable for a lot of places in Sacramento <clears throat> County. And obviously state law has made it much easier to build those ADUs. And I'm just wondering, are, are we making an appropriate projection of the number of ADUs? Yeah, um, so staff felt that it was best to use uh, the methodology that was uh, had been developed uh, to be used on a regional basis and that it was safest and we were most likely um, to uh, not have that called out as being overly optimistic um, in order to achieve element certification. Um, so we felt that that was the best strategy rather than trying to be overly aggressive, that this has been a point of discussion and somewhat of contention um, in terms of we've had some ad uh, advocates who felt we were being overly optimistic. Hmm. Um, and we didn't want HCD to not certify the element over a handful of uh, ADU units uh, by attempting to be too aggressive. Okay, and I may have some comments about that later, but I think certainly there are, I mean, and we'll probably refer to ARPA funding and the implications that might have on Thanks. carrying out some of the objectives of this plan, but I think there are probably, you know, a lot of creative things the county can do to incentivize additional ADUs or make it easier for people to build ADUs, but I will have more yes. discussion, I'm sure. Certainly, we have had some past discussions with the board about some of our grant funding, which is absolutely intended to facilitate ADUs. Part of the issue is you also need to show a track record for success. Um, and so it may be that uh, over time, as we really <clears throat> are able to really ramp up ADU production, we may be able to be more aggressive in our assumptions. Okay. And, but and in the absence of that track record, um, you know, we did have some concerns that HCD might uh, not allow us to be too aggressive. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I did want to uh, cover the point that a good part of our inventory has always been in the RD20 zoning category, 
that isn't going to be allowed by state uh, any more statutory requirement for uh, zoning at the lower incomes to allow at least 30 units per acre. So one of the first steps in our rezone program will be taking those apartment zone sites and uh, making sure that the zoning appropriately allows them to go up to 30 units per acre uh, to meet that statutory requirement. Um, so we will uh, need to embark upon a rezone program and we will also be looking at having an oversupply in that rezone program. Um, and I will have another slide uh, in, the, in a minute back to the rezone program. But before I get there, I wanted to touch upon the new analysis about affirmatively furthering fair housing because it does relate also to the rezone program. Um, so uh, we have a new chapter 11, the assessment of fair housing, which examines existing conditions and demographic patterns including concentrated areas of poverty and areas of opportunity to compare how house, past housing practices inhibit fair housing in the county today. The majority of the data used in this assessment is from the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, the AI, because uh, there are so many acronym, acronyms in housing helmet law. Um, this was prepared for the Sacramento Valley region in February of 2020 and Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency and their consultant led this regional effort. Um, as part of the chapter, uh, and we also had a substantial amount of help from our consultant on this chapter, um, we analyzed the county site's inventory against the many maps and data sources to determine how our placement of sites would impact access to opportunity, patterns of segregation, and disproportionate housing needs. In preparing this chapter, we found that many of the same areas which are considered low resource or high segregation and poverty are also areas where high percentage of residents are non-white, where much of the population is considered low or moderate income, and when, where there is high displacement risk. These areas generally align with our environmental justice communities of North Highlands, South Sacramento, West Arden Arcade, and North Vineyard. The chapter finds that by identifying sites for the lower income regional housing needs allocation in these areas, the site's inventory may contribute to existing patterns of segregation and inequity. Therefore, the chapter identifies several programs to reduce this impact. Uh, we have excerpted a handful of maps, um, one of which is on this slide, but there are a whole bunch more in that chapter 11. Um, to give you a sense of the analysis, uh, I think I've uh, said this before in briefings, but the pink dots on the maps are our lower income sites. So you sort of want to see pink dots in blue areas, not pink dots in pale green areas. Excuse um, me. Sure. Oh, excuse me, uh, yeah. Supervisor Desmond. Yes. Thanks, Leanna. But if, if I wait till the end, I'll forget what I'm thinking. Okay. So please, indulge okay. me. And, and, and you're right, the acronyms were, uh, this is such a comprehensive report very and, and very, very impressive. It took me a while to figure out some of the acronyms. So um, excuse my, my ignorance if I, you know, ask you some questions and it doesn't make sense. That one um, comment you just mentioned about North Highlands, for instance, that just kind of struck me because, um, you know, North Highlands is an area that, you know, 25 years ago before the base closed down was a very thriving community. I mean, I think the uh, economic disparities, the, the, the struggles in that community is as a result, a result of changed economic circumstances as far as the, 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 the job provider there. Um, but the other unique thing about North Highlands, for instance, is there are not a lot of multifamily housing uh, products in North Highlands. So I, I would argue, I mean, I, so I, I just want to be careful sure. about this policy that you articulated in that last statement that you don't want to put low income projects there because you don't want to further the, the inequities. And I'm absolutely sensitive to that because, I, you know, I, North Highlands needs help, but it also needs um, a diversity of, of housing uh, products up there, and I think there there is an opportunity for uh, multifamily housing products up there. And I just want to make sure this policy is not going to prevent us from, from doing that. So when I get to the policy, you're going to see a 10% number. So it, we are not saying we aren't going to do any um, affordable housing in the other communities. It's just we shouldn't do 100% of it. Great. Got it. So I'll, I'll point that out on the slide when I get there. Yeah. Thank you, Supervisor uh, Desmond, Supervisor Cerna, and then Supervisor Natoli's after that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just want to make sure I understand the map because I, I, I yeah. have it expanded on my iPad so I can see better the legend here. And you have, for instance, um, the pan of the former panhandle uh, of the now island of unincorporated area in Natomas. 
um, you have it identified as racially or eth ethnically concentrated areas of poverty. So how, how does how do I uh, reconcile that? That's uh, largely an industrial area, right. number one, and number two, the polygon extends over into the city. Um, so what is, what does that mean for that area? Get, so it. that I can try to extrapolate that for the other areas that have a similar designation. Sure. So this particular map. Uh, is an opportunity map created by State Housing and Community Development and the Tax Credit Allocation Committee. And that's why in our analysis in Chapter 11, we have a whole bunch of maps um, because we're overlaying our inventory on you know, multiple different data sources. We just happen to have pulled this map. Um, so each of the base maps is drawn from a different data source and looks at something else. So I'm not, necess I'm not trying to say that this particular base map is the end-all be-all. Um, we have looked at the inventory over multiple data sources trying to look, you know, to draw out what the issues are. This just happens to be one particular data source that we put on the slide, but there are many more. Um, there are two others on the next slide that all have different data sources, and there are more in Chapter 11. I can't, uh, honestly, I don't really personally know went into the HCD and TCAC uh, this particular base map, um, my notes indicate they used economic, educational, and environmental indicators. Uh, I, I can't explain to you what those are. Um, this is one data source that we used among many. I, okay. I, there, as far as I know, there's not even a single housing unit <laughs> right. in, in the unincorporated part of that area. So. Got it. Unfortunately, I, I, like, I, I don't know. Yeah. You know this is you know, one the, data source among many. It's the state. Right. Yeah, I don't believe that. Yeah. Um, so. Before you leave that, I'm sorry. Yep, sure. Yeah. And I appreciate <clears throat> Supervisor Cerna's question because the question I have is so you get these groupings, and I'm looking in areas in Wilton and east of Galt, yep. um, and in all these maps. I looked at some of those maps in Chapter 11, too, right. and I know you had overpayment and uh, any number of other you know, rent related and housing costs. But tell me, so how do these dots come to appear on this map? So the what? dots are our local land use inventory. So the dots are um, uh, vacant, undeveloped land. What, um, agres? Agres, ag ag absolutely. Agricultural parcels? Absolutely, and when you get to the body of the element, when it comes to the rural areas, we explain in the element to state HCD that while some of those rural areas show up as high resource, they would not really be suitable for affordable housing because they otherwise would not meet funding criteria. They don't have infrastructure and services that would ever otherwise support affordable housing, so that's in the text of the element. I, I know. Um, so we wouldn't be seeking to do, you know, affordable housing in the far-flung, uh, you know, Agra's right. Wilton community, so that's in the body of the text. No, and, and, yeah. and that's important. I'm glad you called it yes. out. And it, but so, but those blue dots yeah. uh, may represent um, uh, land that can be developed for above moderate income, which would be Agra's. I guess I, I'm still curious. I mean, and these databases that somebody in some office over the state. You know, I commented on this with water resources earlier today on another database with soils. But so <clears throat> I can't tell the difference. Again, maybe it's just because of the scale between the blue and the pink and the purple or whatever they are here. But um, so they're showing those. This is their data saying those are opportunity sites. No, the dots are our data, our local data. We have overlaid our local inventory, which are the dots mm. on these various base maps. But how do we come to the conclusion, just even with your explanation and caveat, that those were opportunity sites, maybe for single-family housing, moderate housing, but they're not multifamily zones. There are very few commercial right. zones in those areas. So The dots are the entire inventory. They are both, uh, they are inventory at all income categories. <clears throat> and the, the pink dots are the lower income inventory and the blue dots are the moderate and above moderate inventory. So one dot may be RD30, one may be Agres one. Yes. Correct, okay. Yes. So then how does this, 
uh, factor into our calculation about available sites and deficiencies and I mean I, I gotta say I think there's some you know maybe some very weak pretenses I don't want to say false weak pretenses behind some some of this not your categorization but so if I take this map of the county and, and you've got three different two that you can bring up and yet these the dots are in the same places they're just using different background data yes for income categories and distribution but again I still puzzle regarding the rural areas is that as you said there's not sewer and water you know you're you may get an ADU we're getting any number of ADUs but so it's just a parcel that doesn't have a house on it right and so our inventory is comprehensive including above moderate and ag res okay that's so why we have uh, when you go back to the slide and we show our land inventory you can see we have a projected supply of over 12,000 units in above moderate some of those 12,000 units are going to be ag res units in the rural areas okay and so the, with the map you have to right now in fact the supervisor certainly commented on it a moment ago you have these two yellow spots, one that's west of Galt, largely in rural area. Actually, it's maybe similar in the map we had this morning about the groundwater uh, sustainability area down in the south. And yet McClellan shows high segregation and poverty. So how do you tell me that west of 99, north of Twin Cities, largely farming, is high segregation and poverty? Again, I, I, I cannot I would argue that. Yeah, I, I can. I can tell you where the dots came from. Um, <laughs> I'm I, not talking about the dots. Uh, I'm talking about the big yellows. That get... Right. The uh, the base map is uh, uh, the base map is HCDs and the tax credit allocation committees map. So, uh, and it is not the only base map that is in Chapter 11. So, um, we have. We have many other maps with other data sources to inform the holistic analysis. Oh, I, I, again, I'm not trying yeah. to you know, pin, you know, pin you down with a bunch of questions here. It's just that yeah. you know, to call out, uh, and again, the one I'm most familiar with, obviously, is in the southern part of the county, to tell me that's high segregation in the poverty area. Um, I could probably take you out to the area or anybody here and you know, introduce you to folks who are actively engaged in farming for the most part. I know Rio Casumas Correctional Center is in that particular Area, so if that's what you, you know, I don't. It, it's yeah, I don't think that it it alone isn't informing what we're going to do. I, right, it's not that relevant. I know, to but the all outcome, those databases but, underlie what we're required right. to do, Leanne, to the struggle that you, you know, and what we're going to be asked to do today, and to have an open, honest discussion about it. <laughs> all this gets done in some map makers, uh, you know, uh, context where they draw on certain data and they put it in that classification. And, and they accomplished whatever their task was, but then to reflect that openly in a map that says this is what the tax credit allocation board and or state housing HCD says is factual. Well, again, I you know without saying any more than I need to say, I guess today I just I I just it makes it very difficult because the task we're, we you know that they put on us they pass all the you know the legislature passes the rules HCD issues the administrative regulations. And we're told you got to comply. You got to you know provide for X number of units, and you better get them built darn soon because if you don't, by the time the next time comes around, you're gonna we're gonna add to your inventory requirements and, and and continue to ratchet down. But I just to me this just this underlying map raises big questions for me and not to for others. And then you overlay it with this and this and this and this, and all we have to do is we have to tell you where the dot. And we're saying where the dots are at. And even that has a whole lot of caveats behind it. Um, and, 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 and how does this get housing built anyway? Right. I, I cannot justify the state's I, I, I requirement know, I, I know. for I, us to do the Chapter 11 I, analysis. Yeah. I just know uh, we need to get it done. And it's a definitely was very important to state HCD in terms of getting us a certified housing element. So. We did uh, the best we could using a wide variety of data sources to conduct uh, the analysis. So. At, at some juncture, and I don't mean to take any more time on this. I just that I, I would like to have somebody with you know the credentials from State HCD come over here and maybe explain their data sources because they are used to make funding decisions. Tax credit allocation uses uses this, and they you know 
uh, you know, they do evaluations, they, you know, private development and so forth. They, you know, they're, they're using these tools, whether they completely apply to us or not, that's what, the, the, what, they're, what they're using. And I, you know, I see, you know, uh, Lachelle and others in the audience here, and you know, that's, you know, those are the measures that are used. And, and again, I don't know the accuracy of them, but I guess right. if nobody questions them, they just, that's what gets used for how we compete for statewide funds, for federal dollars and state dollars, and our folks, do, our folks do a great job in being partners with the builders and such. It, it, to me, I, I just find it you know, overly frustrating, and you, you can put a lot of information in the, in the, in the body of this, right. including the maps. Um, and I just think it, you know, it, it, it speaks to the challenge that we have as a community in trying to meet the state regulations, and we're not the ones that build the housing for the most part. I mean, we, we as a county are, certainly. Well, that's true. Okay, all right. So I, I'm going to move forward to the um, countywide rezone program, um, which is what we are absolutely statutorily obligated uh, to do in order to get a certified housing element. Um, this is one of the few times we've come, uh, it's not the only time we've come in short. We have had to do a rezone program once in the past, um, and we're going to have to do that again. Um, so what this policy says up here, I am not going to read this entire slide. Um, but it says that we are committing to identify and rezoning 164 acres of land to allow multifamily uses by right. A component of that will be changing this RD20, the art part, pieces that are already apartment zoning. Um, and that we will include at least a 15% buffer. Um, and we may actually want more than a 15% buffer, but that'll be your board's decision to make um, when we get there. And um, to, I think this point goes to your question, Supervisor Desmond. Uh, we are committing uh, on the last bullet point there to identify at least 10% of the remaining lower income regional housing needs allocation in high and moderate resource areas. So in theory, we could put 90% not in the high resource areas. Again, when it comes down to it, staff may come in and suggest that we do more than 10% in the high resource areas, but ultimately that's going to be your decision. Okay. We are committing to a minimum of 10%. Yes, please, uh, well, Supervisor. Thank, thank you, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, because I, I don't want us to, and this kind of goes back to some of my, I, my struggles I have with this process, and, and some of it relates to what Supervisor Natoli was was discussing. I mean, I know that there's a, um, a move to take away some of the local control when it comes to land use planning, and that's one of the most fundamental roles of a local government official, right? I mean, for us to be the ones who are responsive to the needs of our community, because we understand the community better than our state legislators, for instance. And But I also understand that housing is not getting built in California. I, I happen to think a lot of the reason for that is because of what's coming out of the state capitol here. Um, <laughs> but but looking at this, and, and you mentioned, you know, those minimum density now of 20 units per acre. Well, help me understand, Leanne, and we, we've had discussions about this, and I think you know what my concerns are. I, I, I worry that the decision we make in adopting this housing element if, for instance, uh, uh, someone comes with an infill project in, in Carmichael, right. and there's a lot of blue dots identified in Carmichael and Fair Oaks and, and parts of my district and, and District 4 and, and District 5, of course, someone comes in with a project that, boy, it would fit great as part of that missing middle, which can, can get us to more affordable housing, you know, ultimately. But it does not, it, it, they want to go below that, that 20 units per acre for at least part of the, pro, you know, I mean, it, it, I guess a net might be below, but it still is going to fit and it's going to get us some additional housing. Um, will we just absolutely not be able to do that in, in those sites that are, that are zoned? You will right once you get an oversupply. And we have, um, I can think of three relatively recent examples um, where projects were approved at a lower density um, then assumed in the housing element. Uh, one was a Catholic church-owned site uh, in the vineyard area. Uh, one was another site in Vineyard Springs, and one was a Lennar missing middle type project uh, approved by the Planning Commission. So, but in all those cases, we had an oversupply. In that so, income, in that income category. In that lower income category. Yeah. So we are stuck until we get an oversupply. So we need to get this rezone program done with an oversupply so that when you have your dream project come in front of you, um, the state statutes aren't 
the barrier to approving it. When's the last time we had an oversupply of very low income housing? Well, you approved those three projects, so we did have an oversupply. So, yes. so it's possible. It, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But we could have a, we could have an oversupply in identified inventory sites as well. Correct. I mean, in other words, could we say, okay, we're we're gonna we're gonna let this go below the density that we've established, but maybe we staff would have to identify maybe in conjunction with the applicant staff would identify have to identify other sites i mean maybe that's looking at okay let's bump up our adu projection numbers or something or or look at some of these commercial sites that we could identify as potential inventory right will we be able to do that and that that's just my concern is that is that this is going to have the opposite effect of what we want it to have right we I mean, are going to bring you a large pool of sites uh, after we initiate it and have some conversations with the individual property owners because we thought they probably should know about it first um, and uh, to choose from with the idea of having an oversupply yeah and because the other kicker now in state law is um, not only if you have a discretionary project at a lower income but if someone builds a buy right project at a higher income level and we have a shortfall we, the county, have the obligation to go make up for that shortfall within 180 days. Mm -hmm. That is going to be really within hard. That was why days. our consultant is saying you really need a robust oversupply. It is, it is a bad idea to come close to zero. So that's why you have that buffer. Right. right. And right. I think uh, Chelsea would encourage us to go far more than 15%. That's just the commitment we made in the element. But you see her nodding as she's lectured us. You want a decent amount of oversupply. Thank you. And I just want to make it clear. I mean, I am absolutely an advocate for developing a lot more multifamily housing, affordable housing along commercial corridors, especially. But I but I'm also very cognizant of my district. You know, Carmichael, for instance, 95608 has, I think, one of the highest concentration of multifamily housing in the county. Um, there are apartment complexes everywhere. So I, I, you know, I have an obligation to my constituents to be sensitive to that too and make sure we're building the right product, uh, projects that meet the needs, meet, meet our housing needs, but also want to get them built because I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good here either. So right. thank you. I wanted to go back on a point when we were asking about, you know, making investments um, in what we, what this element calls low resource communities. You know, we all know, I mean, several of the board members are huge champions for investments like the 5700 Stockton Boulevard and some of those other projects. I mean, we want to make positive investments in those communities. So it's not like we aren't going to do anything in those communities either. We're going to spread it out. We just don't want it all concentrated in one area. And you all understand and are huge champions for some of those projects. Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, at the risk of maybe, you know, getting ahead of you, but so we're talking about, you know, the, the number of units and part of what you identify in the, um, you know, I forget which chapter it is, but, you know, about 1,160 plus or minus units that are at risk and SHRA was a part of that conversation. And you actually detail out, or somebody did, you know, the order of magnitude in order to preserve and or, quote, replace those units there's a price tag of you know approaching you know three quarters of a billion dollars, just for units that already either are restricted to the subsidy agreements uh, that will expire during the life of this element, and or um, you know the need to build others. Is that calculated? In, that's not calculated in 2,834 units that you were, were um, <coughs> looking at here, right? No. So that's that's a different topic and a different. But that's issue. additive. That if you lost those, right. then you, as you do the count or keep score or whatever you do, um, that that's a potential. Yeah, I think it's a little more complicated than that. It doesn't necessarily directly go into the math, um, but I think it does come out in the and, long. And maybe run. the point yeah. I wanted to ask about those when I look at the infusion of dollars, and if you're trying to promote, you know, affordable projects, and certainly you know we see some private sector market rate, but you don't see a lot that don't go through these processes that we were talking about and, you know, that are outlined. And again, we've been pretty successful as a community in competing for at least, I'm not going to say a fair share, because I, when I look at the numbers and I've seen those, what goes south of here uh, and maybe east or west of here, <clears throat> certainly 
you know, proportionally, I, I think that, you know, our fair share could be a whole lot larger if people were being fair about it. But I guess my point being, though, is that if that's the call out to just preserve or retain, and what we know is on the horizon, again, it's, it's estimated, and then we look at trying to promote new, you know, construction, and particularly in the multifamily arena and the affordable end of it, um, you know, w this money doesn't grow on trees. And again, we're not, you know, the county, you know, we're, you know, we generate some dollars through housing trust fund, through, you know, um, uh, you know, conditions on certain projects and so forth. But it, it just seems to me that, you know, there's a lot of stuff on paper. We're having to spend, you know, you know, whatever amount of money we are to develop the plan to try to meet the obligation and do it seriously with the intent of trying to get there. <clears throat> But I guess I'm just curious. So, where, where does people, where do we presume the money's going to come from? Right. So, to do this. Right. I, I can I stand here with a straight face and tell you I am absolutely convinced we are going to build 7,000 affordable housing units by 2019. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Um, our obligation is to provide uh, the land inventory, um, as was uh, pointed out before, and I know that you and the rest of the county staff are committed to building as many units as we can possibly yeah. fund. Um, you know, you're promoting individual projects. We're looking at, you know, the conversation you just had around the American Rescue Funds. You know, certainly staff are generating um, some ideas uh, to fund local gap uh, for known projects. We're looking at uh, all the various uh, grant fundings where, you know, our it, uh, our two priorities after we finish the adoption of the element is the rezone program and finishing off the housing trust fund. We've made a lot of progress and we need to bring that forward to the board for your consideration. So, I mean, we're trying to dream up of all the things that, and many of those things overlap uh, with your ideas um, to, you know, get projects built. I think we've been doing a pretty good job in the last couple of years. We've got quite a few affordable housing projects approved that you've approved. Uh, much better than we were doing four or five years ago. So, and, and I guess I throw one last comment out is that I, it would seem to me that there needs to be some, um, you know, focused clarity of thinking about, you know, again, the obligations that supposedly are borne by the locals in this process and statewide to talk about, you know, a housing deficiency of, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of units. Uh, and then to think that somehow, um, you know, we're going, you know, we, we would do our part to your point and we'll do it and we're serious about it. And we have been, and you know, I've been through multiple iterations of this as during my time on this board. Um, but it just, it, it, it seems to me that the issue is, is, is so much bigger and yet there's, yet they foist upon local governments, municipalities and counties, uh, this, you know, ongoing obligation, this calculation about, you know, uh, RENA and then you, you know, then you tie other funding to it and so forth. And yet, you know, we're, we're only a small piece of the equation, and it seems like as, as hard as we work at this, that we just, you know, we're lucky if we tread water, uh, and, and not because we don't care and we don't try, and, 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 and that's frustrating. And, and, and then we go through a rezone program where that, you know, and undoubtedly, unless it's a miracle, will generate steam from, you know, other property owners who, you know, had certain expectations about, you know, what certain land, land use protections and zoning entitlements, you know, either provided for or didn't. And uh, and then, you know, we're tasked with trying to find ways to, you know, cut fees, and yet roads have to get built and sewer and water get extended and libraries and such have to get, you know, get, get built. And I just think we're in this box uh, from a planning perspective, but also from a realistic perspective where we just continue to chase it and chase it. And the harder we run and the harder we try to, you know, uh, you know, fulfill those obligations, the more difficult our task becomes, and it just, and they keep lumping more on local governments, and, you know, again, I don't expect you to respond to that, Leanne, but again, I appreciate right. the effort that goes into this, and, uh, and, and, and you know, we're, we're going to do our best, like we always right. do. Yeah. We're going to do our best. I am not going to argue against any yeah. of the uh, frustrations you just yeah. expressed. Uh, my obligation and goal is to get us a certified housing element, one that you are reasonably happy with so that we can continue to apply for grant funds um, because yeah. we need, uh, you know, a lot of the funding sources are predicated on us having a certified housing element. So uh, 
it doesn't do us any good to not have one just because we are frustrated with the state regulations. So, um, <laughs> point taken, well taken. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So missing middle has definitely been a topic, um, one that uh, uh, you just raised, um, and uh, so missing middle is basically those. Uh, naturally occurring affordable housing products, things like haplexes and duplexes and uh, townhomes and those kind of products that aren't deed restricted affordable, um, but they do provide uh, housing to uh, maybe the upper levels of low income and uh, moderate incomes. Um, so uh, this program is to help us meet, um, uh, provide for missing middle. That can also help us meet our affirmatively furthering for housing goals to the extent some of those naturally occur uh, throughout the community. Um, we've received a lot of positive feedback on this program from the development community, from housing advocates, from members of the public, and I think even some of the members of the board um, during briefings. Um, and uh, one of the questions I was asked uh, by at least one board member during the briefing um, had to do with what are we doing to actually bring this forward and get it adopted. So. Um, staff, if you recall back, um, we had some of the SB2 funds uh, to do some zoning code amendments. Those are underway. Um, we've been out to the CPACs. We're getting that package wrapped up, secret document done, so we can uh, hopefully bring it forward to hearings here soon. Um, and one of the things specifically it will do with this, uh, and, uh, there's a whole bunch of things it's going to do, and I didn't want to give a presentation on the whole thing, but I did want to point out that it will allow uh, duplexes, halfplexes, and small multifamily in certain single-family zones as long as the project doesn't exceed the overall density requirements. So that is one component of that SB2 thing that we will be back in front of you on. Okay. Um, I, I just want to quickly sure. ask you, because I did have some constituents that were worried that you're going to put five-story apartments in the middle of neighborhoods, and can you just quickly describe your your search for the right place for the right uh, missing middle housing? Um, so in the rezone program, we are actually going to try to tackle both the state mandated multifamily housing sites, <clears throat> as well as potentially looking for additional sites at this more RD10, RD15 type category. You, Your board will have a little bit more discretion about whether you really want to go there on those sites. You know, you really need to do the multifamily. You don't really have much of a choice. Um, you obviously can choose where, um, but we need to come up with some. Um, so we're going to try to give you a range of sites, um, and obviously there's going to be a bunch of criteria, and your board's going to weigh in. And um, you the know, property owners will be aware of it. And property owners, I we're going to probably encounter some significant opposition to sites. Let's. I don't want to. Um, and you may have people saying, "I want my site." I would love this, right? We that's we definitely want to look with people for people who want us to rezone their site. That is the win-win that we are looking for. It is Which uh, would your be a board savings is not going to want us to bring forward sites that not only do you have community opposition, but you have property owner opposition. That is a rough spot for us all to be in, and you're going to be frowning at staff for sure. So, um, you know, we are going to look for sites where we have uh, preferably favorable property owners, but you know. We have to look broadly um, yeah, and see what thank comes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've already think we've talked to the board in the past about the affordable housing ordinance. This was a discussion uh, during the preparation. Um, so basically here we're just agreeing to look at it uh, and analyze it to see whether we are really producing affordable housing at the rate anticipated at the time of adoption, which was 10%. We're also going to look at an economic feasibility study. Uh, this came out of a planning commission discussion because um, we don't want to, this to be a barrier to producing market rate housing because it is a fee on market rate housing. If we take market rate housing, 0% of zero is zero. So, you know, we want to look for that sweet spot and we will uh, do that analysis, come back to the board and have you see whether you want to tweak that ordinance or not. Excuse me, Supervisor Kennedy. Yes. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> On this one, uh, we, we talk about a affordable housing ordinance or the effectiveness evaluation, all that, by 2023. Um, these things have a way of slippage. Uh, you know, if, if we commit to this, how sure are we that this is going to happen by 2023, which isn't very far off? Yeah. 
Um, I mean, planning staff has every intention of continuing to get funding to implement but the is housing there any, elements. But is there any requirement from HCD that we actually do what we say we're going to do here? Um, I don't know if there's an overt penalty for missing one implementation measure. I mean, I think if you're not overall implementing your plan, they can call you on it. Um, our more immediate effort is the trust fund because that's the one that hasn't been updated since 1993. Um, but, you know. And, and on the, you will also pursue an economic feasibility study to guide any decisions. But there's no, no timeline connected to that as there is up above. Is, or are you? The whole thing is, is the it due by date 2023? of 2023. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, it doesn't all. clearly say that. Just. I think when you look in the element, it's all in a okay. big chart, and the due date is associated Got with it. all of it. Yeah, all right. Sorry. Thank you. That it's probably not clear from the excerpted slide. But yeah. And can I? Excuse me, Leanne. Yes. Uh, Supervisor Desmond has a question. Can I say a quick follow up to that? And, and sure. So, it, an affordable housing ordinance, just to be clear, does not necessarily include an inclusionary housing mandate in it, right? I mean, it's broader right. than just that. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure, just for clarification. Thank yeah, you. and our ordinance right now, for the most part, does not have a hard inclusionary. Um, we In some of the new growth areas, we are requiring sites, but generally it's not what you would call an inclusionary ordinance. Okay. In the past, we have had something that was more of an inclusionary ordinance. But, right, right. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, and then the final program, final and last program that I'm calling out uh, on slides um, had to do with a discussion around tenant protections. Um, and uh, so the commitment here is the county will st study just cause eviction ordinances or other programs to help keep precariously housed tenants in their homes and present findings and recommendations to the board. Um, our due date in the element for this is December 2024. Um, from planning staff's perspective, we had some other higher priority items, and that was, I uh, just wanted to acknowledge to the board that was a concern, um, but planning staff didn't necessarily feel that we had the capacity. I mean, obviously, we may finish these, some of these faster than the commitment, but we were concerned we didn't have the ability to do that faster. I wanted to highlight that. Um, so we have uh, been through two rounds of review with state uh, housing and community development. Uh, round one resulted in a formal comment letter dated April 30th that was pretty long. Uh, round two is a somewhat shorter letter uh, in May of 2021, and we have made revisions based on state HCD review, public comments, and our own analysis throughout the process leading to the version that's in front of you today. Um, the Planning Commission uh, met on June 14th and recommended approval of the element. Uh, individual commissioners had a number of specific comments that I wanted to highlight. Uh, one was the importance around the topic of tenant protections. One uh, was the importance of facilitating market rate housing and streamlining of housing. Um, and the other one was the idea of using overlay zones uh, for flexibility, such with, as with densities, and to incentivize uh, development. There was kind of a discussion around that missing middle issue. Um, but you know, one of the things I want to, again, point out and clarify is um, in part because we are in a rezone program requirement, our sites have to have a minimum density of 20 units per acre. Um, and we have verified um, with several other jurisdictions, Folsom and Roseville, that that is um, what they are doing as required in statutes um, there. And with that, um, that ends uh, my presentation. I want to conclude with expressing my appreciation and gratitude for everyone who's been involved in this very large uh, document here. Um, we are uh, seeking adoption, noting that we do have a pretty hard deadline of September. We have a hard deadline where our grace period ends in September. Um, and it is important that we do have a certified housing element. So with that. Thank I you. and other folks are available for any other questions. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, Leanne, to your last point, and I know you, we've talked about this in the briefing, I guess I would also ask council um, on this, where basically the existing RD20 zone sites all get rezoned to RD30. And you said by statute it requires that. And so how is it that they can blanket rezone 
those sites. Basically, the state's rezoning those sites, if I understand. No? Uh, sorry, I probably misspoke. Let me clarify. It is your board's authority to rezone those sites. The state requires that our lower income inventory have at least a minimum density of RD20. So I guess you could leave RD20 sites at RD20 if you want and look for other sites. So you have the discretion of uh, either moving a site that's an existing apartment zone, uh, apartment zoning, um, and and setting that so that it has a minimum density of 20 units per acre and it'll allow at least 30 units per acre. If you had an RD20 site you wanted to leave at RD20 density, you can do that. Um, then we just need to go to this, you know, search for other sites to get up to the minimum Which required. Which is much harder. Right, so we just thought it was easier to start with sites that were already multifamily. Most people, you know, even the already 20 sites, by the time you layer in our housing incentive program or density bonuses, um, you know, you can get up to 28, 29 units per acre. So it seemed easier. But now that you can get up to 38 or 39 or 40. Um, they may be able to. Um, I don't really see a lot of interest for no. people to develop at those densities in the unincorporated county. Right, um, well, and, and what those do generate, though, is that to the question that the chair asked a little while ago is that in order to get those types of densities, unless they're very, very small units, you're gonna have, you're gonna, you're probably gonna exceed the three stories. And you know, and that's been kind of the capper is because once, my understanding is with the building codes and such that, you know, elevator requirements and other types of things that, you know, three story is kind of the capper and that that is self-limiting, but if you start getting to the RG40 densities, or pushing that, you're going to get you know much you know um, probably going to go higher heights. Uh, and <clears throat> what what do you think is the the, the net effect? Because you got a couple of things going here. You got that recommended. You're also recommending to bring back to the board to take all the BP sites and you know, permitted by right. Uh, you know, multifamily zoning, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then you build into it the consideration for, uh, and I, I think it was, you know, a good way to craft it when you talk about the single family zones that, you know, you would, you still have this prescription of the, the underlying density, but nonetheless, where folks assume that, you know, uh, in the past that, you know, either duplexes were built into development, but they weren't necessarily rented by by right, unless you had an RD10 zone, but now you can actually put a fourplex, uh, you know, which typically goes to a, you know a potentially a second or third story or two and a half stories, depending upon the size of the lot and so forth. Now those aren't being blanketed in today, but you're going to be bringing both of those back, right? We are bringing those back to your board. That will be a decision you make in a future hearing. But they but they do underlie your calculations, and I guess that's I, I want to be clear because your calculation is taking into account certain things, and you know it's, it's the body of work here, and you're presuming, I guess, and tell me if I'm wrong, that all of those things, you know, assuming future board action, would get you to the to the magic number, or no? Well. You know, obviously, we're showing what we have right now, which is a deficiency. I know. Um, yes, so we are. Uh, we will be working very hard to uh, get over that deficiency. But oh, okay, let me just ask it straight up. So, but to get to get over the deficiency, does it anticipate future action by the board on all on those items on, on basically bumping the RD twenty to RD thirty? Uh, maybe that's included in today's action, but uh, as well as, you know, including by right uh, in the BP zones, uh, multifamily, and including by right with the caveat in the single family zones uh, up to uh, four, four, four units uh, on single family lots. Um, each of those, uh, we have tried to include as much flexibility as possible in the commitment and the housing element. So I actually sort of have to go. Um, to each the wording of each program. Okay. So let's take the BP just as an example yeah. since you called that one out. It's on page 29 of the element. It's program B7. The county will consider amendments to the zoning code to allow multifamily as a use by right in BP. So when it wasn't a statutory requirement as much as possible, 
staff tried to use the word will consider so that we if we get in front of the board and you want to do it you can do something else you don't have to there are a number of things in here that we've tried to call out where there was some statutory requirement and then we did make more of a commitment we tried to let you know like on these slides you know the 10 percent you know what those were but you know when you go through these a lot of times the wording is will consider okay but oh. the, by the by right is not uh, bypassing a public process that's on properties that actually they have it's already zoned that if way. you adopted the zoning code change then the de subsequent development might be by right but you have to make the threshold decision about whether you want to amend the zoning code you're not delegating to staff to amend the zoning code you amend the zoning code so and that is not the decision you're making today. You are committing, for example, if we just take this one example of the BP, you are considering to consider that. You're committing to consider it. Okay. Yeah. The others, the others as well, both the, uh, the uh, but the RD20 to RD30, that, you're not considering that, that basically is blanketed. The RD20 to RD30, well, you can find alternative sites instead. You can leave some at RD20 if you don't want to do them. Okay. Um, I okay. think that would be much more difficult that, right. that probably won't be the staff risk recommendation right. but okay. Okay. you can take our recommendation or right right not. Yeah. okay so it's it, it, it's it's not assuming action it presumes that what you'd be bringing forward and that you know and again in the alternative it might be right. a tougher choice but right we're suggesting that seems to staff like the the logical first step but okay all right thanks That's all I have. thank you supervisor natoli supervisor desmond Thanks, Leanne. So, again, just so I'm clear, when you come back for the zoning change, um, at some point, when would that be? I mean, roughly, what, when do you anticipate that would be? Well, I don't know if we're going to break it into multiple steps because, okay. you know, we could separate the, you know, the RD20 piece from other sites. Um, and we could have a discussion about that then. Yeah, and, you know. Yeah, because I'm just envisioning, and sorry to interrupt you, I'm that's envisioning okay. it. Maybe at that point, we look at, okay, we've identified some other uh, uh, locations that might give us a bigger buffer, right? So specifically, there might be a project, hey, I'd like to keep this RD20. Um, RD20 has a max, and it would allow this missing middle project perhaps to get built. Um, I think we were thinking of actually just sort of tweaking the zoning code to move all the RD20. If you don't like that, and that, that's, this is a conversation for a, for a different day. day. Okay. Um, okay. We weren't thinking of handling it site by site, okay. but you may want us to do that. So uh, you're not committing to that today. We'll come back to you with a, another Thank discussion. You. And then the slide before this one, <clears throat> you talk about some of the things, and you, there's some so many great ideas in this about ideas you have to incentivize, stimulate some of this development, um, and that's great. And, I, and I gl I'm glad you're, you're going to be really connected with the Deloitte folks and, and, and finding ways you can take advantage of that ARPA money to, to really stimulate some of these affordable housing projects. I think that's that's terrific. My fear is... Is this and and some of the you know development community I've, I've I've spoken to, both BIA and some infill developers that I've spoken to, including a letter we got today. Um, do you think those steps that you've identified, hopefully in in um, conjunction with some of the ARPA additional ARPA funding, is going to actually work? Because what we've been doing is just falling further and further behind. I mean, we're not seeing the housing projects that we want to see. So can you tell me what, what what about your new approach or some things you're exploring that you think are really going to make a difference now? Well, I think separate from all of this, you've heard from staff that we're very much focused in the vineyard community. You've had Department of Transportation hold a workshop about how, you know, facilitating road improvements in vineyard. And so, I mean, that is a huge focus of, uh, you know, what we, DOT, water resources, you know, we meet all the time talking about a bunch of these growth areas, you know, how can we get them going? Um, because the market rate housing provides the infrastructure to those growth areas that then provides some additional affordable housing sites and it provides a funding contribution. So, um, you know, planning and the infrastructure and finance staff um, are very much focused on getting some of these growth areas we're working with Easton right now. Um, we've got Cordova Hills in, uh, we've got Mather South, um, we've got, you know, 
all kinds of potentially near-term development that we are extremely focused on. Um, I don't know how much that really shows up in the housing element, but that's what we're actually doing. In addition to the infill stuff. Okay, yeah. I want to make sure we have that same level of attention in addition on the, to the infill, infill stuff. Yeah. Too. We've yeah. got some uh, grant funding focused on the infill. We've got zoning code amendments. Yeah, we're like trying to um, do the kinds of things that the state and you all have asked us to keep plugging away and working on. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. I guess what I'd like to see at some point is, because it's difficult to cull out of a 433-page document, um, but I do know that when, you know, among our seven priorities, priority number two is to reduce the constraints to housing production. If I could see how we're doing that, where we are making changes that actually reduce constraints and where we see opportunities to further reduce constraints because bottom line is you know i want to identify every hurdle that we can lower or remove to producing housing and and and, and just something that's that specific is that something that could be produced uh, yeah, I think we could come up with a, the day? a list by the end of the day. <laughs> no, <laughs> that commitment I'm probably not willing to make. Sorry, but All right. thank you. <laughs> I, I just want to um, say, uh, in relation to that, that that was one of the things that was on my mind because I was talking to some of the folks over at BIA who did a comparable study on um, f fees, and yes. you know, Sacramento County is higher then I guess the other areas, our region is higher than all the surrounding areas. Uh, and and so is there a way we can yes, we get back on, on par um, with yes. what, what everyone else is doing? So Steve is convening, uh, has a meeting convened and scheduled with the BIA. That is the item on the agenda. Um, I think uh, we're going to have a dialogue around their analysis and some additional information and analysis we have because we've also done a recent analysis which is in this housing element that doesn't 100% uh, 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 agree with, you know, it depends on the area. Um, but yes, we are about to engage in that and uh, Steve does have a meeting scheduled around that topic. Do you mind if I ask why we're so much higher? We're like 40,000 per d per I think rooftop? It, it depends on the growth area. It depends on yep. the geography. So okay. it depends on which, geo which specific location you pick because they all have their individual financing plans. So, it depends on the amount of infrastructure that's needed for that area. If it needs a lot, the, the fees are higher. Okay. It's the infrastructure. It's the impact fees in that the they rural tend to be areas, talking about. maybe. Yeah. The, the, the one that they focused on lately was parks in the in the Cordova Parks area. So we're looking at that as part of the meeting Leanne's talked about. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. Yeah. Just one other <clears throat> comment here. Mm -hmm. I noted that you know in the last housing element update we had included um, some efforts to have an infill technical assistance program, and that that was discontinued for. I guess uh, funding and staffing reasons, and so we never really had a chance to measure the success of that or not. I guess, right? Um, and I tie my comment on that back to the point, and again, we yet to realize it, and there may be some time, but we actually have a infill fee that's going on the new development in the Jackson Corridor. There's a thousand dollars per lot or whatever the calculation is, and. I've noted before that I think it's important for this board at some juncture, obviously, as we get closer to some of those projects actually moving forward, to have some conversation about how we might m most wisely invest, invest that in, you know, in, uh, for the intended use. It really doesn't have definition around it except for what was in the uh, development agreements, I guess. And so I guess I'd like to know, one, back to the point about having a technical assistance program is that used in other jurisdictions? Does it, does it help when you're trying to have, you know, some introduction of housing into commercial or limited commercial uh, corridors that may be struggling and try to find ways to do live above mixed use types of developments? And if it needs to have funding behind it in order to accomplish that, then I guess that's part of the, the, the question. And then also on the infill development fee, do we get credit at the state for actually having a fee in new development areas that will actually assist us to promote infill, or is that just 
you know, you can do it if you want. So that's good for you, but it doesn't really count for anything. I mean, I think the credit is achieving the outcome, well, not just the having the fee. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, um, if you remember, uh, there are so many grants. You have so many items on your consent agenda. I'm sure you remember that consent agenda item <laughs> from six months ago, right? <laughs> um, the uh, LEAP uh, program, um, which probably was on the consent agenda, does have funding for an infill program uh, that we are working on. Okay. So, uh, you know, tackling, I think, exactly what you all, including uh, Board Member Kennedy, is looking for is, you know, what do we need to do to kickstart some of that stuff? Get out of our own way. And, and do you anticipate at some juncture, um, I guess you do at some juncture, we're coming to the board to have a more flushed out discussion about uh, you know, the infill fee? Because again, it's pretty nebulous, it's there, and, you know, and right. certainly this board and future boards will have some opportunity as development occurs um, but we're not you know that's not there's nobody's breaking ground out there yeah next i think weeks. we will and it may actually come up in the context of the climate action plan um so that may be a topic there okay all right that's all okay. i had and did we meet with mr pemstein and answer questions to those the concerns around um, we did meet yesterday um we explained to him our understanding of the state statutes i don't think he was particularly um enthused uh by our explanation um, but we did meet. But we, but we can, it, by approving this today, it doesn't mean we're locked. It, it just means it, we still have time to work through some of those issues. We can, but fundamentally, um, in order to move forward with the project that he wants, which is on one of our multifamily sites in the inventory, you would need an oversupply. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. You would need? You would need an oversupply. We would oh. need to complete the rezone program and have an oversupply. And so, we don't. And we don't. We and have I don't. An undersupply. I, yeah, I can't think of any way to amend the element out of that. Um, so, like, I don't think he <clears throat> was keen on that answer. But Leanne, would we get credit if we did tiny house community? Um, I mean, you say a mobile home park. I mean, we, you know, we talk right. about that. It shows in the charts. I've mentioned this a number of times and others have weighed in is that, you know, available land, nobody's building it, but if the county put the infrastructure in and actually got an operator, got a third party to just as they do with apartments, you know, the development cost I think would be modest because you're not, you know, you're basically bringing utilities in and yet you could have affordable housing. And that's one of the things that we haven't seen. There hasn't been a new mobile home park, manufactured park built in this county probably in 20 years uh, right. or longer and why wouldn't we do that we've got available land it needs to be done right but you know you could provide for a pretty significant density at affordable prices get a third party but we always build an apartment that costs us a million dollars an apartment or something you know it's like you know so we do have a program around tiny homes in here um, let me give an answer and let me see if everyone nods yes or no whether i answered correctly or not this will be a test so um Clearly, we get credit for deed-restricted affordable housing. You're asking, I think, about more the naturally occurring affordable housing. I, I would think it would be sort of like the ADUs. If we came up with a program and we could demonstrate a methodology um, similarly as to what was done with the ADUs, then I think we could count it. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to ask in a nice way, but I'm going to issue a challenge. It's not so much planning department, but Lachelle and Christine and or up, 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 up there. And, and I guess, you know, we have some opportunities, certainly in the Delta, where we have you know mobile home parks and so forth, and they they, and they have tiny house complexes. But why wouldn't we look to a parcel again? You know, again, we're you know particularly in the unincorporated area uh, where it could be appropriately sited. Put the infrastructure in. Go get a third party operator and do a tiny house community. I mean, we've been talking. You know, tiny houses aren't anything new. In fact, we do have some of those. They're not, you know. Uh, you know, they're, they're not all new infrastructure, but it seems to me that you can bring water and sewer and streets in and get appropriate densities and have living units that would be affordable, could be rent restricted, could be for seniors, could be for veterans, could be for transitional. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get to it, and you could have even ownership. Uh, but, you know, we've not done any of that. It's, you know, there's very few zone sites, but you, you can do them in, you know, industrial areas. You could do, you know, uh, certainly in you know commercial quarters and certainly in developing communities if, it, if they're done right but um, 
I, again, I, I guess I've seen, you know, modest interest in that, but I guess I would just issue a challenge and, and ask uh, maybe the agency and certainly the planning department and uh, to at least give us some assessment of that. And again, that's not what, you know, your, your, your typical builders are building as far as apartment complexes or, um, you know, single family homes or whatever. Uh, so we might have to be creative in trying to, but we, I think we could fill a real housing need and do it right and still and, and manage those properties and maybe address some of the other issues we've talked about here today. And so maybe some of the ARPA funding could even assist with that. But the county might even have sites available to it, to us as an as a, as a entity. So yeah, the, the program is D10 on page 39 is the current program we have in here. Are you talking about real property or um, um, mobile home? On a permanent foundation, or no, I'm not talking about a permanent foundation. I think you'd be, be mobile, you know, mobile years. I mean, people can put them in there. You could put them on permanent foundations. That's one way of doing that. But I don't think it has to be that way. I mean, um, I think you do something that'd be very, very affordable and quality. Uh, if it had to be on a permanent foundation, Madam Chair, then you know they could do, they could look into that. But I just think that you know we got to be creative here. We're always looking to go up or to incentivize this, and we can certainly get you know apartment complexes and, and other complexes. I, I think there's a way, frankly, that you could do it and you could meet community expectations as well. That's all, thanks. Oh, thank you, Supervisor Natoli. Supervisor Desmond. And I'll just echo that challenge. I, I mean, I, I think we have a, a, an opportunity really to do something, a, a tiny home solution, which there, there's, a, there's a need for that for certain populations and a, and a lot of other affordable housing. Uh, projects with this ARPA funding, which may help us in getting to uh, a little bit more of a buffer in terms of the supply. And the other challenge I would issue is, you know, it was n not just for, for Mr. Pemstein, but, but some of these other projects. I mean, I'd really challenge you and the staff to not just settle for using kind of the template um, projections that HCD comes up with. I mean, I mean, I, I do think we're we're more creative in terms of attracting more a, uh, ADUs. I mean, this this rezone with BP or making it a, a right to be able to put a multifamily housing in a, in a BP zoned area. Um, th that is those are areas where we could probably say there's a reasonable projection of, of development of, of housing on some of these sites, and that might give us a little more wiggle room in terms of identifying additional supply. So that's the other challenge I would issue to you, to you too. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Okay, you're going to regret saying that. Um, D10. Um, D10. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'll tell you, my, my only problem with it, with as written, is um, uh, because l l when we talk about tiny homes, there's a myriad of things we're talking about. I mean, there's a project down in the vineyard area that's, that's been proposed over a number of years that Chris and I have talked about, um, and very creative. Uh, but utilizing the concept of tiny homes, but but just really outside of what I've seen before. However, th there are tiny home projects throughout the country, throughout the state of California, certainly. Um, and we have a target date of December 2025. Now, I appreciate your conservatism and not having the board come and yell at you because you didn't make a date. <laughs> um, but I'd rather shoot a little higher uh, and see if we could accelerate that. I mean, December 2025 to do something that's been done before in other places seems a bit on the careful side for me. It's four years plus, you know. All right, we will note that and see okay. if we can't move that the one up a little sooner. The gauntlet has been thrown down. All okay. right. And why does that have to be the county general fund as far as the funding source? That may be how you do the planning, but again, I'm gonna to look to our partners that are seated here in the audience uh, to mm -hmm. you know, find a creative way to try to address it. Okay. We definitely have some staff who are interested in tackling the tiny home idea. They will likely like your challenge. I think if you if you're going to do a tiny home project, you should have a community garden in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fine. Actually, the one in the in the vineyard does, uh, as well as rooftop gardens, so that people can also yeah. produce for themselves. So I could see some dreamy situations going on there. <laughs> okay, that's the, the sum total of the board comments at this time. I know we do have some public comments on this, and so thank you, Leanne. And I think we'll probably have questions, might have questions when we come back, but uh, we'll begin with Ahiro Okaro. I think I said it correctly, and Chris Dick followed by Chris Dickinson. Do we have anyone on the phone? 
we, we do not, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello again. Hello. Um, on behalf of the Sacramento Housing Alliance, um, I would like to urge the County Board of Supervisors to delay certifying the housing element until the needed revisions are made in order to make sure we have a sufficient amount of sites. Um, the county, the housing element is the blueprint for addressing housing needs and affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, we must include adequate sites to accommodate the regional housing need for all income levels and sufficient policies and programs to assist in the development of affordable housing and remove constraints to the development and preservation of affordable housing. In particular, the draft housing element does not identify adequate sites or include sufficient programs to provide needed programs to address identified need and state law. We have appreciated the hard work of the county staff and look forward to continuing to work with staff to resolve the element to comply with the law and to support the county in ultimately implementing a compliant housing element. As there is a continuing obligation to affirmatively further fair housing, addressing high levels of segregation and poverty that are pervasive in many of the communities that are in your district um, is of high importance. If the county proceeds with adoption, we request the board to direct staff to continue to work with the community and stakeholders to work on revisions with the housing element. We commit to working with you to ensure that there are effective programs and services to rehabilitate homes, promote home ownership opportunities, and address areas of historic disinvestment and create affordable housing in areas of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, good evening. Thank you for your time uh, this evening. My name is Chris Dickinson and I work with Town Development of Sacramento alongside Jeff Pemstein. And I should also mention I'm a longtime resident of District 3. Um, I handle all the land acquisitions and entitlements for, uh, for Town and you've received a comment letter from our planning uh, consultant, TCS Planning. Um, we are a home builder with over 72 years of experience and are very active in Sacramento County. We think that if the housing element is approved as is, the unintended consequence is that viable sites will continue to sit vacant while we're in the midst of this housing crisis, and this is primarily due to RENA and the densities that were proposed here tonight. We are here today to request the board to direct staff to follow up <clears throat> um, within what remaining time we have before the September deadline to number one, research what other jurisdictions are doing to push projects forward, and two, to engage HCD staff and, and push back on some of these regulations. Um, we request that there's a robust oversupply of housing units included in the uh, housing update. Um, and we would like the county to um, come up with an internal process to shift units between sites. Um, number five, we'd consider, um, we would like to see options for phasing sites out of the RENA obligation if they've been encumbered um, for, for multiple housing cycles uh, and, and they've remained unbuilt. So they, they should no longer be encumbered by RENA. And then finally, um, to make more RD10 and RD15 sites available, this is where we think we can make market rate affordable sites uh, viable. And so we're requesting this of the board because we think RENA has and will continue to obstruct market rate housing uh, for the following reasons. Um, densities promoted by RENA are out of character with many of the neighborhoods where they are located. There's a couple examples in Carmichael and also out in Rancho Marietta where we're seeing densities in 30 to, 30 to 40 units to the acre. Um, Can you please wrap up your in, comments? Uh, four to five story buildings. Um, simply put, Rents, rents in those areas won't justify that level of construction. Um, in addition, um, the proportion of affordable units on these sites is in excess of 75%. And so there's no way that a market rate project can carry that number of affordable units. So you're essentially predestining these to sit vacant, waiting for a subsidized dollars to come along. Um, there Thank appears you. to be no regard for properties that have sat vacant for multiple housing element cycles. Can you please wrap up your comments? Um, sure. Finally, um, you know, sites that have been included um, 
in Reno for multiple cycles. They continue to, they continue to sit vacant um, while the deficit of unbuilt affordable housing continues to grow. And the solution offered in the housing element is to encumber more sites with the same regulation and intensify uh, density. This doesn't seem prudent. Um, and so we don't think this is a Sac County issue, Excuse but this me, is can a you bad please state wrap up law. Your comments? And we believe um, the county needs a pushback. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring it back to the board. I just, I just want to say I think there's wisdom in what he said. I think we all know there's wisdom in, in it, but unfortunately, you know, and I, I don't know, Leanne, maybe you can speak to this, but it's like we don't have a choice is my understanding, and that's what you described to me. Uh, am I correct in that? that? Even though we have this housing element doesn't mean it's going to get built, but... Right. The, the uh, outcome of not having a certified housing element is uh, significant. It means you potentially forego grant funds for affordable housing. Um, so, uh, you know, I think you can uh, look to SHRA staff in the back and our consultant, and they can both tell you, uh, you know, as well as my personal experience, uh, we have ha not had a ha certified housing element in the past, and it was not good. Um, it had lots of bad outcomes. Um, so, you know, uh, my strong, strong recommendation is that we uh, adopt a housing element and have a certified housing element. Try Thank you, Leanne. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. And uh, you, you beat me to the punch a little bit there, Chair, Chair Frost, because I oh, wanted sorry. to. Uh, no, it's okay. I, I just wanted Leanne to be specific about what the consequences are if we don't have a certified housing element, um, especially as it relates to the objectives of the market rate uh, housing development community. Uh, for instance, what you just said, and this is not, a, is not intended to be a veiled threat here, I'm just saying it could be a consequence, is that let's say we have a decertified uh, uh, housing element. We don't have the ability to pursue um, the funding that, uh, um, that is dependent upon having a certified uh, housing element, yet we still have unmet, large unmet, and cumulative unmet, uh, low, very low, uh, extremely low housing needs in the, in the county. Uh, part of the consequence would, could be, whether it's this, this board or another future board, they could look to the market rate housing development community to figure out how to fund it. So we, you know, we, we went and, and, uh, and because we stiff-armed the, the housing community development department, and therefore didn't have a certified housing element um, because we wanted to push back, uh, it could have some enormous consequence for, for market rate uh, developers because the need doesn't go away. That's the part that is, is kind of the finite aspect of, of what we're being asked to do here. And I know it stings because, you know, I think generally we have a reflexive twitch when the state, you know, tells us to do uh, almost anything um, but this is nothing new. I mean, we, we've lived with Rena for decades, and, and we've known the consequences uh, for decades if we don't have a certified housing element. I think what we're trying to do is find the right uh, balancing point between uh, not having an element that in itself is an obstacle, because that's one of the f uh, findings you have to make, or not findings, but it's one of the things that you have to do in the exercise of updating your housing element is identify obstacles to housing and barriers to housing production, uh, and certainly, you know, uh, over um, uh, ambitious regulatory um, pursuits by the state or by local agencies to that effect can certainly be an obstacle. Uh, but I, I think, you know, just pushing back on HCD is really kind of not an option for me. Um, and and I, I understand there's still some outstanding um, uh, issues and conflicts with what's been uh, advanced by staff here today, and I, and I get that. Uh, but with that being said, um, and, and I don't know if there's gonna be a substitute motion made or not, but I'm gonna go ahead and move for the uh, staff recommendation for the adoption to amend the housing element. Thank you, Supervisor Cerna uh, has made the motion to approve staff's recommendation, second by Supervisor Kennedy, and uh, Supervisor Desmond would like to speak. 
Thank you. I appreciate the comments from uh, Madam Chair and, and Supervisor Cerna. And I just want to be clear. I mean, I agree. We, we have to, obviously, we have to pass the housing element. But when we get to some of the follow-up steps, we're going to continue having this conversation, including, hey, if, if say we are able to identify additional supply and gives us some flexibility, right? So th this, is, this is not the end of the discussion by any means. I mean, you're not... You're not encumbered per, encumbered per se by arena adoption, and I think that's what's what's crucial. And and, um, and I think there are some good points though that uh, um, that he that he brought up in terms of properties that have been sitting vacant for for many years. I mean, we obviously need to take a closer look at those those parcels and say, okay, if we if we do zone that one to RD twenty minimum, RD thirty maximum. Uh, should we maybe look at those if it's something that has been sitting vacant for a long time? And but we'll still be able to have those conversations, correct? D yes. Despite adopting this day, okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. We have a motion by Supervisor Cerna, a second by Supervisor Kennedy. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Thank, Thank you, you Leanne. Much. I really Thank appreciate it. Thank you to all everyone who worked so hard on that. Thanks, Lee. Appreciate you, your item 40 is your uh, nominations. Or excuse me, item 41, I mean, is your nominations. And you are continuing to August 10th Adult and Aging Commission, Developmental Disabilities Planning and Advisory Council, <clears throat> the Sacramento County Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board. You're continuing to August 24th, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation Citizens Advisory Committee and the Maternal Child and Adolescent Health Advisory Board. You're continuing to September 14th, the Assessment Appeals Board, Casumnes Area Community Planning Advisory Council, County Service Area 4B, Slough House, Wilton, Casumnes, County Service Area 4C, Delta, the Delta Citizens Municipal Advisory Council, Disability Advisory Commission, Fair Oaks Community Planning Advisory Council, Local Child Care Planning and Development Council, the Orangeville Community Planning Advisory Council, and the Southeast Area Community Planning Advisory Council. And for your first item today is the Children's Coalition. Chiefs recommend nominate Vanessa Cuevos Romero to the Sports and Recreation Interest Area seat and continue the remainder to August 24. Thank you. Community Review Commission. For uh, District 1, please close the application period and continue the item until August 24th. Okay. Um, Mr. Kennedy? Um, Mr. Desmond? Please continue to August 24th. Okay. Supervisor please, Frost? Please continue to August 24th. And Mr. Natoli? Uh, likewise, uh, I think I need a month. August 24th, please. Okay. Thank you. Cordova Community Planning Advisory Council, Supervisor Natoli. Yes, I'd like to um, <clears throat> nominate uh, incumbent uh, Terry Leinbach. Okay. Uh, and when would you like to continue the remainder? Um, let's go a month, August 24th, please. Okay. And we have the Equal Employment Opportunity Advisory Committee. Chiefs recommend reappoint Jerry Yamashita. Continue the remainder to August 24. Okay. Uh, In-Home Supportive Services Advisory Committee. Chiefs recommend continue to August 10. Okay. Natomas Community Planning Advisory Council, Mr. Cerna. Please continue to August 24th. Okay. Uh, Sacramento County Behavioral Health Youth Advisory Board. Supervisor um, Kennedy. August 10th, please. And then we have the Sacramento County Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. Uh, Supervisor Desmond. Please continue to August 10th. And Supervisor Frost. Youth seats uh, nominate Isabel Kim and Drisana Batia. Okay. Okay, that takes care of that. And then Sacramento County Mental Health Board. 
Supervisor Kennedy. Appoint uh, Lourdes Santana Sanchez. Okay, and then uh, Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, I'd like to, we have pending interviews, so would, would continue at the August 24th, please. Yes. All right, and then uh, Sacramento County Environmental Commission. Chiefs recommend reappoint Richard Hoon Jr. and Mark White and continue the remainder to September 14. Uh, and then finally is our uh, Vineyard Area Community Planning Advisor Council, Mr. Natoli. Yeah, nominate the incumbent uh, currently serving as Chair Jofio Borgia. Okay, and continue the remainder to? August 24th, please. Got it. And that concludes your nominations. And your next item is County Executive Comments. No comments, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And, and then you guys have the floor. Okay, I have Supervisor Cerna. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know it's been a, a long day, so I'll just be very brief. Um, it's been a number of years since uh, this board, in fact, past boards, uh, have considered a, uh, uh, an ordinance that would regulate uh, marijuana. In fact, um, the last time we had a robust, a robust policy discussion about it was nearing the end of the term of uh, former Supervisor Jimmy Yee and just as uh, Supervisor Patrick Kennedy was joining the board. And so we actually have some, some new uh, faces up here since we've had the opportunity to engage on that uh, policy discussion. And in that time, uh, the city of Sacramento, in addition to others, and including the state of California, have actually uh, progressed um, uh, substantially in my estimation in terms of uh, how um, uh, the issue of marijuana generally is being uh, governed and so I think there's been some lessons learned not on our time but on their time quite frankly and uh, uh, it's in, in my opinion the right time for this board to revisit the prospect of having um, local policy administered here in Sacramento County that would regulate um, medical, recreational, uh, marijuana, uh, dispensing, uh, delivery, basically those activities that uh, other local jurisdictions uh, are regulating and in fact acquiring uh, in some cases substantial revenue from. Um, I'm, I'm feeling uh, as perhaps others are on this board that uh, we're literally leaving uh, revenue on the table and uh, at the same time uh, incurring some of the impacts associated with it. So um, I would like for our uh, county CEO, not that she doesn't already have enough to do, uh, but I would like uh, Ann to work with her team uh, or at least assemble a team uh, working with uh, Ms. Travis and her team uh, to get something back to this board um, uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cerna. Supervisor Natoli. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, acknowledging the late hour, um, I alluded to it a little earlier this afternoon. I just want to uh, take a, a brief moment to, to get an item on the table. It's uh, both uh, an item that has some urgency, but certainly emerging issue. And it's uh, in the last couple of weeks can come to my attention uh, that uh, in two separate cases, uh, unrelated, but nonetheless, uh, in, in some of the rural, rural outlying areas of our county, and it certainly could be in other areas uh, of supervisors district as well, that. In one case, we had a property owner who's um, uh, very uh, little means, but uh, basically their their well has gone dry, uh, and they uh, no longer have the ability to, you know, uh, take care of their basic needs, and certainly don't have the financial wherewithal. Um, certainly have reached out to me. In another case, we have actually an enforcement action that's been pending for an elderly resident whose septic system has completely failed, uh, at least that's the assessment. Again, no wherewithal, living with a, um, a family member. And uh, and so I've had a conversation both with Dr. Kassiri and and uh, with uh, Marie Wooden from Marimo Management. I've talked a bit with uh, Ann Edwards, our interim CEO on, on this matter. And you know, again, we're in times where we've found folks in lots of you know various degrees of, of distress, and um, certainly, um, I think in this case, and I was I was <clears throat> you know, certainly uh, pleased to hear there might be some opportunity through ARPA or even through 
uh, existing uh, wherewithal that uh, might be available to public health to uh, craft a program. It would have to have um, certainly some parameters and, and certainly the potential to recover uh, dollars, but to assist folks who are gonna otherwise be homeless. In both cases, they're pretty extenuated circumstances. Um, and uh, again, I can't imagine these are the only two in the county. And uh, I think it's emerging, some of maybe due to climate change with private wells that are you know drying up. Uh, but I'm not, I don't wanna make an overstatement here. So I guess what I wanted to put out for sort of the benefit of my colleagues today and ask uh, uh, if we could have in, in a short amount of time some um, you know, consideration for this board uh, to maybe to you know have a, a program, and we've done this with uh, with abandoned wells. We've done it with um, underground storage tanks, where environmental management has some background, and I think there is a serious public health issue, and that we're going to need to act in in both these cases. And again, um, you know, the standard way would be just tell people either you fix it or your you know your property is going to be red tagged or you're going to be you know forced off of the off of the property. Um, I don't think those are good alternatives, and yet I, I, you know, understand there's some willingness, at least by the one, one party who's contacted me to, to, you know, offer repayment. So there's a way for us to recover and never to really lose the dollars if we were to assist uh, homeowners and, and, and residents. Um, again, I don't have a, a long list of these circumstances, but I know there are other areas in the county, certainly Reland, Alberta, Orangevale, probably out in the Alberta and the Thomas area where you might have situations uh, of different de varying degrees, but and maybe even in South Sacramento and in Vineyard. But uh, I would ask that we could, you know, give there's some urgency to both of these situations. And I've shared more of the details with our, our, our CEO and talked with both Dr. Kassiri and, and uh, Marie Wooden. So it might be, and that we could, if there's a way to address this, working with county council, obviously, to. Uh, craft an approach that would <clears throat> at least be considered by this board that could offer some assistance um, by way of uh, either um, a secured <clears throat> loan and or maybe some grant monies if that was available through ARPA or through some other source. So again, I don't wanna get any deeper than that this evening, it's late, but I'd like to have us follow up uh, <clears throat> very quickly on this and maybe even by, by August 10th, at least have some idea of how we might approach this. Okay, that's all I have, thanks. Was there any way that regional sand could possibly <clears throat> Oh. They're, they're, they're both miles, if not tens of miles, away from um, you know, sanitation uh, districts, so they're not anywhere close to where they could is hook the sanitary sewer. In the, in the case of the well, I'll just tell you, the general geographic location, one's in Harold and one's in Wilton. Okay. Um, so they're, they're long distance from anywhere, public water or public sewer. Yeah, yeah. okay, thanks. thanks. Supervisor Natoli, Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I just want to uh, comment on, on Supervisor Cerna's uh, statement. I'll probably uh, upset a lot of my constituents for, for saying this, but I, I agree with him that I think that it is time for the county to reevaluate um, uh, its approach to, to cannabis. And, and I, I think that, uh, you know, during my campaign, I went and toured a, a facility on Elder Creek that was, I think, literally a couple hundred yards from the, it was in the city, but a couple hundred yards from the county line, and, and they're, the city's getting over a million dollars in tax revenue a year from this cultivation and processing facility, and it just makes you scratch your head. Um, and, and I think that you know a lot of the negative impacts from the cannabis industry, I mean, we're certainly feeling them in the unincorporated parts of the county, but not getting any of the benefits in terms of the tax revenue. And, and I think uh, by, by ha I think over half the counties in the state of California actually allow some level of commercial cannabis, either either cultivation or processing or, or, or um, um, uh, retail sites. So um, I would also welcome a discussion about that. Um, and, and I think we have an awful lot to learn from in terms of uh, uh, failures and successes throughout the state. Um, I would certainly support a, a, a go slow approach that has a very deliberate um, and robust community engagement and outreach. Um, um, but as someone who represents uh, nearly half of the unincorporated uh, population, um, I, I think it's a discussion we need to start having. So, so I, I would echo um, Supervisor Cerna's comments and would like to hear back from you on it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. And that is our last speaker for the night. And seeing no other comments, I will adjourn this meeting. Good job, Madam Chair. Yeah, good job. <laughs>